Introductory Note to Policy and Passion This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson Policy and Passion by Rosa Campbell Pride Introductory Note in placing before the English public a novel dealing exclusively with Australian life, a few prefatory remarks may not be inapplicable. That the mother country should be comparatively unacquainted with the features and characteristics, the inner workings, the social interests, and greater and petty political aspirations of this most promising of her offspring, is a fact principally to be attributed to the one-sidedness of the intellectual intercourse which, at present, connects Great Britain with the Antipodes. By means of books, more especially contemporary fiction, the Australian of the second generation may render himself familiar with most phases of British society. On the other hand, the Englishman, desirous of penetrating to the hidden sources of thought and action which govern the lives of his colonial brethren, though he has to acknowledge deep obligations to several influential english writers and to a smaller number of antipodean authors must deplore the limited medium of communion offered to his imagination by the literature emanating directly from australia it can be no matter for conjecture that when in the course of years australia shall have appropriated to herself an independent position among those occupied by more ancient nations and shall have formulated a social and political system adapted to the conditions of her development and growth she will possess a literature of her own as powerful and original as might be prognosticated from the influences of nature and civilization brought to bear upon the formation of a distinct national type but the time for this is hardly yet ripe yet the fluttering heartbeats and spasmodic efforts the struggles after a dimly recognized good and the many failures of achievement the conflict of personal and patriotic ambition the imperfect assimilation of traditional ideas with unconventional circumstances the contrast between human passion unsoftened by the veil of refinement with which civilization drapes that which is foul and of rudely expressed yearnings after the nobler motives of existence all these contending elements which go far towards making up the sum of young life in the individual or the race appeal with pathos and peculiar interest to the parent nature which has given them birth it has been my wish to depict in these pages certain phases of australian life in which the main interests and dominant passions of the personages concerned are identical with those which might readily present themselves upon an european stage but which directly and indirectly are influenced by striking natural surroundings and by the conditions of being inseparable from the youth of a vigorous and impulsive nation the scenery described here is drawn directly from nature and the name of leichardt's land a tribute to the memory of a daring but ill-fated explorer is but a transparent mask covering features that will be familiar to many of my australian readers but it is to the british public that i an australian address myself with the hope that i may in some slight degree aid in bridging over the gulf which divides the old world from the young r m pride End of introductory note. Chapter One of Policy and Passion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Policy and Passion by Rosa Campbell Praed. Chapter One. At Bracher's Inn. Brasher's, the chief inn at Kuya, was a one-storied wooden building placed at the junction of the two principal streets of the township. A wide veranda, enclosed by dingy railings which had been originally painted green and filled with squatter's chairs and small wooden tables, extended round the two visible sides of the hotel. 
a bar much frequented by the roughs who came down from the bush for a spree faced one of the streets and a coffee-room which served as a rendezvous for the passengers by cobb's coach to and from leichardt's town and opened by glass doors on to the veranda fronted the other thoroughfare it wanted now about an hour to the time at which the coach usually started and the vehicle ready to be horsed was drawn up beside the signpost it was a clumsy affair painted red and yellow a wooden framework supported an awning of which the leather curtains might be pulled up or down at will in front there was a high driver's box two wooden benches faced each other behind and at the extreme end was a third only to be approached by a scramble over the backs of the others the coach was generally drawn by five horses the time was half past four in the afternoon of a sultry day in february a storm brooded in the distance and there was an ominous stillness in the atmosphere the oleanders and loquat trees before the opposite houses looked brown and thirsty the acacias in the inn garden drooped with sickly languor and the spiky crowns of the golden pineapples beneath them were thickly coated with dust flaming hibiscus flowers stared at the beholder in a hot aggressive fashion there was no green shadow anywhere to afford relief to eyes wearied with brightness and colour brassy clouds were gathering slowly in the west and the sun beating pitilessly upon the zinc roofs of the verandas was mercilessly refracted from the glaring limestone hills that formed the eastern border of the township two long roads intersected each other at the inn corner one stretched away into the bush where it wound among gaunt gum trees and lost itself in the dull herbage with which the country was overgrown the other seemed to terminate abruptly upon the summit of a chalky ridge where a clump of grass trees with their brown spear-like tufts erect looked like sentinels to the barren scene wooden portico shanties alternating at intervals with brick public offices newly painted stores which displayed all varieties of wares and gaudy public houses round which clustered brawny sunburnt navvies lined but did not shade the streets the general air of the place was one of inaction sometimes a bullock dray piled with bales of wood or station stores would rumble by or a covered cart driven by a weather-beaten german woman from some neighbouring selection would pause for a moment in front of braciers while its owner interchanged a few words with some acquaintance lounging at the bar more frequently a bushman in crimean shirt and moleskins with his coat strapped before him would clatter over the stony road and dismount before the inn first he would unsaddle his horse hanging its bridle on to the railings of the veranda while the animal accustomed to the habits of the place would find its own way to the water trough next the newcomer would don his coat and saddle across to the post office opposite whence he would shortly return laden with letters and newspapers which he would place upon the arm of a squatter's chair in readiness for inspection then after carefully choosing the shadiest side of the veranda he would stretch his legs at full length dangle his feet over the railings call for a glass of grog to wash the dust out of his throat thereby intensifying the redness of a sun-baked face and would finally set himself to the perusal of his correspondence many bushmen had arrived at braciers that afternoon and all had gone through exactly the same formula with the occasional addition of a greeting to one or other of those already assembled on the inn veranda good day to you steaming hot looks like a storm brewing very dry up country fine weather this for the cotton growers and such like interjectional remarks sounded unfamiliarly in the ears of an english gentleman but lately arrived in australia who was leaning against one of the veranda posts contemplating with languid interest the scene around him he was smoking and apart from his air and physique the silver-mounted match-box in his hand and the perfume of his expensive cigar sufficiently indicated him to the intelligence of the bushman as a chap from the old country nevertheless his tall broadly built figure bronzed high-bred face and soldier-like bearing had no generic affinity with the lank limbs the fresh-coloured supine features and frank gullibility of the typical new chum the boldest old hand would hardly have attempted to play a practical joke upon hard-dressed barrington he looked about thirty-five the upper part of his face was fine with a touch of nobility in the high forehead broad at its base but slightly receding at the crown the dark brown hair fringed off in little rings from the temples 
the brows were strongly marked and wrinkled together in a frown which deepened the indentures of the sockets and gave to the grey eyes a remarkable intensity of expression the nose was straight with a somewhat coarse conformation of nostril and had on each side a deep line extending below the upper lip the mouth was concealed by a heavy moustache and the clean-shaven slightly prominent chin was cleft in the centre a handsome man upon whom it would be impossible for the stranger not to bestow several glances of interest and of whom it might be safely surmised that he had travelled much and had come into contact with various grades of society i suppose that cobb's coach is on its last legs now said one of the squatters relighting a short black pipe that had expired between his lips i shouldn't wonder if we had steam carriages to leckart's town before december year do you think that longleat will carry his railway bill this session there'll be a stiff fight over the speech said a red-faced bushman in a cabbage-tree hat laying down the leckart's town chronicle which he had been diligently perusing middleton has been blowing no end up north and there are some snug bursts to be given way folks must have an eye to their own pockets and for all the blather that people talk about impartiality there's no doubt that bribery tells in the long run i'll back longleat said another he is the devil for sticking to his purpose he said he'd make the colony and he is going the right way to work what leckart's land wants is money and money means immigration and public works hullo tom dungy down from the coorong eh why you've given the little piebald a sore back with your hard riding tom dungy the mailman who had halted at the post-office across the street had just removed his saddle with its load of brown leather post-bags and was ruefully regarding a puffy spot above the loin which threatened unpleasant consequences to a dearly loved pony two other horses which he had been driving one of which bore a pair of empty saddle-bags were browsing by the wayside dungy was a tiny fat man with small twinkling grey eyes a round face and a whining voice it's from all the lies i'm a-carryin he squeaked the little piebald she's a righteous oss and lord them parliamentary ringamarols there's seven of em in blue envelopes from Coralbin. do hack like a james blister upon a sensitive back a shout of laughter greeted tom dungy's explanation but he maintained an imperturbable gravity during the explosion who's the hack for inquired one of the dwellers at brasher's it's that there lord of Diraaba as has a new chum a-goin in for colonial experience squeaked dungy giving each of the supernumerary beasts a sharp smack on the wither i say mr brasher put the axe up and don't let em be turned out for any of your swell customers my word it's awful dry to-day longleat's on the road behind longleat shouted a group of men at the bar and soon the cry spread through the township even the children playing at fives with the pebbles in the road caught it up and their mothers rushed out to join in the excitement before many minutes a small crowd had assembled in front of brasher's who is longleat asked the englishman longleat echoed a hirsute squatter who expectorated freely and frankly owned to american origin longleat he repeated not looking at his questioner but gazing over the heads of the crowd into the vista of houses and distant trees wall well, it's my opinion sir that it ud be worth your while to study up on the politics of this air rising colony if it's only to become acquainted with the career of thomas longleat of kooralbin a remarkable man sir the champion of the working class the pillar of progress and the enemy of the tyrannical and parsimonious democracy the speaker drawled out with lagging eloquence his emphasized adjectives hitched up his trousers and slouched to the other end of the veranda his eyes still fixed upon the distant object of his attention which was rapidly resolving itself into a flying speck advancing mid a cloud of freshly raised dust but who is longleat inquired barrington again member for kooya and premier of leckhardt's land replied a spry little stockman in moleskins thank you said barrington a remarkable specimen sir of the vicissitudes of australia said the first speaker returning to his former position against the veranda rails it's a known fact that thomas longleat began life in this colony as a bullock-driver 
he ain't ashamed to own up to it a bullock driver on these very roads that he is spanking over now with the finest team in leichardt's land a man as yoked his own beasts and spread his tarpaulin and chewed his quid of tobacco when the day's work was over and now why if he floats his railway loan her majesty will make him a knight of st michael and st george as sure as we're standing in brasher's veranda here he comes a buggy drawn by four steaming chestnuts rattled down the road and was pulled up in front of the hotel a stout red-faced gentleman with a swelling chest and commanding presence clad in white linen clothes and wearing a broad-brimmed puggareed hat descended from the vehicle he was followed by a wizened-up little man with very thin legs and a hooked nose whose ferret-like face was fringed by a border of iron-gray hair and wore an unpleasant saturnine expression the mob set up a cheer which longleat acknowledged by a good-humoured salutation while his voice sonorous but unrefined sounded clearly above the uproar as he addressed the innkeeper hi brasher good day to you i'm going to leichardt's town by the coach to-night but mr ferris will be stopping here for a day or so look after my horses will you have you got four stalls empty the innkeeper advanced and touched his hat a mark of deference he had not shown to any of the previous arrivals well sir we're pretty full but we'll manage there's dungey brought down two hacks for that there lord up your way but they can go off to the paddock and we'll make room somehow for your team mr longleat smiled tickled and somewhat flattered by the evident fact that that their lord was in brasher's estimation of very small importance compared with himself he shook hands with some of the men in the veranda called for a tumbler of cold water which he drank standing and said in a patronizing tone to his companion who had ordered a glass of brandy in the coffee-room a bad thing ferris stick to adam's ale in a hot climate temperance and success that's been my motto and i've got no cause to complain of the way i've got on in life mr ferris retreated scowling to partake of his refreshment and the premier after throwing a chafing word to dungie who was inclined to resent the summary expulsion of his horses turned his eyes upon barrington he stared at the englishman with a half-angry curiosity as though he recognized in him the representative of an order for which he had no liking End of chapter one read by celine major chapter two of policy and passion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org policy and passion by rosa campbell prayed chapter two the premier the mob round the hotel had thickened fast and as the premier stood in brasher's veranda surveying the crowded street the rowdies set up a series of shouts hooray for thomas longleat go it old chap for the railway pitch into the obstructionist crew down with middleton and his sneaking northerners concluding with an unanimous cry i say longleat give us a bit of talk open your jaw while you're waiting and let em have it hot the premier shook his head half deprecating half acknowledging his popularity with the kooya bob now considerably augmented by a band of idle navies in blue shirts and felt caps to whom the cry of the railway was the herald of a new era of pay and plenty we don't mean to let you clear out in this ear coach till you've told us what's a-goin to become of us when parliament meets cried one of these insistents perching himself upon a wheel of cobs we aren't the sort of chaps to be put off any longer with these ere screws shrieked another rough who had clambered to the box-seat it's steam osses that suits our money hooray for longleat's railway come go it old chap tell us that you hain't got no intention of caving in to them stingy oppositionists 
the premier came forward to the edge of the veranda and took off his hat as he stood in the glare of the declining sun his head thrown back his big chest expanded with his broad capable forehead his keen eyes looking out steadily from under shaggy brows his under lip slightly protruding and giving to his coarsely moulded face an expression of suave self-complacency in spite of the drawbacks of evident low birth and vulgar assertiveness there were in his bearing and features indications of intellectual power and iron resolution which would have impressed a higher class mob than that now waiting eagerly for his words his brawny hands rough still with the traces of work and exposure grasped the veranda rails while he began to speak in an easy conversational style unembellished by any flowers of oratory electors and friends said mr longleat you've asked me to make you a speech before i travel down to leichardt's town in cobb's coach yonder and i dare say you would all cheer me as loudly as your lungs would let you if i just took that vehicle for my text in a tirade against the petty jealousy of northern politicians who grudge to the populated south a means of locomotion of which there ain't enough of squatters let alone free selectors to make any use up there but it's not my way to abuse the bridge that has carried me over and i won't cry down cobb's coach that scores of times when i have been driving hard all day from Kurel bin has saved my horse's legs and my own temper you can't have railways at a moment's notice my men and it's not so very long ago that we all thought it a fine and wonderful thing to have any sort of a public conveyance between leichardt's town and kooya it's a nice roomy well-built vehicle and has done its work well and i mean no disrespect to mr cobb when i say to you here that i hope before two years are out to travel from this town to the metropolis in one that'll be easier about the springs and more commodious for the carriage of our wool and cotton to port and our meat and vegetables to market i have driven fifty miles to-day along a roughish bit of country and am not much inclined for public speaking but since you want to know what my policy is going to be this coming session i'll tell you i'm going to fight might and main for your railway and if the public feeling is what i take it to be there's not much doubt but that you'll have it not because you want it i do the best i can for my constituency but i bear in mind that kooya is not the only electorate in leichardt's land it's because our colony requires the fresh impetus which she will receive from the circulation of new monies that i'm going to move heaven and earth to float the loan which i shall bring before parliament at the opening of the session there are folks up north and down south too that say the ministry will knock under and that when parliament meets the railway question will be shuffled over and the opposition conciliated because thomas longley likes power and place and means to stick to his seat in the treasury now i say that's a lie thomas longley never knocked under in his life and he's not going to be trodden on now if he is thrashed and the country goes again him he'll take his licking and bide his time but if he knows that the country is with him he'll fight for her while he has got a voice to speak with and a leg to stand on the railway loan will be the party question of this session and upon it my government stands or falls you all know me here it's my way to carry through what i've set my mind on it's my determination some call it luck and some call it obstinacy that's got me on in life i ain't ashamed to tell you that i began in leichardt's land bullock driving along this very road i'm going over to-night i was a rough sort of chap in those days my friends but i'd got the will in me strong even then i said to myself i'll rise and i have risen i've climbed inch by inch step by step till i'm nigh the topmost bough of the tree and i'm proud of what i've done 
it's likert's land that has made me and when i see my benefactress low and sinking it's not surprising that i want mine to be the hand to lift her up again we are watching a critical point in her history nations have their turning points their times of weakness and depression the same as human beings leichardt's land is like a sick person whose powers have been enfeebled and whose glorious capabilities have been contracted by years of parsimonious neglect she needs a philip you have heard of a wonderful operation called transfusion by which fresh vitalizing blood is sent coursing through languid veins and a new impetus is given to the springs of life it is the transfusion of money the blood of nations that leichardt's land requires to make her flush and strong let a temporary loan which will ere long repay itself fourfold be poured into her treasury and we shall see in a short space of time railways penetrating to the very heart of her rich pastures bridges spanning her rivers her mines yielding gold and jewels her plantations sugar and cotton the european market supplied with her wool and the colonial market with her produce my friends the loan bill which will come before the house immediately is not a mere question of internecine jealousy and party rancor but of the introduction of new life and vigor into a glorious but debilitated colony longleat as he concluded his peroration his rough eloquence kindling as he opened upon his subject stood for a moment his shoulders thrown back his face bland his under lip projecting ere he proceeded with his address but at this moment the coach horses ready harnessed were brought round from the inn-yard and there arose some little confusion amidst the crowd in the street while the sound of a woman's cry arrested any further words with which mr longleat might have intended to occupy the five minutes which must elapse before the starting of the coach a lady dressed in black slight and delicate looking had been pushed somewhat violently against one of the posts of brasher's veranda she was evidently a passenger by cobbs to leichardt's town and being alone and naturally alarmed at finding herself in the centre of a political demonstration was making for the shelter of the hotel the premier attracted by the cry glanced downwards from his raised position and met the appealing gaze of a pair of dark eyes which he knew well with more agility than might have been expected judging by his age and figure he vaulted the railings and in a moment was at the lady's side mrs valancy he exclaimed how is it that you are here she grasped his arm and her eyes beamed with gratitude upon his face i have been staying with the ansons at kuranga mr anson brought me down but could not wait to see me off in the coach i am going to leichardt's town this evening so am i i shall be able to look after you you've been knocked again the railings i hope you are not hurt no it was a mere nothing i'm not hurt only a little frightened but quite happy now that you are here i am glad that i have heard you speak in this way it impresses one in a different manner to the dull debates which one listens to from the ladies gallery and you know she added in a lower tone i make rather a merit of not taking any great interest in politics it would not do for me to side openly against my husband whatever i might think and wish in private mr longleat pressed his companion's hand appreciating her delicacy at its very highest pitch a man of coarse fibre is apt to attribute ultra refinement to a woman by whom he is attracted mr valancy was a member of the legislative council though notoriously needy and desirous of a government appointment he belonged to the middleton faction and had made himself peculiarly obnoxious to the reigning ministry the premier had become acquainted with mrs valancy a short time before the present date and notwithstanding the inimical attitude of her husband certain casual meetings and suggestive conversations had deepened a budding interest into something more than commonplace social intimacy i am sorry that you should have been annoyed by the crowd i 
they insisted upon my speaking upon my word i could not have got out of it i wish i had known that you were to be here he spoke with a nervous utterance that except in the presence of ladies was unusual to him ah said mrs valancy in a tone half melancholy half arch i know that you are the idol of the mob such popularity must be very delightful i sincerely hope that you will carry your railway bill i had never before connected it so personally with you party questions have been sources of annoyance to me this one will possess a more agreeable interest they had stepped on to the veranda mr longleat placed one of the canvas chairs for his companion to sit upon all the men turned to look at her but not one except barrington took his pipe from his lips though she was perfectly aware of the attention she excited she did not appear to be embarrassed by it her hat had been tilted back by the push she had sustained and her low brow and fine eyes were fully visible the latter were black slightly prominent and restless and dissatisfied in expression her mouth a curved red line was more characteristic than sweet her colouring was clear and pale her voice low and remarkably distinct the nervous excitability and sensitive refinement which her face and manner suggested were quite calculated to impress such a temperament as that of mr longleat but although his admiration was obvious it was evident that he had not acquired perfect ease in her society in spite of the feminine experience implied by two matrimonial bereavements and the bringing up of a daughter companionship with women of a particular calibre gave him an uncomfortable sense of inferiority and made him conscious of certain lapses in grammar and faults in pronunciation which considerable proficiency as a public speaker and years of unwearied self-education had not enabled him entirely to surmount is miss longleat with you inquired mrs valancy no he replied she is at kooralbin i'm longing to see her again some friends of mine who met her in sydney last winter wrote to me in raptures about her beauty is she as lovely as ever mr longleat smiled and elevated his head with an air of gratified pride yes he said i think she is handsomer now than i've ever seen her she took her place in sydney amongst the best of em as he spoke he caught mr barrington's eye and scowled with incipient dislike though mrs valancy was sitting a little apart from the other loungers in the veranda barrington was sufficiently near to have overheard her remark and the premier's reply an expression of amusement passed over the englishman's face as he mentally pictured a coarse gaudily dressed antipodean belle whose every gesture would inevitably offend against his refined european taste his supercilious smile incensed mr longleat still more deeply and as barrington turned away he asked angrily who is that man he is evidently a stranger said mrs valancy a new chum going up to lord dolph's exclaimed one of the bushmen i could have sworn that he was one of those cursed english swells muttered longley we don't want that brood out here i'm pretty quick at guessing what a man is made of and my impressions don't often deceive me it's instinct and somehow i don't cotton up to lord dolph's new chum the horses had by this time been put to the coach and the driver with the reins in his hand was calling his passengers to mount mr longleat helped mrs valancy to ascend and took his place beside her in the back bench unoccupied by any one else the box seat has been reserved for you sir said the driver never mind answered longleat i've got a lady to look after i'll sit here mrs valancy cast upon him a look of ineffable gratitude the other travellers clambered up the coachman flicked his whip upon the horses backs and the lumbering vehicle clattered off mid the shouts of the rapidly dispersing mob hooray for the premier longleat and his railway for ever end of chapter two chapter three of policy and passion 
this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. policy and passion by rosa campbell prayed chapter three the premier's storekeeper barrington stood on the veranda of the inn and watched the coach till it was out of sight mr ferris who had now emerged from the coffee-room stole softly to the railings and sidled towards the englishman casting at the stranger furtive glances from his keen grey eyes while with one lean hand he stroked his grizzled beard the sun was setting behind a range of distant hills storm-clouds were still threatening and the deepening dusk had mellowed the glaring white of the limestone ridges into neutral grey and had subdued into harmony the hard outlines and ungraceful colouring of the wooden and brick erections upon each side of the street not much of a view said mr ferris looking up in a bird-like way into barrington's face but picturesque in a manner of its own i suppose that one admires the landscape because it is unlike those with which one is familiar replied barrington european travellers say continued mr ferris that there are no striking features in australian scenery bah they cry the eye wearies of endless gum trees but that is a mistake those who speak so have not penetrated into the heart of the country ah uh, we have mountains in the koorong district sublime with a wild grandeur that i have never seen equalled it is nature nature only which reconciles me to my exile you call your life here exile said barrington i presume that you are english have you lived for long in australia nine years replied mr ferris no he added correcting himself it will be ten next september i find it difficult to calculate the course of time when the months are all alike and when they are passed in forests and not in cities yet to you a lover of natural beauty this ought not to be a hardship sir said mr ferris with a grandiloquent air i have my theories let the young seek inspiration in the woods the aged in the breadth of towns there is a close link between nature and humanity to glorify the one necessitates sympathy with the other a poet pent up for life upon the fairest desert island would produce few stanzas worthy of immortality you mean said barrington that the ideal must be yoked to the practical or inspiration becomes bathos you yourself are an artist perhaps i have indeed known the flutterings of enthusiasm and have tasted the bitterness of unappreciated effort said mr ferris in a joyless piping tone with his eyes fixed upon the wooden veranda post in mournful abstraction from his surroundings aspiration has been the keynote of my life failure its refrain that is a melancholy experience said barrington in a sympathetic manner how many are dowered with the yearnings of genius and cursed with executive inability cried mr ferris almost fiercely how many have lived too soon or too late in how many has the divine fire been almost quenched in youth and has emitted but a feeble flame in old age but why do i talk of myself he added with a sudden deprecatory gesture it is a morbid egotism that seeks vent in self-revelation to a passing stranger leichardt's land only sees in me the shadow of her premier's greatness anthony ferris sir at your service thomas longleat's accountant store manager indoor man of all work at Kooralbin he waited a moment then said i glean that you are a new arrival in australia but i have not heard your name barrington replied the englishman shortly i knew a man of that name said mr ferris in a tone of dismal retrospect a long time ago he was a friend of edmund keene poor keene he used to say if i had barrington always with me i should never go wrong 
did you ever see keen sir he added with sharp enthusiasm ah that was an actor such fire such wit i never knew shakespeare till i knew edmund keen he was rather before my time said barrington true you are a considerably younger man than i but i have seen others more nearly your contemporaries macready he was statuesque and had studied charles young kemble i could criticise these but keen deprived me of the power of judgment shall i ever forget that slender man of diminutive stature and finely chiselled features whose piercing orbs held the spectator spellbound while he spoke i saw him last in the merchant of venice signor antonio quoted mr ferris in a low intense voice with deep dramatic intonation then after repeating a few lines he suffered his head to droop dejectedly upon his breast i cannot do it he said the manner has passed from me i am getting old and i forget you saw longleat just now yes replied barrington i was interested amused by the excitement his arrival created people call him my patron thomas longleat patron to me there is a man who not many years ago was absolutely uneducated i taught him all that he knows of the classics i corrected his maiden speech in the assembly and now he jeers at me for a fool it is such a man as that who succeeds in australia may i ask whether you are visiting the antipodes from mere curiosity or whether you have thoughts of becoming a cattle farmer i shall remain in australia if the life suits me replied barrington it will not settle your mind at once upon that score you will be miserable whether you make money or lose what you have by and by you will acknowledge that i am a true prophet to the refined englishman reared amid the associations of art literature music the drama accustomed to european luxury and the charm of congenial society australia if not a hell of discontent must be a sink of degradation you speak strongly said barrington and certainly not encouragingly but i imagine that a man of moderate calibre would be content to exist in a country which afforded him the opportunity for becoming wealthy wealthy ya yeah, snarled anthony ferris in a manner indescribable upon paper money is after all but money's worth for instance what sort of occupation can there be to a man like me in weighing sacks of flour chronicling pounds of beef and calculating roods of fencing is it not a suffocating degrading slavery and such to you will be the disgusting routine of station life stock riding or shepherding branding or shearing buying and selling weariness of body and slow atrophy of intellect you are not young enough to anticipate compensating wealth when if it comes you will have lost the capacity for enjoyment excuse my curiosity are you married no replied barrington you will then lack the incentive of working for a beloved object which sweetens toil to me i dare say that the uneducated would consider my lot enviable i have abundance to eat and drink a comfortable house to live in i am putting by for the benefit of my child ferris's face softened curiously nevertheless you see before you a disappointed man may i ask in what particular line you were unsuccessful asked barrington there was none my ambition was boundless it embraced every phase of art vague aspiration has been my curse i had not courage or patience to continue struggling against fate had i possessed longleat's insensitive nature i might have succeeded mr longleat is also english by birth asked barrington curiously an odd malignant smile passed over mr ferris's face yes english by birth certainly good afternoon tom dungie he added addressing the mailman who had approached the veranda railing what is the news up daraba way it's you that ought to tell us the news mr ferris said dungie folks say that dyson maddox is to be the new minister for lands and that he is to marry miss longleat is it true do you think sir 
it's not unlikely said mr ferris miss longleat is a lady of caprices she may be seized with the caprice for matrimony i dare say i dare say and i wish it might be true but i have not been informed upon the subject well squeaked dungie in his nasal tones i'm sure i wish mr maddox joy of his bargain she's a handsome young woman and if she's got naught else she's got brass they do say as she is rare winnin gels with tin mines at their backs don't grow like wild cherries with the stones outside ready to be picked for the stretching tom dungie always chuckled audibly after uttering what he considered a sharp speech folks tell he whispered mysteriously that the young woman with the black eyes her that sat beside the premier on the coach is a rum sort and that he has got pretty thick with her lately do you think he's hit that's a married woman said mr ferris her husband is in the council marriage ain't no security remarked dungie reflectively i've heard said that twere like drinking a glass of dr grog directly you've swallowed one your mouth begins to parch for another and that's the way with women of a sort there's some of em as can't get on without men she warn't not to look at though it's colour as takes me but a man mostly fancies his opposite and longleat has got enough red for two i were told to look out for a gentleman from england added dungie making a lurch in barrington's direction the lord at deraba sent a act down and a pack oss for the swag i said as i'd show the gentleman the short cut which is pretty stiff for a new chum do you mean lord adolphus bassett asked barrington oh that's his name is it some folks calls him mr bassett and some mr dolph and other folks lord dolph i never knowed rightly which it were and it ain't of much odds i knew him in england said barrington and i am going to stay with him now does he live far from here nigh upon forty mile i shall start at daybreak with my mails can you ride sir yes answered barrington laughing i asked because new chums don't mostly didn't know whether you'd be able to keep up with the little piebald she's a rare un to go she is that there lord ain't much of a hand with a buck jumper but my lady lord she can sit like old nick well you'll hear me callin in the mornin added dungie affably and with another bow which was accomplished by laying his hands upon the pit of his stomach and bending forward as far as the laws of balance would permit he walked away presently a bell rang in the coffee-room and all who had remained in the hotel flocked in to a somewhat nondescript evening meal there was a smoking joint at one end of the table a tin teapot at the other and bread butter and vegetables were placed promiscuously down the sides two women who were respectively mrs brasher and her maid of all work waited the bushmen rough specimens of humanity congregated together barrington and mr ferris took their seats a little apart from the rest of the company there was very little conversation while the meal was in progress the men were hungry and plied their knives and forks vigorously washing down the tough beef and hard bread with copious draughts of tea mr ferris who had taken his stimulant beforehand likewise drank tea barrington called for a pint of sherry and was brought a muddy decoction which he tasted made a wry face and sat down don't drink wine in australia said mr ferris it is bad take to spirits that is the way with most englishmen you will start with theories about colonial wine i did but like me you will find that they are a delusion there is a good wine made in the south but till the intercolonial duty is abolished it will never become the national drink brandy is cheaper so we ruin our nervous systems with strong tea and our digestions by promiscuous nips you will be asked a dozen times in the day to come and have a nip and if you are weak-minded as i am you will yield till you find that without a stimulant you are a poor creature the higher your mental calibre the more you'll drink it is longleat's boast that he is temperate yah a fig for temperance when a man has the fame of a hercules and the insusceptibility of a bullock-driver you don't seem to have much appetite 
i see that you have been accustomed to a different style of cooking if you have finished we will sit out in the veranda there's a storm in the west but its strength will be spent before it reaches kuya the thunder has cooled the air already and we shall be able to smoke in comparative comfort mr ferris led the way to the veranda and pulled two armchairs to a breezy corner he then produced his leather tobacco pouch and a short black pipe and began to smoke drawing deep breaths as though he enjoyed the narcotism the soft air and the fading light while every now and then he uttered in a snarling neutral tone some discursive remark upon australian customs or sneering allusion to his master he seemed a man oppressed by an immense burden of discontent the veranda was almost empty most of the bushmen had taken up their hats and had gone out there was a circus performing in a neighbouring street and the attraction weighed even against the charms of the coffee-room was too potent to be resisted every now and then shrill bursts of laughter and the braying of musical instruments sounded through the murky night of which the darkness was at regular intervals illuminated by flashes of sheet lightning in the west you have lately come from england said mr ferris edging a little closer to his companion i dare say that you have lived in london eh yes said barrington with a short laugh i am very well acquainted with london you've seen the best in the world then there's no place like london except perhaps paris lord peering with his little grey eyes into barrington's face that's what i call life balzac and paul de Kock, eh i dare say now that you know all the club gossip and theatrical scandal i like a spice of the devil it's piquant it's refreshing now it would interest me to hear who are the newest singers and actors and the painters who have become famous since i was in england i might perhaps recognize familiar names i used to be considered a good critic in my day at kooralbyn i have a few gems slight things done for me by comparatively insignificant artists in whom i saw the germs of future eminence if you are a lover of art i shall be happy at some time to show you the sketches barrington thanked the old man and humouring his fancy talked on with the air of one to whom the subject was familiar of the latest operas the last academy the newest scandals in the fashionable and artistic world the gossip of the clubs and theatres while every now and then mr ferris would interrupt him with some eager question which showed how deeply he was interested and you have left all this he exclaimed at length you have deliberately chosen a life of toil and discomfort amidst the wilds of australia in preference to one of refined enjoyment in england you surprise me my visit is only an experiment said barrington i have not yet determined to remain in australia excuse me said mr ferris with hesitating curiosity something in your manner and bearing leads me to suppose that you have been in the army am i right i was in the guards replied barrington incautiously a moment later he regretted his want of reticence the guards repeated ferris i am more than ever astonished that you can entertain even as an experiment the idea of living in australia i am no longer in the army said barrington curtly and added in a manner that left no room for further questioning i think you said that you knew lord dolph bassett he has a selection down the coorong about fifteen miles from coorabin coorabin is the name of mr longleat's property asked barrington anxious to divert the conversation from himself a native word i presume meaning the abode of serpents certain poetic swains have dubbed miss longleat the enchantress of coorabin and in a confusion of classical metaphors have addressed her in sonnets as medusa and circe apart from its feminine attraction coorabin is worth a visit the country is wild picturesque inspiring it might be the refuge of a timon or the dreamland of a poet come over and see it but you err in using the word property in your acceptation of the term there is no property in australia the owner of freehold is the petty agriculturist the representative of a lower order of settler 
than the squatter the bloated aristocrat is he who leases from the crown and whose rich pastures are only his own till a new land law a mine or a railway turns a horde of free selectors loose upon his borders mr longleat professes impartiality and sympathy with all classes it is his political creed and he finds that it brings him in popularity lord dolph took up land on cool robin longleat smiled grimly and offered to help him brand his cattle they are the best of friends but at first the squatterarchy of the coorong rose up in a body and named its hero martyr lord dolph then is a free selector he cattle farms a few thousand acres after an amateur fashion my lady breaks in the horses and takes care that the calves are branded it is said that she has an eye to business and does not disdain nuggeting she was a coorong girl a sancy scotch lassie and he married her because he was told that it was the correct thing for a bush man to have a wife he builds rustic bridges fancies pigs and poultry plays the piano and poses as a squatter in moleskins and a cabbage tree hat she manages the farm a fair division of labour returned barrington you will find it dull at de Raba, continued mr ferris and lord dolph will probably propose a visit to Corobin. mr longleat will be in leichardt's town occupied with political matters unless indeed the ministry goes out at the beginning of the session i shall however be charmed to introduce you to my wife and daughter you may or may not see miss longleat that will be as the caprice takes her your allusions to this young lady pique my curiosity is the enchantress of coolrobin a person indeed out of the common or is she merely a pretty rustic spoiled by flattery rustic repeated mr ferris chuckling soft to himself i dare say that you have seen some of the most beautiful women in europe nevertheless you will certainly admire honoria longleat a fine piece of flesh with money to enhance her charms she is an only child then no mr longleat has been twice married his first wife the mother of honoria was a beautiful drab whom i believe he picked up at the diggings his second was the daughter of a squatter on the ubi ubi she died at the birth of a girl her only one now a child of seven the premier's matrimonial arrangements and my own have been curiously similar i also have had two wives my second is still living i have my theory sir upon marriage as upon other subjects i consider a carefully discriminated diversity the important element in the generation of a perfect type since i could not succeed in making a mark in the world i was determined to beget a celebrity i chose my wife upon physiological principles the result would have been all that could have been desired had she presented me with a son mrs ferris has failed in the one duty which i required of her you see disappointment is my doom but miss longleat's fortune suggested barrington recalling the old man to his own point of interest true when honoria longleat's eldest daughter was a baby in arms old jem baggett a ticket of leave man and the premier's pal when they drove bullock teams together between leichardt's town and kooya left her a bit of land in the tarangella district which was then considered of little value this bit of land is now the great tarangella tin mine bringing in somewhere about four thousand per annum and is this fortune absolutely her own asked barrington excitedly it will be absolutely upon the day that she is twenty-one at present the income is accumulating for her benefit oh she is a great heiress there's coolrobin and mundabera the valley of the leichardt the house in leichardt's town and the lord knows how many political pickings to be divided between her and little janey and she is her father's favourite a fine thing to be transported in the old days eh if a man had brains and luck a fine thing for a woman to be handsome and rich what does it matter if her father was a bullock driver and her mother mr ferris shrugged his shoulders significantly in polite society nobody asks any embarrassing questions there's only one thing in the world better than money and beauty and that's genius i have a daughter too mr barrington and i am as proud of her as longleat is of his but in a different way a very different way 
miss ferris is talented perhaps said barrington my angela will be a great artist said mr ferris lifting his head with a sublimity of conviction that amused while it silenced his companion sir he added with a kind of proud humility i know my weakness i know my failings the soul of genius was born with me but not the power of fulfilment i have prayed that i might be the father of an artist who should combine inspiration and execution do i not know the ecstasy of vision and the hell of inability i said to myself i will beget a son who shall be great two generations could not be foredoomed to failure instead of a son a daughter was born to me a frail creature visionary and mystical with an extraordinary development of the creative faculty from the day that as a child she drew upon the floor and wall rough sketches with a piece of chalk i devoted her to the cause of art nature has been her nurse cradled in the lap of inspiration she has led an ideal life among woods and mountains it is for her sake that i labour for her sake that i submit to insult and degradation i have saved a thousand pounds to be expended upon her artistic education in a year's time i shall take her to italy in ten the name of ferris will be renowned barrington listened in amused toleration of the old man's tall talk he no more believed in angela ferris's genius than he believed in honoria longleat's beauty yet he felt a languid interest in both subjects and would have liked to pursue them clearly there was a covert antagonism between ferris and his patron and being an observer of human nature in default of better occupation barrington was ready to follow up the current of jealousy and crabbed conceit to its source the old man however rose abruptly you seem a link between my former life and the present your companionship has excited me beyond my want and i have talked of matters which are purely personal pray attach no importance to my wandering speech i am a soured old man now i have smoked out my pipe and the storm is threatening closely there has been heavy rain in leichardt's town i'll say good-night you start early to-morrow morning but we shall meet ere long at cool robin mr ferris shuffled indoors to the coffee-room and thence to bed End of chapter three chapter four of policy and passion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org policy and passion by rosa campbell prayed chapter four the weaving of the spell the coach rattled on beyond the outskirts of kooya past plantations of pineapples and bananas and pretty wooden cottages embedded in orange groves and vineyards till cultivation and even clearing ceased and hedges of cactus and acacia or rough stockading that divided the settlers paddocks from the road gave place to monotonous forests of she-oak and eucalyptus where there was the brooding stillness of a coming storm at intervals the driver paused before a bush inn of which at long distances apart there were several standing solitary among the trees to change horses call for the mail or give the passengers an opportunity of descending for refreshment the night closed in a murky cloud grew black overhead and occasional growlings of thunder told that the storm was advancing mrs valancy and mr longleat were practically alone in the hinder part of the coach and their tete-a-tete -tete, carried on under cover of the rattling of bolts and springs the flapping of curtains and general din of motion was inaudible to the men in front how kind of you it was to give up the box-seat and come here to amuse me said mrs valancy in her pathetic monotone it would have been too horrid had i been placed beside any of our companions i can never be sufficiently grateful to providence for sending you to leichardt's town this evening 
i do not like to think that you often travel by yourself in this way said longleat i do not often travel by myself replied she mimicking his tone only when necessity obliges me as is the case to-night i thought that you admired independent women you have certainly said so she added alluding to one of his public speeches in which he had advocated female labour in certain government departments the women i meant aren't of your sort there's things which drag down both sexes alike and both should be on the same ground i should like to see all women taught to work for their bread when i meet one with the pluck to take her own line and fight against poverty and prejudice i respect her for it but it cuts me to the quick to see a young timid and if you'll excuse my saying it pretty creature like you who has the right to look for protection from others jostled about in this way you should not travel alone at night in a public conveyance like hobbs you lay yourself open to to unpleasant remark she said concluding his stammering sentence yes i understand you are right but it is not my fault you ought to know that i dislike it if you were my my father let us say you would not allow me to go about like this but you are not my father i have no one to take care of me except my husband i am married yet there is no one more solitary than i am the world is hard to me i am thrown upon outsiders for sympathy and support and because two or three friends who happen to be men give these to me society judges me cruelly is it not so mrs valancy turned her large eyes upon mr longleat with a frank confiding expression of which she was mistress he was regarding her fixedly but as their eyes met he abruptly withdrew his gaze and turned his face away without answering her plaintive question given a nascent interest rapidly deepening into a powerful predilection and an unconventional combination of circumstances which places the admirer in close propinquity with the object of his attention it will depend entirely upon the man's idiosyncrasy whether the position inspires deference or awakens passion in the case of the typical gentleman that chivalrous loyalty which is as much inherent as the result of education forbids the merest suggestion of license but the man of coarse fibre and rude training who has made it his creed to seize opportunity for the furtherance of ambition or the accomplishment of desire and who is ignorant of the subtle definitions of a refined code of honour though he may accurately limit his intentions has less control over his emotions such a man does not analyse his inner feelings there are in his nature no softening shadows nor can he comprehend the imperceptible blending of passive interest with active regard with him the machinery of passion comes into sudden play and startles by the violent effect it produces mr longleat sat silent for some moments taking no notice of several discursive observations with which she sought to relieve his embarrassment he felt shy of addressing her and tried to steer his thoughts into more impersonal channels he endeavoured to direct them towards the political conflict in store for him which for months past had held his nerves in a state of tension in the estimation of the inhabitants of leichardt's town the coming session was merely a pleasant stimulus to excitement and the present determinant of a railway that must sooner or later be built to longleat it meant the crowning act of his career upon which rested the balance of victory or defeat it was the climax of a struggle for supremacy involving his dearest ambitions and affections 
the least poetic man who has succeeded in life is conscious at times of a vein of romance permeating a temperament that he has been proud to style matter-of-fact it is the perception of the ideal side by side with the actual that gives courage to encounter and surmount difficulties he who is devoid of imagination rarely accomplishes a great enterprise a man may scoff at superstition and yet have a dim consciousness of occult influence at work upon his destiny at this moment mr longleat felt a curious presentiment that he was approaching a crisis in his fate and that mrs valancy whose presence affected him so strongly had unknowingly identified herself with his failure or success as they drove on through the deepening darkness a sense of unreality oppressed him and it seemed to him that he was being whirled in a dream through an enchanted forest to a destination of which he was ignorant at last ashamed and annoyed at his unusual susceptibility mr longleat started forward and pulled himself together uttering an ironical pshaw what is the matter asked mrs valancy nothing by the way i hear that mr fielding has sailed for melbourne he left leichardt's town last week by the mail-boat replied mrs valancy with a perceptible alteration in her voice is it true that you went down to the bay to see him off yes my husband was with me was there any harm in that i suppose not answered mr longleat then added in a tone of displeasure you were very friendly with fielding when he was in leichardt's town are you too going to cavil at my friendships said mrs valancy plaintively i had fancied though indeed i can hardly tell why for we have known each other but a short time that i could always count upon kindness from you i need not tell you that you may always count upon that replied mr longleat will you not say friendship what could one desire more than kindness if i asked anything else i should beg that you would put aside any feeling of animosity you may entertain towards my husband and that you would come and see me sometimes you have not been within my doors i i have not ventured stammered longleat who had alternations of boldness and timidity but if i may see you home after your journey my husband will probably meet me at the australasian when the coach arrives said mrs valancy but if not i shall gratefully take advantage of your offer ah she cried what a vivid flash i am as weak as a baby in thunder and lightning i can only hide my face and tremble there's a storm coming up said longleat but it is from the mildest quarter and will soon be over do not be frightened i cannot help feeling terrified of course i know that the chances are a thousand to one against any harm befalling me the terror is partly from association when i was a child my nurse used to keep me good during a thunderstorm by telling me that god was angry and still i cannot overcome the uneasy sense that some one who has no sympathy with my weaknesses is scolding me mightily then came another flash followed by an angry concussion and she cowered back laying her trembling hand upon mr longleat's arm presently she asked are you ever angry with your daughter angry with honoria by jove no she has a spice of the tartar in her composition and would not stand being scolded she takes her own way i dare say it is fortunate for us both that her will does not often clash with mine and when it pulls her in a contrary direction to that which you wish you turn and let her lead you no replied longley gruffly in some matters i am a fool where my daughter is concerned but for all that i am master of myself she must be very happy continued mrs valancy plaintively when i was quite young i had my own way too i used to think that i needed only to ask in order to get what i wanted but since i married i have found life different after all we white women are no better off than the lubras 
we are sold like them and then we have to walk behind our lords and bear their burdens now the storm broke in quick angry claps of thunder and vivid flashes of forked lightning which illuminated the coach in momentary gleams and showed the frightened leaders as snorting and plunging they turned wildly in their traces whoa shouted the driver as he cut the animal sharply with his whip what are you shying at now the coach rattled on over a wooden bridge while the rain descended in heavy drops that penetrated the ill-constructed awning oh dear sighed mrs valancy i'm getting so wet mr longleat unstrapped his poncho and placed it round her shoulders then with one hand held down the flapping curtains in order to protect her somewhat from the driving shower a strong wind had succeeded the late stillness and blew upon their faces bearing an exhilarating sense of coolness gradually the thunder became fainter and the lightning less brilliant the storm was passing over and the passengers in front began to talk again about politics and crops and cattle conversation in which at any other time the premier would have joined with interest but which to-night resembled in his mind the refrain of a vivid dream soon the wind and the rain ceased the sky became clear and blue the southern cross rose gem-like above the horizon and the moon shone brightly the horses were brisk again and the coach splashed heavily through the pools left by the storm the clammy heat had given place to a delicious feeling of freshness and moisture the air was fragrant with the perfume of wild flowers and scented gum and myriads of insects silenced during the day by the choking dust filled the night with inarticulate murmurings the houses along the road became more numerous and the lights of leichardt's town shone one by one like stars through the trees the bush merged imperceptibly into a straggling street and the coach paused for a moment to pay toll at a bridge which spanned the leichardt river the stream here about a quarter of a mile wide and with scarcely a ripple upon its leaden surface rolled between low wharf lined banks and green gardens towards the sea the lights of small craft dotted here and there seemed like reflections from the sky above and the moon shed her beams across the track of a ferry-boat that plied monotonously to and fro over the water there was a faint distant buzz but here the tinkle of the steamer bells and the voices of the boatmen calling to waiting passengers hoy ahoy o o where were the only distinct sounds in the deep stillness the coach drove slowly across the bridge into the city proper here the streets were wide and well built the shops gaily lighted and the traffic considerable now the driver pulled up before a large hotel in the principal thoroughfare a little crowd had collected about the veranda the passengers alighted and the premier assisted mrs valancy to the ground she gazed helplessly about her i cannot see my husband she said since he is not here i will gratefully avail myself of your escort at least to the ferry the premier hailed a passing jingle he placed mrs valancy and her luggage upon the back seat of this ill-balanced vehicle and stationing himself in front with the driver gave the order to the emu point upper ferry leichardt's town is curiously situated upon three peninsulas lying parallel with each other and formed by the snake-like curves of the river which divides them the city lies in the middle and is called the north side in contradistinction to south leichardt's town with which it is connected by a bridge while emu point the suburb where mrs valancy lived faces it again on the opposite bank it will be readily seen that whereas to follow the windings of the river would necessitate a journey of some miles by taking the ferry three times in a direct line the distance from one side of the town to the other might be rendered comparatively slight the site has much natural beauty to recommend it like a broad blue band the leichardt flows between undulating stretches of lightly wooded country here and there beyond the line of wharves and stores the banks rise rocky and precipitous 
and overgrown with ferns and the variegated laterna but mostly slope gently to the water's edge in gardens and grassy pastures fringed with mangrove while in the suburbs white roads wind among clumps of feathery bamboos or by acacia hedges which bound pretty villas and verandahed cottages in the distant west there lies a low range of hills which shuts out the view of the river to the east the broadening stream hurries downward to the sea the lower part of the middle point to which mr longleat and mrs valancy were at this time driving is intersected by a long street at one end of which lies a ferry while at the other the parliamentary chambers comprised in an imposing stone structure of the modern nondescript style of architecture overlook the river and south leichardt's town the extremity of the point is divided into two allotments in one of these stands government house surrounded by its trim lawns and shrubberies the other is laid out in parterres grass plots and cool walks overshadowed by flowering mimosa palms and bunya trees these gardens are always open for public resort opposite them the river bank rises high and rocky and is crowned by villas overgrown with creepers and commanding a view of the whole town here mrs valancy lived near the houses of parliament encroaching as it were upon the public pleasure grounds and divided from them by a screen of bamboo trees there is an enclosure in which at that time stood mr longleat's town house it was a two-storied building with green venetian shutters and a deep veranda and was hidden from the street by clumps of oleanders and two giant moraton bay fig trees but mr longleat and his companion driving straight towards the ferry passed considerably to the left of this house which lay almost the length of the street behind them when after dismissing their jingle they stood upon the wooden ferry steps and waited till the plash of oars announced the return of the boat they seated themselves at the stern and were rowed across the river the boatman talked freely as he leisurely dipped his oars his name was pettit and he was a well-known character in leichardt's town he spoke in a precise dogmatic manner and moved a pair of toothless jaws in a rapid and discursive monologue yes there had been a heavy storm but it made no odds to him wet or dry it was his business to pull across that air darned river and there was folks as swore if the boat warn't at one crossing and cussed wuss if it warn't at the other he didn't want to name no names but there war a gent livin not very far up the emu point hill as were sometimes a bit tight and most often waxy he wished now that the house was going to sit that this air gent who was a member of the council would go and strike his diggings at the other side and if longleat he added unconscious of the identity of his passenger would get another bridge built instead of making a railway that were only good for squatters and free selectors why he for one wouldn't cry out mr longleat paid the toll of pence and offered mrs valancy his arm to aid her in ascending the steep hill the road was rough and the dwellings scattered and there was no light but that of the moon to guide them along the straggling street wet with the late downpour they walked up the rugged footpath her occasional stumbles and clinging hold deepening mr longleat's sense of protection while in his breast rose a strong feeling of indignation against the supine indifference of mr valancy who had permitted his wife to make so late a journey unattended and who by failing to meet her at the stopping-place of the coach had left her to the tender mercy of any chance traveller who might offer his escort across the river longleat's thoughts found vent in words it is not right he said impulsively that you should be left to shift for yourself in this way suppose that i that i had not been travelling down from kuya this evening what would have become of you i should have arrived in leichardt's town in the most commonplace manner replied mrs valancy lightly though there was a tremor in her voice which did not fail to deepen his compassion then not finding my husband at the australasian i should have taken a fly to the ferry pettit would have been delighted to offer me his protection i should have procured the escort of a little boy from the ferry-house and should have reached home in perfect safety 
oh i am accustomed to taking care of myself there are not many knights errant in australia mr longleat and i have looked too long on the dark side of human nature to expect under any circumstances to find that men are actuated by chivalrous impulses i should at first have felt shy and extremely uncomfortable and the storm would have frightened me horribly afterwards i should have looked at the situation from a philosophic point of view and should probably have listened with a deep personal interest to the political conversation of the men in front of me i now feel myself quite in a position to judge of the advantages of your projected railway i suppose she went on that you will soon be in the thick of your parliamentary battle i used to feel glad when the session opened while the house is sitting i am left more alone and have greater liberty to do as i please that is a bad speech for a wife to make is it not but you understand me and why should i play the hypocrite when all the world knows so well what i must feel now i shall be rather sorry when the conflict begins for i have learned to look upon you as a friend and politics will keep us apart i do not see why that should be said longleat you and my husband belong to antagonistic factions that need not make any difference to you and me look here mrs valancy i am not the man to brag about my own doings but it's a fact that i should not have worked up to the top of the tree if i hadn't stuck staunch to my friends irrespective of faction it is not because your husband is on middleton's side that i-that i he stammered hardly daring to finish the sentence which had almost escaped him that you dislike him added mrs valancy softly i know i know i am afraid that he is not popular i wish she exclaimed impulsively then hesitated i wish that he was not in the council she paused uncertain of her ground then boldly tried to frame in words the thought which during the drive from kooya had been uppermost in her mind if he had some regular employment which would bring him in money and furnish him with a vent for his energies we are very poor we are deeply in debt i bear the burden of it all i am a miserable woman it would make me so much happier if you could help me to become happier i don't see how that is possible said longley looking down upon her and not exactly apprehending her meaning i cannot rid you of an incubus as i would do if i had the power tell me in what way i can help you if i can do anything for you you have only got to ask me suppose said mrs valancy emboldened by his manner and turning her eyes towards his face as they walked on together suppose that i were to ask you to give my husband an appointment a police magistrate's post perhaps work which would take him away from leichardt's town from temptations the premier started as though he had been stung and mrs valancy felt in a moment that she had overshot her mark you need not be afraid she exclaimed in a bantering tone i would not for the world tamper even by suggestion with ministerial policy i know that subject is sacred don't rebuke me too severely for my boldness i could not bear to fall under your wrath but apart from joking i thought that it was considered diplomatic to buy off an opponent that may be the creed of some politicians said longleat excitedly it isn't mine i have kept my hands clean since the day i took my seat upon the treasury bench my worst enemy can't say again me that i have ever given away a government place to curry favour with an adversary or to pay a friend i am glad that you call it joking mrs valancy it had cut my heart to refuse you anything that you asked for serious but i couldn't do that promise me that you'll think no more of it she urged i couldn't bear to feel that you were angry with me it wouldn't be possible for me to be angry with you he said there are there might be other ways of helping you if you'd let me name them we have reached my cottage she said pausing before a wicket gate which gave access to a dim-looking garden situated upon the brow of the hill you will come and see me soon and tell me what is in your mind won't you come in now oh yes my husband will be glad to know she added with a touch of sarcasm in her tone that i have been so efficiently escorted from the australasian mr longleat hesitated for a moment then entered 
End of chapter 4chapter five of policy and passion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org policy and passion by rosa campbell prayed chapter five mrs valancy's home mrs valancy and mr longleat walked up the narrow path leading to the house and stepped on to the veranda which was wide and breezy and upon one side overlooked the river the wooden posts were festooned by trailing creeper through which the moonbeams shed quivering shadows upon the boards and without the shrubs of heliotrope and purple magnolia that bordered the grass plat made the night air heavy with perfume mrs valancy softly tried one of the venetian shutters then finding that it did not yield to her touch rang a little bell that hung against the wall presently a maid opened the french window and mrs valancy led the way into the drawing-room a pretty room encumbered with furniture unoccupied and dimly lighted by a shaded lamp which was placed upon a small table near the fireplace there was a door upon the opposite side of the apartment which was closed is your master at home asked mrs valancy i think ma'am that he is smoking in the dining-room was the reply mrs valancy motioned mr longleat to a seat opened the inner door and passed into the next room where she faced her husband he was an unprepossessing-looking man tall and rakish with a shambling gait and dissipated appearance yet with the indefinable stamp of gentility upon his features and clothes mr valancy's income was known to be almost nominal nevertheless he was always well dressed played high had loose cash drank expensive wines in no small quantity and though he kept but a small number of servants lived luxuriously what the deuce was all that tomfoolery about the ansons was his greeting to his wife and why didn't you come home when you first intended they wished me to remain and i did not suppose that my absence made any difference to you they nursed me and were kind to me you seem to forget edward that i am not strong and that i need consideration said mrs valancy and mr longleat in the next room remarked the defiant tone of her voice it would be strange if i forgot it you are always wanting a change and posing as an injured innocent your ill health is entirely owing to your abominable temper i think that it is time you came back though when you are at home you make yourself so deucedly unpleasant that i am glad to be rid of you i expected that you would meet me at kooya she said resentfully you might have known better i have not the money to travel about the country at your pleasure you have generally money to do what you like she retorted in a low tone take care what you say there is someone in the drawing-room whom have you got here now as i was alone mr longleat who travelled with me in the coach was kind enough to accompany me from the australasian said mrs valancy in a louder tone as she threw open the door behind her and longleat feeling somewhat uncomfortable rose and advanced towards the husband and wife how do you do said mr valancy sulkily shaking hands with his political foe it's very hot this evening the storm don't seem to have cleared the air much the thunder is still hovering about said mr longleat i think that i ought to be going across the water again i only wanted to see mrs valancy safe within doors it's getting late and i've had a long journey from Coralbin you're down for the opening i suppose said valancy you'll find no end of fellows at the club have something before you go connie why the deuce don't you see that there's ice in the house i do not care about anything thank you replied mr longleat hastily nothing i beg i must really be off good-night good-night mrs valancy 
i'll let you out she said moving on before him she held the door open for him to pass through then closed it behind them both when they had reached the veranda she paused and timidly touched his arm you'll come again soon she said you see i want friends i'm nearly always at home in the afternoons come in a day or two before parliament opens yes i'll come said mr longleat forgetting under the influence of the moment a prudent resolve that he had made in the veranda connie called valancy from within good-bye she murmured waving her hand lightly then re-entered the dining-room where her husband had seated himself at the table give me a kiss he said i'm glad to see you home again i wish you'd look happier i've had cursed bad luck at cards to-night and i was annoyed because you never wrote to me from the ansons if i had known that longleat was in the next room i should not have spoken to you so angrily what does it matter it is nothing new she said without moving to grant him the embrace for which he had asked her apathy showed no trace of resentment he looked at her for a moment with an expression half ironical half despairing then sullenly drooped his head upon his breast presently he asked suddenly where is the brandy get me some if you please i would not take any more if i were you she replied coldly if you were me and had business matters to worry you you'd be glad enough to take something which would help you to forget them bring me something strong i'm tired i cannot drink this wash i suppose that i have my worries too she answered bitterly if i had yours i'd face them honestly i wouldn't drink champagne every evening and leave my butcher unpaid i wouldn't play at cards and smoke expensive cigars and talk big when i knew all the time that i could not meet the bills i'd ask my friends to back for me i would not be sot and stupefy myself till there wasn't an ounce of manliness left in me you're a bold woman to speak to me in this way said valancy what do you mean if you had been a true man you would never have asked brian fielding to lend you money she exclaimed recklessly who told you that what has he been saying it was money that he owed me explain yourself it was money borrowed said she incisively it is not the first time that you have turn circumstances to your advantage but i warned you to spare him i warned you not to goad me too far have you suddenly turned prude said valancy roused by her manner i've let you have your own way without asking questions but if i really believed that you cared for fielding i'd you'd borrow more money from him said she with bitter sarcasm you go too far said valancy lifting his sullen red eyes from the tablecloth take care how you irritate me i know you too well to give you credit for any sentimental weakness i have allowed you liberty because i knew that you were too selfish to abuse it i discovered long ago that you only married me because you thought i was rich how rightly you have been served if you had taken any pains to please me i should have been a different husband to you you have no heart even when the child died you did not fret a woman does not fret when her heart is broken said mrs valancy with the sound of suppressed tears in her voice you make me hard you teach me to be bad she was leaving the room but he detained her you have not got me the brandy she went out and presently returned with a decanter of spirit which she placed before him don't go yet i have something else to say to you why did you bring longleat here to-night i told you that we were travelling together in the coach seeing that i was alone he very kindly brought me home i could do nothing else than ask him in i detest that man exclaimed mr valancy savagely i would do him an ill turn if i could i owe him more than one they would have given me the chairmanship of committees if he had not been against me well his day is nearly over do you think so surely he will carry his loan bill i would lay any money that he does not 
the majority will oppose him mrs valancy shrugged her shoulders but said nothing forbes has resigned the police magistracy of gundaroo continued mr valancy and middleton has promised it to me if he comes into power it's a beastly hole you won't like going there gundaroo a new northern settlement was at that time the ultima thule of civilization in leichardt's land but the post was important and there was a considerable salary attached to it mrs valancy looked interested you would take it yes for a short time there seems no prospect of anything better and the screw is good and would help me to get rid of this load of debt middleton is not in power yet said mrs valancy quietly and left the room if i could only persuade longleat to send him there she said to herself as she stood looking at her pretty but haggard face in the toilet glass have i no heart oh brian you know that a word about connie valancy her father had been one of the first government residents in leichardt's land in the early days of the colony when emigration was principally confined to the more energetic members of the upper classes of english society when handsome cadets full of pluck and adventure became dare-devil pioneers eager to distinguish themselves by feats of horsemanship and reckless bravery when hardships were numerous and the joys of life scarce so that a pretty girl was worshipped as a goddess straight from olympus connie brayborn had been the belle of the district before she was seventeen there was hardly an unmarried man in the colony who had not made her an offer she was a terrible coquette exacted admiration as her tribute and thought it rather a feather in her cap to be styled a heartless flirt at last came upon the scene one brian fielding a tall handsome squatter well born and travelled with no money to speak of but plenty of assurance and with a fascinating manner that women found it difficult to resist the two fell desperately in love with each other and entered into an indefinite sort of engagement of which the consummation was to be delayed till brian possessed a station of his own and a house in sydney but connie's father was ambitious and she too was vain and light of love and had cherished lurking visions of life in england of costly clothes and unlimited admiration from higher quarters brian went back to his post of superintendent at an inland station which had an unpronounceable name and a male once in three months and connie to whom flirting had acquired a new stimulus from the fact of its being a forbidden luxury was left unsupported in the midst of temptations to inconstancy and finally threw over her lover in favour of mr valancy who had aristocratic connections and the reputation of wealth there was a story of intercepted letters of treachery and compulsion but be that as it may connie brayborn married mr valancy in the leichardt's town church and went off with him for her honeymoon in england she soon found that her husband's riches were mythical and that her grand match resolved itself into poverty brag a taste for expensive luxuries without the means of gratifying it and doubtful treatment by her new relatives who flouted her and despised him she was at first passionately discontented then fell into a state of listless melancholy and finally became reckless and defiant after a year or two of bohemian existence in europe during which connie's knowledge of the evil side of humanity deepened considerably they returned to leichardt's land mr valancy was created a member of the legislative council and made it his aim to get into power but being of an aggressive and cantankerous disposition contrived to render himself so obnoxious to both political parties that the lucrative government appointment which he hoped to obtain always dangled temptingly just beyond his reach 
he would condescend to no secondary place and was loath to deprive himself of the opportunity of making disagreeable allusions in the house nothing less than the bait of a police magistracy and a good salary would have satisfied his pride and as his influence was small and his abusive attacks were merely pin-pricks the government in power always hesitated to buy him at his own price he kept up a good appearance though every one knew that he was steeped in debt and there were ugly rumours afloat as to the source of the ready money by means of which he staved off disgrace an unfortunate marriage may produce in a woman either a state of passive indifference or of emotional craving after some outward form of satisfaction in constance valancy's case flirtation seemed the only antidote to disappointment she had no high-souled yearnings to carry her beyond the influence of her passionate excitability she had begun life with the self-made compact that caresses and admiration were to be her portion and seeing that they were denied her from a legitimate quarter could not overcome a sense of ill-usage while in her heart there was always present a cankerous regret after brian fielding the one man she had truly loved her disposition held no truth compelling instincts to define the boundary between right and wrong and contact with an ignoble self-indulgent nature brought into force a tendency to deceit she lied to her husband justifying falsehood as a weapon against irritable vanity and unreasonable abuse so she fed her morbid longings upon the stimulant of coquetry and though she had not suffered actual shipwreck had more than once steered dangerously near the rocks shortly before the opening of this story brian fielding still fascinating and still poor reappeared in leichardt's town and renewed his acquaintance with mrs valancy he had met her at first with a simulated indifference which had roused her old passion and piqued her desire for conquest then he alternately sought and avoided her and finally had drifted into a sweet but dangerous friendship this state of things was broken by mr fielding's sudden departure for melbourne on a matter of business likely to result in a permanent appointment in that city the fact of his wife's former engagement was a secret to mr valancy otherwise it may be doubted whether base though he was he would have encouraged the intercourse connie had flirted scores of times since their marriage and he had profited by her love of admiration to borrow money from her adorers but to do him justice he did not doubt her fidelity he loved her after an unreasonable fashion at one time caressing at another upbraiding her and making her the confidant of his petty ambitions and knavish intrigues till any womanly delicacy that she might have possessed was blunted to cynical indifference a weary distaste for life fell upon her after brian's departure she panted for freedom and scorn of her husband became transformed to active hatred oh to be rid of the incubus she was reckless enough to have eloped with brian had he been willing to take her but there was no money on either side she could not ruin his prospects and there were times too when she felt that her influence was waning and almost doubted the sincerity of his devotion and now he was gone and though he had promised to write to her had sworn not to forget her the consolation of his presence had departed from her money troubles were weighing upon her she was beginning to feel the pressure of want creditors threatened she was wretched felt ill and was losing her beauty her overmastering desire now was to escape from the irritation of her husband's presence and to secure wealth and freedom from annoyance at this juncture she became intimate with the premier end of chapter five chapter six of policy and passion 
this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org policy and passion by rosa campbell prayed chapter six you must marry honoria longleat early the next morning barrington and tom dungie left kooya the former was mounted upon one of lord dolph's hacks while dungie rode the little piebald which he frequently apostrophized in terms admonitory or admiring he carried his mail-bag strapped in front of his saddle and drove before him the pack-horse which bore barrington's luggage conveniently disposed in two canvas bags for some miles the road led through a semi-cultivated locality beside portions of uncleared forest alternating with paddocks where browsed the lean kine that supplied kooya with milk and butter past bush homesteads where children clustered round the log doorsteps and shouted at the sight of strangers by fields of yellow maize and plantations of cotton in which the flakes of down had just burst their brown pods till at last the trees almost met over the narrow track even the public houses ceased and the last log hut that marked the bounds of human habitation for miles to come had been left behind now barrington felt himself to be in the bush this forest solitude filled with the incessant chirp of locusts the winging of butterflies and rustling of the tall dry grass the monotonous hoo 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 of the wonga pigeon and shrill screech of the jackass was quite unfamiliar to the englishman whose rambles had never before extended beyond the boundaries of europe tom dungie rode at a jog trot which covered the ground quickly and was not distressing to man or beast the mailman was a garrulous little creature and when he was not talking to his companion addressed a disjointed soliloquy to his horse now then stupid hain't yer learnt the track yet well you air an old umbug you air can't you tell a log when yer sees one now then hurry along stir your stumps we got to be at cool bin to-night i dare say that you find cooler bin a pleasant stopping-place said barrington already identifying the name with miss longleat i don't know that it ain't a little better nor some others said tom critically i'm took into the kitchen instead o being set to the huts but the glass of grog ain't as reg'lar as might be it depends mostly on what i bring leastways on what i has for miss longleat how is that asked barrington she comes down to the crossing sometimes when i'm pretty early and takes the mail-bag herself and then i stands and watches her open her letters lor i can tell by the handwriting if they're from her sweethearts if i happens to have a book or summit of that sort from mr dyson maddox it is tom says she i dare say you're tired ask mrs ferris for a glass of rum or if i hain't got nothing pertickler tom she says what's the news derabaway and so on gradual like to baramunda my word they're sharp creatures women it ain't every one as knows how to take em you hain't seen her yet have you no replied barrington she's awful handsome but bless you i don't take no account on her some men are funky upon speaking to her i've seen gents as didn't know what to say when they looked at her struck all of a heap like but women is like osses them as don't understand em is most afeard on em the narrowness of the track which now wound among large boulders of rock and was strewn with loose stones compelled them to ride single file they were descending a high range which commanded a view of the adjacent country half way down dungie paused at a little stream overshadowed by the glossy boughs and crimson flowers of the chestnut and discoursed while he let his horse drink yonder is the koorong crag said he pointing to a mountain which rose upon their right it had all the glory of inaccessibility its turret-like summit surmounted a deep precipice of bare rock which could be climbed by no man its base was clothed 
with bluish green foliage against which the light stems of a group of white gum trees in the foreground stood out in vivid contrast our black fellows say that the double devil lives up there continued dungie i've heard tell that a long time ago the rocks were covered with creepers and that one of the first white settlers in the district managed to climb to the top of the mountain by holding on to them he made a fire upon the highest point but a wind rose and the flame spread and burned all the creepers his bones lie bleaching up there now they rode on till they reached a gorge dividing two hills the pack-horse well accustomed to the narrow track worn along the steep slope trotted in front occasionally stopping to nibble the tender shoots of the young tie trees while barrington followed the postman who would every now and then turn his head with an evident distrust of english horsemanship upon their right sloped the rocky bank of the hill they were skirting cairns of grey volcanic-looking stones piled by nature's hand and overgrown with rank grass and creeping indigo necessitated frequent deviations charred logs the remains of bushfires lay across the path the thick underwood grew dense on each side flowering parasites hung from the branches overhead and binds of the crimson canidia trailed into the streamlet that flowed at the foot of the two hills in places the rivulet glided gently over flat stones worn smooth by its course here and there it tumbled in a miniature cascade over the trunk of a fallen tree and now lay in pools still and stagnant with iridescent gleams upon its surface beneath overhanging fronds of fern to the left of the riders the opposite hill rose almost perpendicularly high above their heads firs clung to the rocky soil and native jessamine and waxen hoya shed their fragrance in the air the sharp wit of the whipbird and the footfalls of the horses echoed through the gorge with startling distinctness the solitude was intense neither aboriginal nor beast was to be seen prowling about this mountain fastness only every now and then a rustling of dry leaves would attract attention and the sharp head of a wallaby might be observed protruding from behind some jagged rock and disappearing in an instant at length they emerged from the ravine and mounted to the highest point of the range which bounded the karong district below them the country stretched in smooth plains and undulating ridges and beyond lay a succession of mountains like distant rolling waves with here and there a more prominent peak catching the sun's reflection upon its stony sides and standing out in vivid contrast to the shadowy purple of the lower and further hills stop a moment said barrington pausing and involuntarily raising his hat beauty of nature or of art was a powerful agent in stirring his senses to a pitch of excitement hardly warranted by his self-contained exterior as a boy he had sometimes lain down and wept at the sudden sight of a fine landscape and his pulses had tingled with keen emotion while he stood before a beautiful statue or a lovely pictured face there is a poetic quasi intellectual passion which in some natures is hardly less potent than that aroused by wine or women dungie checked his horse and regarded his companion with reflective curiosity pretty ain't it said he with something of the pride of proprietorship there ain't any district in leichardt's land as beats the koorong for scenery mountains and such like to be sure the grass is not to be remarked for overfattening he added with a sigh but where there's big bones there ain't often sweet flesh old anthony ferris cool robin way he do go almost crack over them rocks i've heard him screeching out his bits of poetry till i thought him ripe for woo garu madhouse longleat is pretty smart about the men he employs but what made him take old ferris for his storekeeper beats the folks up here hollow yon is the dividing range between this colony and new south wales Corabin lays there indicating an extensive timbered tract that stretched eastward beneath the mountains we are close upon diraba 
now and that's my place again the creek it's a bit dull sometimes but the mail keeps me running i've only seen three females on my selection since i took it up four years last november one was the girl from barramunda as rode down with the stockman one sunday afternoon t'other was my lady she were a-lookin for the strawberry cow as got bogged in the creek and t'other here dungy paused and silently ruminated for several minutes and who was the third asked barrington twere miss mccutcheon replied dungy laconically now then get along you old stupid you've seen this air view often enough before presently the mailman halted at a round water-hole fringed with blady grass and overshadowed by the gnarled branches of a giant eucalyptus globulus here dungy dismounted stooped down and pushed aside the lily leaves which floated on the surface of the pool washed his face and hands and deliberately assumed a rusty black alpaca coat his appearance was so comical and his gravity so portentous that barrington laughingly asked him the reason of these preparations i knows my drawbacks said dungy i ain't much to look at but respect goes a long way butter don't come no quicker for fast churning with this pregnant remark dungy's garrulity suddenly abated and he scarcely uttered a word till they had reached a log hut built in a cleared bit of scrub and surrounded by a rude stockade within which grew some lank peach trees and straggling cabbage plants just outside the hut a young woman stood busily engaged over her wash-tub she was extremely tall and of rich colouring with high cheekbones and abundant dark hair miss mccutcheon for it was she looked up as the mailman approached wiped the soap suds from her hands and arms and nodded have ye got anything for me to-day mr dungy said she dungy leaving barrington outside the railings dismounted from his horse and presented her with a well-thumbed envelope my sentiments is in there said he with whining gravity there's a year's mail contract to run and then i'm a-goin to settle down on the selection miss mccutcheon took the letter reddened and thrust it into the pocket of her gown get along with you and your stupid valentine she cried you should buy a speaking parrot to make your soft speeches for you dress him up in your sunday coat and no one would know the difference i ain't the sort of woman to be running second to a mail contract you'd best be getting on your way or you'll be late at coolrobin to-night and she obstinately resumed the scrubbing of a pair of moleskins dungy meekly retreated remounted his pony and rode off by barrington's side for some time he maintained silence then remarked with a deep sigh she's a fine young woman to look at i've had my eye upon her for four year i'm pretty sure what she's made of but i ain't a-goin to give up my mail contract no not for her that's the odds atween us when they had ridden out of sight of the hut dungy came to another standstill took off his rusty coat re-strapped it in his valise and pursued his way more cheerfully the influence of miss mccutcheon's presence removed loquacity returned to him and he expatiated freely upon the beauties of the scenery and the population of the koorong district till the paddock fence of diraba came in sight a narrow creek wound round the rise upon which the house was built and to barrington's surprise was crossed by such a rustic bridge as might have spanned the ornamental water of a gentleman's park in england near the bridge sloping down to the water there was an artificial rockery the prim elegance of which contrasted strangely with the wildness of forest and desolation of mountains that characterized the scene instead of riding over the bridge the postman made a round to the crossing where the water reached to his stirrups he do set store on them bits of planks and tree stumps does lord dolph said dungy contemptuously the next flood in the coorong'll carry them all away for my part i like what's in nature better nor what's out of it and the little piebald is far too cute to trust her legs on that english falderall 
the araba lay at the foot of a rugged hill which overshadowed the house and was the joy of lord dolph's heart and the despair of that of his stock rider the dwelling-house a four-roomed hut was built of slabs and roofed with bark two sides were shaded by a veranda supported by rough saplings round which twined native clematis and scrub creepers the floor of the veranda was of mud a fernery was in course of construction against the walls and two fine plants of the staghorn variety flourished on each side of the doorway a crimson double geranium bloomed by a veranda post and verbenas flowered at the sills of the unglazed windows behind the house a dense smoke obscured the outbuildings that's my lady makin a spree amongst the rubbish remarked dungie and presently they came in sight of lady dolph herself who with her cotton gown tucked up over her linsey petticoat was busy picking up sticks which she threw upon the pile she was a comely little body with a round rosy face bright grey eyes light hair and eyebrows and a trim waist as soon as barrington appeared on the scene she exploded in a fit of giggling threw down her sticks and ran into the hut where she presently emerged with a fair-haired boyish-looking man who was smoking a short pipe and wore his shirt-sleeves tucked up over a pair of blue-veined arms that barrington had last seen uncovered on the river below eton they had roughened considerably since then and the good-looking aristocratic face was sunburnt and hairy nevertheless there was in the youth's whole appearance an unmistakable air of refinement quite out of keeping with his surroundings adolphus bassett the seventh son of an impoverished peer having shown small aptitude for the clerical profession for which he had been intended had upon his father's death emigrated to australia where he had employed his small patrimony in the purchase and stocking of diraba and had married maggie the daughter of one lamb a squatter on the coorong she made him an excellent wife managed the few score of cattle which daraba maintained rode as colonial women do ride displayed considerable culinary skill and was tenacious of her dignity claiming her title even when she was engaged in salting beef and such other unrefined occupations lord dolph shook hands heartily with barrington who had by this time dismounted hallo so you have turned up i am delighted to see you we didn't half expect you to-day most fellows get funked over the short cut but dungie is a capital pioneer you can't go wrong if you follow the little piebald she's a rare one isn't she tom i say this don't put you much in mind of headington eh barrington smiled lord dolph laughed and maggie giggled let me introduce you to my wife said dolph we were having a go at the rubbish heap come if this doesn't bang europe as maggie would say i'm blessed it's the tyrol with perpetual vegetation did you notice my bridge i modelled it after the one at headington you must come out presently and see the yards we are setting up pigs i shall make no end of money out of my porkers the selectors buy em we're thorough bush people here i go in for roughing it like one o'clock it's not half bad fun and there's excellent duck shooting down the creek come inside and we'll open the post bag i believe there's an english mail due lady dolph with one shoulder awkwardly raised above the other led the way into the sitting-room which was pretty enough though the walls were only canvassed and daylight might be seen between any two of the outer slabs which stood apart as though they had not been introduced to one another there was a curious application of english aestheticism to the rude arrangements and home-made furniture of the australian bush the wide fireplace was surmounted by an artistic erection of polished cedar crimson paper and blue china plates roughly carved brackets supported pots of doulton and valoris ware engravings after angelica kaufman and bartolozzi 
that might have been filched from the headington corridors and photographs of familiar english and foreign scenes lined the walls the canvas chairs were adorned with cruel work done by lord dolph's sisters an opossum rug lay before the hearth beneath the window stood a pine writing-table furnished with equipments of oxidized silver a grand piano filled up one side of the room and was littered with music lord dolph with boyish pride in a new toy ran his fingers over the keys and trolled forth in a fine tenor one of sullivan's songs is it not a beauty he cried there's not another instrument like it in leichardt's land headington sent it to me for a wedding present we had a rare piece of work getting it across the creeks maggie said she'd rather have had the money to spend on bulls but she likes it better now that i've taught her to sing duets with me she has as nice a voice as there is in the district except old ferris's daughters poor little girl why do you pity her asked barrington lord dolph touched his forehead significantly and went on playing it's in the family he added the old man is as mad as a hatter a snarling discontented creature longleat's storekeeper it's a mystery to me how he got the situation there's a wife for a settler he whispered enthusiastically directing barrington's glance towards maggie who was sorting out the letters that had just arrived hand them over old girl i wish you'd take out this note i've written to miss longleat and give it to dungie maggie departed lord dolph rose from the piano stretched himself and looked with a sort of sheepish inquiry at his guest i dare say you are thinking that she wouldn't suit marble halls dukes and duchesses and that sort of thing he said but bless you she'd go down splendidly if i were to take her home she is unaffectedly charming said barrington with more hardiness than he felt i congratulate you really now i'm glad you like her though i detest the notion that a man's wife like his horse must be subject to the criticism of his friends i suppose that you saw my people before you left england lord headington went down with me to southampton he was very kind but i saw none of the others he is a rare old sort is headington said lord dolph in a constrained tone didn't sir lionel see you off no lionel and i never pulled over well together he is a prig and my mother leads him by the nose his wife is a fool i think she would have taken my part if she dared i disliked her and she was sorry for me in my trouble my mother whom i worshipped was hard as a stone i say said lord dolph i heard about your mess i'm awfully sorry for it it's no use beating about the bush my mother keeps me pretty well up in what's going on i suppose said barrington looking at lord dolph without blenching that she told you how i had left the guards i heard there had been a row she wrote me some particulars women are never very clear in matters of detail your mother and mine are old friends they have thoroughly discussed my iniquities you have had your information direct from headquarters and i have no doubt that it is correct said barrington bitterly look here dolph the hardest cut i've ever had was my mother's conduct in that affair you know what she is how cold and yet how fascinating the head of the family is her god if i had been the eldest son i should have been immaculate i have always felt that she might have done with me what she chose i hated the idea of coming out here when she urged it when she seemed anxious to get rid of me i had no heart to resist now that i am here i don't know what i shall do do you think that i am the stuff to make a settler emphatically no said lord dolph you would have to take up new country drive cattle explore and that sort of thing you wouldn't stand it then there is a poor prospect before me i may trust you your family has always been staunch to me my brother allows me one hundred and fifty pounds a year otherwise i have nothing what can i do why cried lord dolph with his frank hearty laugh maggie and i settled that when we heard that you were coming you must marry honoria longleat and become the owner of the great tarangella tin mine End of chapter six chapter seven of policy and passion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org policy and passion by rosa campbell prade 
chapter seven an australian explorer some few days after the arrival of barrington at daraba mr dyson maddox and his superintendent cornelius cathcart were riding over the ranges from barramunda in the direction of coolrobin the two stations with daraba forming the point of a triangle between lay about fifteen miles apart a convenient distance to be pleaded as an excuse for remaining the night when alluring attractions offered themselves and not too far to be retraced late in the day when circumstances rendered return desirable of the two men the superintendent as requiring the shortest notice may be described first he was small and spare with a loosely built frame upon which his clothes hung as upon a peg a yellow face ornamented by a tiny flaxen imperial and narrow blue eyes he was always shabbily dressed at all times a restless imp seemed to possess his frame when he walked his body jerked convulsively when he rode his limbs twitched as though he were a victim to incipient st vitus's dance his tone was caustic and he affected cynicism he had been maddox's companion for several years first in certain exploring expeditions on the northern coast which the latter had conducted and afterwards as manager of barramunda maddox had upon one occasion saved cathcart's life in a flooded creek and this circumstance was sufficient warrant for the strong undemonstrative attachment that existed between two dissimilar natures of late however a slight constraint had arisen in their intercourse it was suspected by both though not admitted by either that this was due to miss longleat's influence yet in what way was difficult to define there could be no question of rivalry between the two men had there been cathcart would certainly have withdrawn in favour of his friend while he would as certainly have cloaked his generosity under an appearance of snarling contempt as it was circumstances forbade him to think of matrimony to aspire to the heiress of the tarangella mine would have been ridiculous presumption cathcart would not acknowledge to himself that honoria attracted him but that she constantly filled his mind was evident and that there was a latent bitterness in his thoughts of her was equally certain dyson maddox was broad-shouldered and thick-set with muscles like iron and a skin mellowed by exposure to the colour of untanned leather he had finely hewn features a determined mouth and brown level eyes there was brusque daring in his glance and much frank nobility in the sweep of his brow he had a trick of frowning when preoccupied which gave a morose expression to his face but when the frown dispersed there was sweetness in his look his hair curled in heavy locks and his moustache and whiskers were carelessly trimmed as though he were not accustomed to spend thought upon his toilette a typical australian of the second generation unconventional courageous and energetic lacking somewhat the graces of society but rich in an air of native distinction and in the chivalry which arises from intuitive good breeding he was far removed from the thin-skinned metaphysical breed and had none of that aesthetic sentimentalism which is a development of old-world civilization his passions were strong but balanced by logical power and by the discipline of a hard life he had a rare faculty for repressing emotion was deliberate in action and slow to receive new impressions though fairly cultivated he had not followed intellectual pursuits more closely than the exigencies of a purely australian career had demanded the master and the manager had been discoursing for some time upon bovine matters when maddox remarked apropos of an arrangement for selling fat cattle during the winter it is possible that i may not be much at 
baramunda after the opening of parliament i am thinking of taking a more active part in politics this session so i imagined of course you have been offered the post of minister for lands it seems the pet ambition nowadays to make one's self into a target for scurrilous attacks you take an unfortunate view of the question replied dyson why should political distinction be an unworthy aim here there must be interested motives underlying all party strife they come nearer the surface in a small community i have always wished to be in the cabinet but there are reasons which make me hesitate to accept the position i must however let the premier know my decision this evening but beforehand you must make yourself certain of your ground with miss longleat i understand this is the reason of your detour by coolrobin i hope she will be there and that you may catch her in a listening mood that is the worst of having to do with capricious persons there is no calculating their humours well if you are successful in your suit be good enough to apprise me as early as possible of the fact so that i may clear out of barramunda without delay you have always said that you would leave barramunda when i married why should you do so no one should interfere with you in the bachelor's quarters not even the bachelor's quarters would be sacred to mrs maddox answered cathcart shortly thank you but there is not room at barramunda for miss longleat and for me i shall take up country out west or go to fiji which seems the refuge for unfortunates just now i have sometimes fancied said dyson in a hesitating manner though he spoke with deliberate emphasis that you were attracted by miss longleat the thought has troubled me although i have no actual grounds for entertaining it i only guess at your feelings you know my wishes come hadn't we better have the matter out make your mind easy said cathcart i am too good a servant to poach on my master's preserves i may be a fool but i am not such a drivelling idiot as to suppose that miss longleat would think of me as a husband an admirer is another thing a chimney-sweep may be at liberty to worship a goddess i dare say that she is piqued because i have not thrown myself at her feet but i have some self-respect that girl puzzles me i cannot make up my mind whether i dislike or pity her most tell me your reasons for disliking her said maddox she is always posing for effect there is nothing genuine about her except her greediness for sensation she is an actress who believes in her parts she is cold-blooded and passionate together she is intolerably selfish she has everything to make her happy and she is morbidly discontented she despises her father who adores her she is not womanly then her frankness is extraordinary she is essentially a new world product no european young woman could combine so much boldness with an innocence which one is obliged to take for granted excuse me if i offend your susceptibilities you ask my opinion go on said maddox now why do you pity her she is absolutely solitary she has neither women friends nor relations as long as she cultivates fastidiousness there can be no sympathy between her and her father she has been badly brought up what result could one expect from a sydney boarding-school and i think that there is a certain nobility in her nature she will be either good or bad she is discontented with herself if she were wise she would marry you but i do not think she will just yet our roads separate here i am going to meet brown at jaff's peak camp you'll not come on to cool robin then no there are the weaners to be looked after and the long-tailed strawberry cow to be brought in and i am not unselfish enough to play bodkin cathcart turned his horse and with a curt good-bye galloped away through the trees till he had disappeared over the brow of the hill maddox rode on through the silent forest descending the range and skirting the creek where the tall cedars laden with the golden berries of autumn cast their shadows over the tracks 
dyson maddox's grandfather had come out to australia holding a crown appointment in new south wales the office under a responsible government had descended to the son who in his turn had died suddenly before dyson had attained his majority thus it will be seen that the lad was a true native of the soil he inherited from his father an easy competence and having neither brothers sisters nor near relations had no claims upon his purse but he was not content to plod on in conventional fashion he must needs carve his fortune in his own manner it was his ambition to become one of the pioneers of australian civilization he had made several more or less successful attempts to penetrate into the interior and a few years before the present date had equipped and commanded an exploring expedition which with a dauntless energy seldom equalled in the annals of australia had fought its way through the heart of leichardt's land to a point on the extreme northern coast hitherto only accessible by sea at the risk of starvation and of murder by the hostile tribes whose territories had never before been invaded by white men the little band with dyson maddox at its head pushed on towards the northern peninsula half way the horses perished from eating poisonous berries in a scrub provisions failed and sickness thinned the number nevertheless the brave men pursued their way on foot through forest and desert subject to night attacks and to daily peril of native ambuscades till they reached the remote seaboard township of gundaru a port commanding the northern waters and a touching place for mail steamers of sufficient importance to render the establishment of land communication with the southern districts a matter of concern to the leichardt's land government in the course of this expedition maddox's left arm had been disabled by the thrust of a black spear hurled during a midnight surprise of his camp he was almost a cripple when he reached gundaru a few months later he knew that he could no longer draw his trigger with certainty of effect or rely upon his physical strength to aid him in combating the dangers and difficulties which beset the path of an explorer thirst after unknown country had been the ruling motive of his life the miner who digs in the expectation of striking a priceless nugget knows no keener excitement than that which dyson experienced at the first glimpse of some broad river or fertile rolling plain never before gazed upon by any but barbarian eyes but which by his discovery might in future ages become the home of thousands of his race the abstract side of existence had few claims upon him yet he was not without enthusiasm of an inspiring practical kind and was strongly imbued with the notion that he who places fresh territory at the service of his country has a no less exalted mission than the scientific investigator the mechanical discoverer or the pathological inquirer now this wound inflicted by the ignominious weapon of an aboriginal had changed the whole current of his existence he could no longer lead the life of perilous adventure which had held for him so great a charm his health had been injured by exposure and privation and those anxious six months during which death had stared him in the face had visibly whitened his hair and perceptibly reduced his vigour he had left leichardt's town full of animal health and reckless bravery he reached gundaroo broken down subdued and prematurely aged his ambition checked in the very hour of fulfilment there was nothing for him but to return south and to embrace a tranquil bucolic career seasoned by the mild excitement of politics but when after his purchase of barramunda he paid his first visit to coolrobin and saw again honoria longleat whom he had known as a child now fresh from school and radiant in the first consciousness of power and the bloom of early womanhood he almost ceased to regret the life he had quitted a vague delicious dream which had sweetened his wanderings took defined shape and imparted a new zest to existence 
frank daring original with the touch of passionate sensibility that he himself lacked he felt that she was the one woman who could make his happiness but he was cautious and deliberate and did not snatch the prize when it was perhaps within his reach honoria had her ambitious dreams of a life of colour and excitement sometimes he seemed to her cold and commonplace sometimes unrefined she began to mix in the world and to taste the sweets of coquetry she accustomed herself to associate elegance of manners with an european education as a slave or an adoring mentor dyson pleased her well enough but she was almost convinced that he would not be a husband to her liking yet she was not happy when he absented himself from her society she paid deference to his opinion by turns she piqued and enthralled him offended if he refused to dance attendance in her train despising him for patient endurance of her whims so matters stood but honoria was not aware that he had given her a certain length of tether and had determined to suffer these alternations of hope and despair no longer after an hour's riding maddox crossed the river for the last time and entered an extensive plain commonly called the race-course that lay between the creek and the hill upon which cool robin was built now he passed through the slip-rails and was admitted into the home paddock behind him rose the mountains sloping in a series of wooded ranges to the plain herds of cattle and horses browsed upon the rich pasture which was dotted with clumps of trees and bordered by a fringe of green that marked the course of the river the head station of coolrobin consisted of a cluster of cottages built upon the hump of a low hill that overlooked the race-course three of these buildings were placed in a garden enclosed by a high fence of which one portion was overgrown with passion-fruit while the remainder supported a hedge of cactus round each was a wide veranda partly trellised with vines and festooned by bougainvillea snowy stephanatus and the orange bell-shaped flowers of the begonia the two smaller cottages in one of which dwelt mr ferris and his family while the other was the kitchen of the establishment were connected by covered passages with the larger house occupied by mr longleat and his two daughters outside the enclosure stood the bachelor's quarters set apart for the accommodation of passing strangers and for the use of gentlemen stockmen and new chums of which upon a large australian station there are often several the garden sloped in vine-covered walks towards the plain at its foot lay a small silvery lagoon with lilies white and delicate mauve floating upon its surface beyond in the distance rose the amphitheatre of hills some purple and shadowy some grey and barren prominent among them the coorong crag to which barrington's attention had been directed during his ride to dairaba the stockyards and outhouses were situated at some little distance from the cluster of cottages an avenue of bunyas still in their youth led from the stables to the back entrance to the garden maddox rode straight hither dismounted and called hi cobra ball a black boy grinning from ear to ear woolly-haired and red-lipped approached at the summons and took maddox's horse bail massa want em yarraman again to-day he asked in the curious vernacular common to half civilized natives yes replied dyson this fellow go along a kuya to-night keep him in the yard you e said cobra ball missy honoria along a humpy missa longly bail ekuabin that fellow gone along a likert's town you got em grog he added with an insinuating gesture as in taking off the saddle a flask dropped from maddox's pouch to the ground look and see said the squatter dryly cobra ball eagerly snatched the flask uncorked it poured a drop of its contents upon his hand which he smelled excitedly then uttered an exclamation of disgust bail budgery white man gammon poor fellow like it that he said piteously and restored the flask to its former receptacle 
maddox walked down between the bunya trees and opening a wicket-gate which led into the garden quietly entered the enclosure an air of inaction hung over the place the two long verandas facing each other were tenantless save for the bright lizards that darted every now and then across the rough boards and a large hound lying under the shade of an orange-tree lifted his head and yapped peevishly but was too lazy to bark or stir as maddox let the gate swing back upon its well-oiled hinges a child of six darted out from beneath the passion-fruit vines which covered the fence and from which the purple eggs temptingly hung her face and hands were stained with yellow juice which she vainly tried to wipe off upon her pinafore she was a queer elf-like little creature with a yellow old-fashioned face large black eyes and dark brown hair that hung in a drake's tail wave upon her skinny shoulders oh mr maddox mr maddox she cried in her thin voice it is hot i've been looking for a big green frog to put down my back and keep me cool do you think that you could find me one you little story-teller janey said maddox good-humouredly is any one at home mr maddox we had the very last melon to-day and mrs ferris is making a tart for dinner and euphrosyne has got kittens affirmed janey she'll have to be called euphrosyne now continued the child with reflective wisdom for the kittens is the new phrosyne's and father has gone down to fight mr middleton is your sister indoors inquired dyson little mother is in the front parlour or out on the verandah said janey mr dyson she ended vehemently i wasn't eating passion fruit janey janey called a woman's voice from the house i'm coming aunt pen cried janey and darted off in the opposite direction a middle-aged lady in a spotless apron and a cap adorned with many ribbons was rolling out pastry at the open window of the kitchen she was a comely body with flaxen hair and round blue eyes bright complexioned and well favoured with an air of wishing well to all the world and a little flutter irresistibly suggestive of a thickly feathered brahma hen characterising her movements dear heart exclaimed she why it is mr maddox she gave him a rapid nod and continued the manipulation of her pastry you'll stop for luncheon it'll be a scrappy sort of meal but whatever it is i can't give ye any better for they are waitin for that old man of mine to come back and see about killing a fresh bullock you haven't seen anything of him i suppose no mrs ferris i have come from barramunda i hope he hasn't got laid up at braziers with the nasty grog they make him drink brandy and art together are just the ruin of him while mrs ferris turned for a moment to admonish the maid-servant who was assisting her dyson made his way past the window stepped on to the back veranda of the big house as it was called and tapped at the open door his knock remained unanswered ceremony is scant in the australian bush dyson entered the sitting-room which was evidently deserted and paused looking about for traces of its owner the apartment was large and cool-looking sealed and lined with cedar the darkness of which was relieved by white muslin curtains and the many prints and photographs which covered the walls the floor was matted an open piano stood in one of the corners bookcases filled the recesses flowers bloomed everywhere bowls of roses scented the air and the wide fireplace was hidden by ferns newspapers and magazines littered the small tables the room occupied the width of the building and upon the opposite side the open french windows festooned by creepers framed lovely views of the plain and mountains who is there come in said a voice from without maddox crossed the room and was enchained for a moment by the charming picture which presented itself a very beautiful young woman reclined in a hammock slung at the coolest and shadiest end of the veranda behind her was a trellis of vines upon which a few late bunches still hung a trailing withe of orange begonia touched her shoulder her head was bent and the light shining through the leaves upon her hair imparted to it a warm chestnut tint 
she was dressed in light blue muslin befitting the summer's day and beneath its transparent folds the round lines and delicate indentations of her shoulders and bust might be traced one hand supported her cheek the sleeve had fallen back from her arm and its shapely curves were half exposed she was rather a venus than a diana there was a suspicion of voluptuousness in her attitude as with her feet lightly touching the ground she swayed herself softly to and fro in her hammock a book was in her lap on the ground beside her a basket of guavas it was the incarnation of summer luxuriance and dreamy idleness she looked up with a pair of brown eyes at once farouche and enticing he saw a clear tinted oval with a low forehead a nose that would have been grecian but for the faintest turn at its point which gave piquancy to a face that might otherwise have appeared too severely classical flexible lips moist and full slightly disdainful when in repose purely bewitching when they smiled and an expression half expectant half weary a soft evanescent flush overspread her face as she greeted her visitor with a little nod and a smile that must have assured him that he was welcome i have thought that we should see you to-day i hope that you are going to stay the night i have been bored to death this week i don't find my own company particularly agreeable at any time and it becomes quite unsupportable when it is the only alternative to the ferris's society i thought that mrs ferris looked especially radiant just now she is always smiling good soul i dislike people who take an invariably cheerful view of life they exasperate me have you been to leichardt's town lately i am on my way there now i have only put up my horse for an hour or two and must start again directly after luncheon oh tell cobra ball to turn your horse out unless there is any special attraction in that case i should be annoyed for i am very jealous i don't often stoop to entreaty but you see that i am at my lowest ebb do stay i wish i could but the fact is that i have an important engagement with your father this evening and should not have come here but that i wish particularly to see you you have heard of poor carrie's sudden death yes papa hurried to town at once but how can one keep posted in political news with a mail only once a week who will be the new minister mr longleat has offered me the appointment i guessed that you were the coming man though he was terribly close on the subject surely you don't hesitate of course you will accept she looked at him with bright penetrating eyes though she hardly abated the slow movement of the hammock in which she had again seated herself he leaned against the veranda post and deliberately regarded her i think so he replied slowly on the whole i feel it best that i should yet there are considerations that make me uncertain what to do what would you advise oh how can you ask acceptance of course i have imagined myself into a state of frantic excitement over the railway question i can imagine myself into most moods there is no imagination however in my wish to see my friends distinguished and occupying as high places as it is possible for them to reach i suppose there is a certain glory in being a cabinet minister even in leichardt's land but tell me your views and the reason of your hesitation i am not a man of wide political influence and on considering the matter have thought that it might be more advantageous for our party if a less decided member of the squatting faction were chosen it is a reproach against longleat's ministry that it is composed almost entirely of squatters every means ought to be taken to strengthen it it is weaker than you suppose you are a prophet of evil said honoria tell me how i can serve the cause i will do anything short of marrying mr middleton that is likely to promote our interests but i think that you underrate your popularity you are a great explorer you have made a name surely you may consider yourself a pillar of the state dyson smiled sadly 
i don't like you to speak in that way he said gravely it makes me fancy that you are laughing at me i have done nothing out of the common i believe that i could have made discoveries if my health had not failed me and you touch upon a sore point when you allude to that gundaroo expedition the passion for exploring is still strong upon me i sometimes think that i could face death to gratify it but it is silly work experimentalizing upon one's self i want now to become a political great gun it seems a petty ambition i know that you despise it how do you know that interrupted honoria you would interest me immensely if you would set yourself to analyse my character and tell me how far i am real and how far sham i wish that i knew said dyson earnestly you are a very difficult person to understand not to any one who interested me sufficiently to make me forget myself said honoria with a soft deliberateness which gave peculiar force to her words dyson was about to speak and glanced uneasily around but janey's voice was heard outside in rapid protesting colloquy with mrs ferris honoria went to the back veranda and said an admonitory word to the child when she returned dyson was perfectly cool i don't think anything of your objection she said if it is so purely disinterested as that i begin to look upon mr carey's death as quite providential though you accuse me of a mock enthusiasm i care sufficiently for the party to feel the importance of its being thoroughly cemented better a squatter than a half-hearted townsman i am not above owning to personal motives for my advice i have a selfish reason for wishing you to become minister for lands you will be obliged to spend the winter in leichardt's town i want you to belong to my world to live my life i missed you terribly in sydney last year are you really in earnest exclaimed dyson i know that you are fond of pleasure that you like new friends i sometimes think that admiration is the breath of your life you must have had your fill in sydney i could not hope that you had given me a thought yes i dare say that i thought of you every day i am certain that i did so whenever i was particularly naughty you have a way of showing your disapproval which amuses me your displeasure adds zest to wrong-doing and gratifies your sense of power said dyson with bitterness i am sure that is what you mean perhaps said honoria provokingly then added and perhaps i cared too a little whether you were satisfied or angry with me are you tired of cruel Robin yet asked maddox abruptly i liked it at first but now the monotony stifles me i ring the changes upon the various employments available lounging in the veranda and garden eating fruit riding walking sleeping and reading novels till i am bored with all the novels only make the dullness more unendurable for they describe life to me as i have no chance of knowing it you mean the life beyond australia yes this is only a state of half existence books are so unsatisfying i read them greedily at first then throw them aside in disgust they never take one below the surface there must be some deep experience even here human beings are the same all the world over only their surroundings influence them what we know well seems commonplace i would gladly exchange those mountains yonder for a tame english meadow at least i should be the richer for a new sensation it's the same with the people i meet their conversation their ideas are humdrum i am weary of everything i see and hear little mother interrupted janey running on to the veranda and standing on tiptoe her hands clasped in excitement cobra ball says that it is so cool and nice under the big apple tree on the ridge and i want some moss to stuff my doll's bed oh do come and mr dyson can pull me some off the branches mr dyson you've got nothing to do come and help me janey said honoria severely you have been disobeying me i forbade you to play with cobra ball what me cried janey striking a dramatic attitude i didn't mean to be naughty and make your heart ache little mother what me and drive the devil out of me and then we'll gather moss honoria took the child in her arms and gazed fondly at the little dark face on a level with her own handsome head the womanly softness of her nature seemed to have concentrated itself in her attachment for janey 
if her feelings could have been analysed a strain of remorse might have been found mingled with her tenderness she had vigorously hated the child's mother during the short lifetime of the latter but at her death one of those floods of reaction to which her nature was liable swept away her rancour and turned the tide of her impulses there was within her too strong an instinct of justice to allow her to revenge her fancied wrongs upon an innocent baby janey's helplessness had appealed to the latent mother element in her bosom and as the child grew older it was observed that she was the only being to whom honoria was demonstrative of affection i will not whop you she said that would make my heart ache worse come then we will go to the apple tree mr maddox i really think that it is cooler out of doors than within will you walk with us to the ridge the opportunity for which maddox had inwardly longed presented itself and he eagerly accepted miss longleat's invitation End of chapter seven chapter eight of policy and passion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org policy and passion by rosa campbell prayed chapter eight the enchantress of kooralbyn honoria put on a straw hat which was lying on the veranda and leading janey by the hand passed beneath the vine trellis and through a wicket gate on to the hill which rose to a peak above the house and sloped in wave-like mounds downwards to the plain here in the shadow of the ridge it was always green and usually cool honoria and dyson strolled side by side to a little knoll over which a giant apple tree extended its long branches hoary with the greyish-green moss coveted by janey's childish heart it's like black solomon's beard cried the child clutching at a pendant bough honoria seated herself upon the bank while dyson filled janey's pinafore with moss and sent her to the gully to gather fringed violets before the blossoms closed at midday but what for mr dyson cried janey insistently what for do the flowers shut up when it is time for my dinner ask angela said dyson she knows all about the flowers now run away and do not come back till we call you there was a crisp determination in his manner which made the child look at him wonderingly but she departed and he was alone with honoria though he seemed outwardly calm his pulses were throbbing fast she had all the sweet unconsciousness of a coquette the little episode with janey had filled dyson's heart with fresh longing a woman incapable of love he thought could not have smiled so tenderly upon the child the softened expression still lingered on her face as she idly plucked the violets which grew among the grass beside her and heaped them on her lap presently she threw off her hat and leaning her head against the rough bark of the tree looked up through a screen of leaves to the blue sky above this satisfies me she said as though brokenly taking up the thought which had been in her mind during her previous conversation with dyson this contents me for a time i have no poetic sympathy with nature the flowers have no voice for me as they have for angela i prefer intercourse with humanity but there is a warm delight in such a day as this in the humming of insects above and around me in the flutter of the leaves as the breeze stirs the branches in the feeling that every blade of grass is growing and the smallest ant enjoying existence that seems to still my unsatisfied longing for something different i often come here with janey when i am out of spirits and i forget for a little while that i myself want to grow and live dyson knew not how to reply 
he had fancied for a moment that her thoughts were travelling with his own and now he found them far upon another road the air-like barrier which always seemed to divide them had never been more keenly felt by him she looked down and caught his wistful glance meeting it with her frank smile at once seductive and chilling he longed to know how much of her unconsciousness was genuine but in some of her moods he found her quite incomprehensible he could not penetrate the dramatic instinct which in her temperament carried emotion to the pitch demanded by the part she was playing but never hurried her beyond it you said just now he exclaimed that you wished me to stay in leichardt's town this winter to be near you to live your life i know you too well to read your speeches literally but i should like to find out how much you do care for my society i have an idea that you are not quite as false to me as you have been to some other men and that when you say gracious things to me you do sometimes when you are in the vein there is a grain of meaning in them honoria nodded that is quite true i look upon you as my best friend though i know quite well that there are many points in which i don't please you perhaps if you liked me better you would not see my faults i should see no faults in you said maddox if you had the crowning virtue of womanly sensibility what she cried you think me strong-minded you are very much mistaken in your idea of my character i have no force of will whatever i think that you are cruel said maddox it gives you pleasure to see your fellow-creatures suffer in other words i am a coquette it would be more to the purpose if you said that men were fools the last time that i was here said dyson you were doing your best to make a fool of an unfortunate young man whom i sincerely pitied may i ask how long it has been your habit to take midnight strolls with your admirers oh that has been rankling in your mind and now you have come to scold me were you concerned upon my account or upon that of the unfortunate young man well there will not be another opportunity for compromising mr bing that tete-a-tete by the lagoon finished his business he is going to england in april unless indeed he commits suicide before the ship sails come she added you must not blame me if i prefer being amused out of doors to being stifled within in an atmosphere of prosiness and vulgarity is it my fault that angela poor child does not interest me that mr ferris's rhapsodies irritate me and that aunt pen's twaddle bores me can i help it if my father's habits and manners jar upon me i am odious for saying this but it is true my nature is pitched in a different key to his it may be higher or lower i often think that it is lower i hope that you are not shocked at my frankness but surely we know each other too well to play at propriety i wish that you would always be frank with me let me know you as you really are that is all i want i can see that your temperament is at war with your companions and surroundings you are fitted for a higher life and your nature is so impressionable externals affect you deeply that is your misfortune but i am grieved to hear that there is a want of sympathy between you and your father you are the motive of his existence is that so said honoria softly poor papa i don't deserve to be so much cared for yet she added thoughtfully if his affection is anything more than pride in my appearance and a general satisfaction in me as a possession which contributes to his sense of importance he does not let me see it i suppose that we are neither of us demonstrative of our feelings he is very kind to me it pleases him to see me well dressed courted and admired he gives me plenty of money he is indulgent of my fancies but there it ends i am only a part of his success not of his inner life 
he has educated me above his level we have nothing in common i cannot tell him what is passing through my mind nor does he speak to me unreservedly about himself it is as though we had each something to hide i have been alone ever since my childhood but what is the use of troubling about me you cannot make me either better or worse go on talking about yourself i want to feel certain that you will be minister for lands honoria said dyson while a sudden flame darted from his eyes what should i care whether you were good or bad so long as i could make you love me it has been in my mind to speak for a long time but i wanted to be more sure of you and so i waited and watched till i am ashamed of myself for hanging upon you like a dog and now i have determined to do so no longer suspense is unendurable the real reason why i am doubtful about accepting the appointment in the ministry is because if i do so i must be brought closer to you i should be on a continual rack i could not escape from the sight or thought of you if you cannot love me it will be best that i should hide myself in the bush or go out west and try exploring again that would be weak said honoria quietly i had imagined you different i thought that you were strong a red flush passed over dyson's face and he did not reply for a moment very well he said at least you shall not say that i am weak i was right you are a cruel woman honoria bent a little towards him looked at him swiftly then drew back against the tree i don't want to seem cruel she said but i must think it is not possible that you can be taken by surprise said dyson i have been for two years at your beck and call you must have seen into my heart during that time sometimes you have been more than kind sometimes indifferent i have never felt sure of you for a day indeed i have often doubted whether you could love strange to say it is your very egotism which leads me to hope i know that i have little enough to offer an ambitious woman like you but i think that i understand you well enough to make you happy if i married you said she quickly as she spoke breaking into pieces of different lengths a twig that she had picked up from the ground i should live just the same kind of life if anything it would be tamer and i should have no new sensations good heavens exclaimed dyson what do you mean i dare say that you'll think me a bold sort of girl continued honoria looking at him levelly with her large eyes i don't know whether i am or not but why should i not say what is in my mind you doubt whether i have any capacity for loving perhaps not but there is a kind of feeling that i should like to know if it be possible i have dreamed of it i am sure that it exists if i married you i should go on dreaming of it but i should never know it and yet if it wasn't for that i think i might be happy with you it would be a placid monotonous existence but it ought to satisfy a woman i am not easily contented i am always wanting more more than i have got i have thought of it a great deal of course i knew what you wished i have sometimes fancied that it might be now i am certain that it never can be there is no use in talking of it stay urged dyson you say that you have thought of it a great deal but perhaps always from your present point of view you have not considered that when a woman marries all her interests her thoughts and feelings must change she becomes quite a different person it is the quiet inward joy that makes her life complete no no cried honoria mine would be utterly incomplete i need passion excitement i have tried to look at the matter from another point of view i have observed the married people i have met they think themselves happy their lives would suffocate me i should hate my husband in the same way that i detest men when they make themselves ridiculous by falling in love with me or if i did not hate him i should merely tolerate him which would be worse 
there must be passions that are real or they would not be written of in books and acted on the stage not that i believe in sentiment to be sentimental is as bad as being humdrum but i like the quick stirring of my pulses the quiver which goes through my body when there is a crisis of emotion what is the use of living unless one can gauge one's capacity for sensation dyson was silent for several moments then he said very quietly what you tell me decides my fate i should be a mean-spirited creature if i tormented you any longer our lives must lie apart i must scrunch out the thought of you and school myself to indifference i would not marry you as you are you would always be hankering after what with me you could never have and we should both be wretched you are right you will never love me i give up striving to gain what is hopeless his tone raised in her mind an uneasy suspicion of his desertion his constrained utterance was the mask to deep agitation but this she hardly realized he had been her slave she could not bear to release him as she regarded him with the critical eyes of a possible wife she asked herself whether it were indeed well that she should let him go there was in his appearance and manner just those traces of hard living and rude service that slight roughness of feature and lack of delicate refinement in language and bearing that jarred upon her sensibilities and made her less awake to the energy and reliability of his character and the manliness and frank nobility of his expression but for that troublesome fastidiousness which demanded an aristocratic brow smooth hands and european address she might have acknowledged him as a lover of whom she might justly feel proud honoria was neither more nor less than a woman she bent forward intercepting his glance till he was forced to meet her smile and said coquettishly you give me up very readily i thought that you prided yourself upon your tenacity of purpose how little you know me he exclaimed bitterly a definite aim i would follow for years but there is something unmanly in the pursuit of a shadow your love is no more to me than that it is better that i should face the truth after realizing that you were capable of passion i could not be content with the pale attachment that i know is all you can give me to me cold kisses and lukewarm sympathy would be more insupportable than open dislike but you think i do not suffer you know nothing of the stabbing pain that has struck my heart when on a sudden as though by a flash of light i have seen your indifference but i comforted myself with the thought that i fared no better and no worse than any other man in my place now i feel that i must tear you from me even though i bleed in doing so disappointment has always been my portion and what does it matter if i die as solitary as i've lived there are other objects in the world for a man besides loving and marrying do you remember a little photograph of yourself that you gave me before i went out on that miserable gundaroo expedition i have worn it in a locket hung on my watch-chain ever since once it turned the point of a black spear that will show you how even as a child i cared for you i hardly knew how much i loved you till i was stricken down with fever in the bush i thought that i was at my last gasp god it was lonely you know what it must be to die of fever and thirst out there we had been for two days without water and the men were all out searching in my delirium i saw you standing beside me with your sweet face bent over mine and your long brown hair floating over your shoulders it was like the vision of an angel i could not die while you looked at me you stayed beside me till the men came back they had found a water-hole and as i revived with the drops they poured down my throat you vanished 
after that i constantly thought of you and though i'm not a man to believe in supernatural influences i've always looked upon that fancy of my sickness as a sort of omen that some day your life would be a part of mine it's not to be so and i'll make a fool of myself no longer shall i look for janie stay a moment said honoria janie is down by the gully happy with her flowers mr maddox she added her manner changing from coquetry to tenderness with one of those capricious alternations which were peculiar to it i'm sorry that i grieved you if you understood me better you would know what i feel it would be like giving up one's chances in a lottery when one was certain of holding the winning number like one's heart stopping suddenly when it had been beating violently with expectation if you would let us go on as we were before for a time i-i can't bind myself now i want to see more of the world of other people no said dyson we cannot go back i meant that our talk to-day should put us on a different footing towards each other i have said my say you have spoken what was in your mind if your heart ever changes i shall see it soon enough but as far as the future goes i shall put from me all hope of making you my wife if you want a friend i'll be one to you but i will try not to be your lover and i'll keep away from you as much as possible honoria jumped up from the grass her cheeks aflame but at this moment nearer loving him than she had ever been in her life but as she watched him move away she felt as though she almost hated him he had placed her in a false position he had made her feel humiliated and resentful she turned her back upon him and walked hurriedly across the grass calling janie in sharper tones than were her wont the child ran to her sister her pinafore and her tiny hands filled with wild flowers and when she saw dyson departing cried loudly to him to return but he walked determinedly on towards the stable and bade cobra ball fetch out his horse End of chapter eight chapter nine of policy and passion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org policy and passion by rosa campbell prayed chapter nine the ferris menage miss longleat lingered on the plain with janie till there was no probability of again encountering mr maddox when a little after one she returned to the house the ferris family were all assembled in the dining-room waiting her re-entrance in order to begin luncheon the old man had arrived from kooya a short time before he sat a little apart with his hands clasping those of his daughter who was kneeling on a low stool at his feet while mrs ferris bustling about the table asked discursive questions touching his trip to town angela was slender and fair with the appearance of frail health which is denoted by great delicacy of limb waxen complexion and violet stains beneath the eyes she was barely seventeen and looked still younger her features were of the purity of a cameo her forehead low and her eyebrows full and extremely arched her mouth pale rather than red was of almost infantine softness the lower lip drooping in a manner which suggested weakness of character her grey eyes lovely in colour and shape had a blank abstracted gaze and were at once dreamy and shallow i am sorry to have kept you waiting said honoria returning with excessive coldness mr ferris's greeting after all aunt pen there was no need for you to trouble yourself you might have had luncheon in your own cottage mr maddox has gone on to leichardt's town 
it was tacitly understood that when mr ferris was at home the two families should dine apart in company only when miss longleat entertained male visitors during her father's absence and upon such occasions the premier had stipulated that mrs ferris should preside as chaperone to his daughter you see whispered mr ferris to his wife with an air of irritated complaint as honoria laid aside her hat in an inner chamber she does not want me here she did not notice me she treats me as if i were the dirt she never shook hands with me you old fool said mrs ferris who had a brusque cheerful method of disposing of her lord's grievances when polished silver's the fashion who cares for old gold a girl that has just parted with her sweetheart hasn't got eyes for old folk well go on about this mr barrington i'll believe in your opinion anthony for in spite of your blather about art ye don't want for wits the man is no ordinary new chum that's certain who are you talking about asked honoria my old man has picked up a kindred spirit in kooya an englishman on his way to lord dolph's and as i say no common new chum if his story about the guards is true things go by contraries out here it was only the other day we sent a lord's son to the huts butchers and baronets lords and loafers it's all one i'll just say two and two make four to balance my mind you've got a new book angel said honoria pointing to a freshly bound volume in the girl's lap do you like it it is a translation from the german i have not read it yet replied angela coldly there's a little fib said mrs ferris in a tone of good-humoured contradiction that grated upon angela's nerves why it's only a minute ago that i came in and heard you telling your father about the mermaids and water spirits and such like nonsense that the book is filled with fie you are too big a girl to heed such fairy tales now angela said janey pricking up her ears at the mention of fairy tales you said that you'd tell me about the spirits which float under the lilies on the lagoon nobody sees them but you and you promised to put them in a picture so that i can understand come said mrs ferris and let us feed our bodies as well as our souls there was no need to worry about my scrappy lunch i never thought honoria but that you'd have persuaded mr maddox to stay why was he so anxious to be off he had business in leichardt's town replied honoria briefly i am told that he is to be the new minister for lands said mr ferris honoria was silent for a few moments presently she asked a question about the political prospects they say that the ministry cannot last said mr ferris the heavy floods inland will prevent many of the western members from reaching leichardt's town in time for the opening and the numbers are so even that if the opposition brings forward a motion of want of confidence it is an absolute certainty that the government will go out you speak as though you wished my father to be beaten said honoria with temper i'm not a party man answered mr ferris the convictions of most people lie in their pockets and i'm not above the weaknesses of humanity i had a fancy for being in town this winter and your father could easily have put me into a government sinecure but he was too honest for that ha ha mr ferris uttered his disagreeable chuckle and it's of small consequence to me whether he or middleton is in power as for me remarked mrs ferris meditatively i must pin my political faith on something and though i dare say it's very likely that the premier is mistaken i'd rather take him for my block than fashion my opinions at haphazard honoria ate her luncheon in irritated silence and seized the first opportunity which presented itself of quitting the table 
she was in a mood in which small annoyances jarred upon her and she wished to take a quiet retrospect of the scene she had enacted with maddox just as a lover of the drama will re-read in solitude with keen delight a play the performance of which has deeply interested him mr ferris's mode of lapping his cream which indeed resembled that of her father interfered with the flow of her thoughts she reflected that it would add considerably to her happiness if the premier would for once depart from his political creed and by rewarding mr ferris's services with a government post remove him from kooralbyn but he would be equally odious in leichardt's town the old man's obnoxious presence was one of her minor sores and she in common with other inhabitants of the district was at a loss to explain the link that connected thomas longleat with his storekeeper it was still more inexplicable from the undercurrent of jealousy which the utterance of some biting allusion or cynical remark on the part of mr ferris continually betrayed honoria had been at school in sydney when ten years before this date anthony ferris with his wife and child had arrived in leichardt's land poor and apparently friendless he had made his way to kooralbyn and after an interview with mr longleat was immediately appointed storekeeper at four times the rate of salary enjoyed by his predecessor the act had always been quoted as illustrative of longleat's disinterested generosity but sammy deans a certain free selector upon cool robin who cultivated byron and shakespeare and had established a vinous intimacy with mr ferris always shook his head mysteriously and declared that he knew better honoria had never coincided with the popular view of mr longleat's adoption of anthony ferris she was of opinion that her father's bountiful impulses ought at least to be subservient to her antipathies she disliked mr ferris rather for the reason adduced against dr fell than from any assignable cause the veiled animosity to which longleat pompous self-engrossed and in a manner liberal-minded was blind had been quickly made patent to her keener perceptions she saw that he disliked her father and more particularly herself and resented as a personal grievance that in spite of her frequently expressed aversion mr ferris's society was thrust upon her in a way at which she was unable to take open umbrage in truth he was not an agreeable old man he was variable as the winds sometimes morose and taciturn at others garrulous and self-complacent but always displaying that morbid vanity which is the peculiar attribute of unappreciated artists whose ideal aspirations transcend the critical capacity of their age mr ferris justified his failure by the self-gratulatory reflection that genius which misses the aim of circumstance like steam that exhausts its energy upon the air is no less the potential regenerator of the universe he had painted pictures which no connoisseur would purchase and which had never cleared the portals of a high-class exhibition he had written poems combining fervid metaphor and stilted inanity doomed to be numbered amongst the myriads of rejected addresses which represent the waste of so much nervous energy and the expenditure of so great an amount of vicarious emotion at the age of forty-five he had collapsed in a fit of despair had thrown away his brushes and forsworn the exercise of his imagination and had sunk into the apathy of disappointment as thomas longleat's storekeeper he was embittered to the core and often when he was alone would weep puerile tears over the miscarriage of his favourite ambition nevertheless ease was grateful to him he had endured a hand-to-hand -hand fight with starvation and for the first few years of his life in australia blessed the means by which he had acquired freedom from actual privation
but as time went on jealousy gathered like a slow volcano in his breast and comparison of his own position with that of his patron was a ready goad to animosity good mrs ferris in comprehending soul knew nothing of the inward demon which devoured her lord or if she guessed at its existence laid it to the charge of her own shortcomings in not having presented him with the son for which she knew he longed my dear she would say to honoria in one of her confidential moments for her young charge aunt pen as she was called professed an unbounded love and admiration mr ferris always had an extraordinary notion that his son and mine would set the world on fire i don't know i'm sure what put it into his head for i never laid claim to any remarkable ideas my family were always steady respectable folk but the old fool would keep drilling into me that it was the combination which produced geniuses till i fairly flew round in his face and said bother your combinations and your geniuses if ever i have a son which doesn't seem likely i hope he may be a dolt it was flying in the face of providence my love for the almighty is not agreeable to having his works cut out for him like the pattern of a gown never a son have i had and mr ferris has been fain to content himself with a weakly slip of a girl who has no notion of anything except her painting and her mooning ways upon angela mr ferris's hopes were centred she was the apple of his eye the joy of his life he had brought her up in accordance with his own theories of artistic education and the result had been a strange mixture of ignorance and premature knowledge he had brought all external conditions to bear upon the development of her peculiar temperament had as he expressed it cradled her in the lap of inspiration had allowed her to run riot with nature and had from her childhood encouraged the free play of her vague poetic fancies he would not permit his wife to teach her needlework or any ordinary feminine accomplishment nor would he suffer her to be fettered by the conventional rules which from the hour of her birth govern a woman's existence no restriction was placed upon her childish love of reading and she was at liberty to roam as she would through the fields of strange fact and flowery fancy thus the child's mind was a storehouse of fairy legends and half understood classical myths from her youth she had been taught to regard her pencil as the interpreter of her inmost yearnings and the vent for her exuberant imagination she was solitary in her habits and fond of wandering alone in the bush but so greatly had her gentle ways endeared her to all with whom she came in contact that even the most savage of the blacks who frequented the mountains would not have dreamed of harming or frightening her End of chapter nine chapter ten of policy and passion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org policy and passion by rosa campbell prayed chapter ten hercules and omphile late in the afternoon of that day upon which dyson maddox had visited cool robin mr longleat found himself crossing the leichardt in the ferry-boat that plied between the north side and emu point as he had sat in the club after his office work was over mr valancy had entered and had started a game of whist at five shilling points the man was flushed and unsteady he had called for brandy and soda-water had drunk freely and had brought into the room an atmosphere of bickering and braggadocio peculiarly obnoxious to the premier he had made several gibing political allusions and had so far succeeded in ruffling mr longleat's temper that the latter had left the club he walked towards the ferry and took his seat in the boat before he had quite decided whether he would call on mrs valancy or not inclination carried the day before he had reached the opposite side his impulse had settled into resolve 
it was not mr longleat's custom to make afternoon calls and mrs valancy's neighbours were considerably surprised to see the huge white-clad figure enter the wicket-gate and tap gently at the half-closed venetian shutters of the drawing-room the premier always wore white linen in summer spotless as though it had just left the hands of the laundress he usually carried himself erect with a visible swelling of his chest and elevation of his head as though he had indeed the state secrets of an important colony in his keeping there was just a spice of ostentation in his bearing of self-assertion in his walk to-day his appearance was less pompous he stepped more quickly he looked a trifle sheepish without having actually analysed the nature of his attraction towards mrs valancy he had honestly struggled against the infatuation that since the coach journey had been gradually intensifying and felt himself guilty of a moral lapse in voluntarily placing himself under its influence in the same manner that the drunkard supremely conscious of sober intent resists for a time the fatal glass and at last yields trusting to the shreds of self-control left him to bind him against committal mrs valancy sitting alone in her drawing-room observed the premier's approach and herself admitted him as soon as he saw her face longleat felt certain that she had been weeping to-day she was clad in white and wore a yellow rose in the front of her dress her voice was subdued and melancholy she took mr longleat's rough hand with her soft ringed fingers and led him to a seat of cushioned gilt wicker work ill suited enough to the premier's substantial form the room was full of dainty knick-knacks small tables japanese screens and cabinets and expensive ornaments such as might readily form part of a collection of keepsakes a rich yet faint odour exhaling from a bowl of creamy magnolias pervaded the apartment the green jalousies were partially drawn and the room was dim and cool you have remembered me said mrs valancy in joyful tones good things sometimes come when they are sorely needed a visit from you is one of them i'm not very well to-day a headache that is always a woman's excuse when she is cross or unhappy i am afraid that something is troubling you said mr longleat destitute of the fine tact which observes but does not remark and if there were she replied in a tone more pathetic than ungracious who would care she walked to the window lifted the jealousy looked out plucked a rose with which she toyed and returned seating herself on a low chair close to her visitor she leaned her chin upon her hand and regarded him with a queer inscrutable gleam shining in her dark eyes you care she said presently perhaps a little mr longleat wiped his face with a silk pocket handkerchief his heart throbbed with pity and with a generosity which he dared not proffer tell me what's the matter he said she shook her head in a deprecatory manner but still led him on i can't bear to see it continued mr longleat hurriedly taking her hand in his it it goes again me somehow a woman like you ought to be kept from fretting and worry you're one of the prettiest creatures god ever made it's only right that you should be wrapped round with riches to hinder the hard things of life from knocking again you and hurting you tell me is it is it money she gave a little nod then wrenched her hand away it isn't all she said not all or half and what is the use of telling you it won't make you think any the better of me or like me any the more i dare say that you'll despise me in your heart for speaking about my troubles to a stranger like you don't call me a stranger said longleat earnestly i'm a plain-spoken man and i go at a thing straight without beating about the bush look here mrs valancy if you'll let me call myself your friend you'll find that with me the word means a good deal 
i am proud to think that you've honoured me so far with your confidence you needn't be afraid of speaking out it it grieves me to see you unhappy yes i am sure of that said she gazing earnestly into his face if i had not thought so should i have talked to you as frankly as i have done all along your heart is so large so noble that you can find room in it even for me you can feel for my troubles almost as you would feel for those of your daughter mr longleat reddened but she maintained an innocent composure isn't it so it comforts me to think that some one cares for me a little you have heard about me about my husband she went on with her eyes downcast upon the matting you know the sort of people we are or rather the sort of people that we are taken to be you can guess the kind of life i lead no you cannot guess half or a quarter of its wretchedness and you would despise me if i told you you know that we are deeply in debt that he gambles drinks that he is often cruel to me the burden of all our misery falls on my shoulders that was what i meant when i said that i could be happy if he were sent away out of temptation if he could be sent to a place ever so far north he would go he wants money and i should be left here he would not be so cruel as to make me accompany him he knows that a hot climate is almost fatal to me i should be justified in refusing and then i should be free oh think what that would be to me i should be spared harassing scenes daily worry i should have peace yes said longleat slowly and pausing between his words if if there were such a place that he could be sent to there is she whispered looking at him eagerly there is gundaroo longleat blenched he shifted uneasily in his chair and sat silent his eyes upon the ground she went on in calmer silvery tones don't think that i have asked for it i have no right the boon would be too great and you may only despise me it seems terrible to wish one's husband to go away i should not dare to let him know it i am a hypocrite i am selfish and heartless but i long oh i long for rest truth is harder to face than the worst which one's imagination can picture i am a cowardly woman i quail before rough usage i like tender care and soft words and delicate clothes and of all these my life is barren i never loved my husband why should i not say so to you and he knows it i was compelled to marry him and now i am paying the penalty of my weakness and folly you must not blame yourself said mr longleat you've been sinned against and cruelly used i left the club just now because your husband came in and i could not sit comfortably in the same room with him if i feel like that what must it be to you it's a sin that a girl's married misery should be borne only by herself and then that it should be thought a shame for her to speak how is it possible for an innocent trusting creature to tell a bad man from a good one her father should look after that do you think he added and he trembled as he spoke that i could rest easy in my grave if i had knowingly let my girl married to her wretchedness god forgive me all sins but never that one if i'm like to commit it it mightn't be your fault altogether said mrs valancy your daughter might be wilful you don't know i was wilful always it wasn't entirely because of my father and mother i thought as they did that i should be rich and live at ease you see i don't wish you to think me better than i am and i am punished heaven knows that i am poor enough now what's money after all said longleat what's the good of it but to make the people one loves happy i've got plenty that is the light in which i look at it and that is what i meant when i said that there might be ways of helping you if you would accept a loan from me to relieve you from your difficulties and put you straight it'd be nothing to me 
we shall never have any money it would be impossible for us to repay you but friends you said that we were friends stammered mr longleat and there needn't be any question of that sort it's what i've done scores of times for pals on the road and you she laughed softly friendship does not often imply a partnership in purse no no don't talk of a loan i understand you you have a generous heart another woman might have been offended i am not but it wouldn't do you can't serve me in that way believe me that i am most grateful for your sympathy it warms and comforts me now let us drop the subject of my troubles i have said too much i forbid you to mention them again tell me about yourself about your daughter i am jealous of her i envy her why asked mr longleat in surprise for the reason that we are both women has she not everything that i lack beauty ah you need not shake your head if i was pretty once i know that i am prematurely old and faded now love admiration wealth and above all has she not you a father who adores her you're right there said mr longleat speaking with rough earnestness i worship the clothes she wears the ground she treads that's about it i only value what i am and what i've got according by what i am able to do for her and yet it's a queer thing i don't mind saying it to you but i could not say it to any one else least of all to her something in my throat had stopped me women aren't the same for all that it's true i love her as i love my life i've told myself when i've done a good day's work it's to make a lady of honey she's not like her father i've meant that she should grow up different there's sorts and sorts i'm one sort and i've educated her to be another i've prepared myself for it but lord for all that it's hard i couldn't talk out to her as i'm talking to you now no said mrs valancy in a tone half sympathetic half interrogative it's true i'm not one to growl over the crop i've sown but it's a trifle hard when a man can't reap his own harvest you mean said mrs valancy that your daughter will marry i'm prepared for that said longleat if she marries to my mind i'll not complain at losing her all i ask is that i may be able to cotton with the man she set her heart on i'm pretty quick at seeing the wrong side of human nature i know a pair of honest eyes when they look into mine and her husband must be an australian she owes it to the country that has given her her money and that has made a man of her father her marriage wasn't what i meant there's a kind of wall between us that seems to grow thicker as she grows older and we can't either of us climb it she's a lady with ladies ways i'm nothing to her but a rough beggar that has knocked again the world and doesn't understand her she's standoffish and i'm huffed and so it goes on and for all my love we go farther apart you see i'm telling you my troubles now he sat silent for several moments with a harassed look upon his face she moved a little closer to him and laid her hand upon his it's different with you he said you seem to be my friend somehow from the first i ain't shy at speaking to you as i said before what is money between friends or if you would let me arrange matters with your husband he does not like me but i do not think that he would make any difficulty about accepting a loan from me no no that would be impossible she said we could never repay you she repeated you hurt me said longleat when you talk about repayment it is as though your pride wouldn't let you accept anything from a rough fellow like me that's how i take it indeed you do me injustice cried mrs valancy warmly i thank you with my whole heart for your noble offer let me accept your friendship your sympathy which are sweet indeed to me but let the other matter rest she rose and moved to the window under pretext of raising the blind but in reality to avoid following up the turn which the conversation had taken in truth she was anxious that he should not at that moment divine how far upon some future occasion she might be ready to avail herself of his generosity 
mrs valancy walked out to the veranda and then returned my husband will soon be coming back she said i had better go said longleat feeling that he was dismissed i shall see you at the opening of parliament he added still lingering no i shall not be there he pressed her for the motive of her absence since you will have it said she a woman's reason why do women go to raree shows to wear new gowns i have none therefore i shall stay at home is it really so asked longleat looking incredulously at her slim white-robed figure yes truly i owe madame sophie already more than i can pay her i may tell you this since i have refused to borrow your money now good-bye longleat shook hands with mrs valancy and departed some days later a covered box was brought over from the north side and left at the emu point cottage accompanied by a note in which madame sophie expressed her willingness to execute any further orders with which mrs valancy might favour her upon opening the box constance found that the costume which she had coveted was placed at her disposal when residing at leichardt's town without his daughter it was not mr longleat's habit to dine at the bunyas he was a man to whom masculine society afforded greater pleasure than any other and though he neither drank nor smoked making indeed a merit of the abstinence which he affirmed had contributed largely towards his success in life the roistering conversation of the smoking-room and the political element which pervaded the club was better suited to his taste than the more refined atmosphere of drawing-rooms but upon the evening of his visit to mrs valancy he departed from his usual rule and oppressed by an unaccountable sense of blankness he ate his dinner at home in musing solitude then retired to his study where he surrounded but did not occupy himself with letters and books never had his home appeared more devoid of companionship never had the lack of sympathy in his life forced itself more strongly upon him he would have given much to hear the sound of janey's prattle to be conscious of honoria's sweet if somewhat disdainful presence the current of his daily interests and ambitions seemed to have been suddenly checked and he felt himself to be stranded helplessly upon an unknown shore he was vainly trying to concentrate his attention upon some official papers when the door was opened and the entrance of dyson maddox furnished an opportune stimulant to his jaded energies the premier greeted him warmly it was evident that the young man was a favourite i am afraid that i am very late said dyson the kooya coach was behind hand this evening i looked into the club expecting to find you there i was obliged to go over some of morrison's work and could do it better here but i am not in the humour for poring over papers this evening you got my letter of course and you have come down about the land's appointment yes replied dyson i have been turning the matter over in my mind ever since i heard from you i dare say you will wonder that i should have given it a thought except to feel gratified at the honour you have done me i am most sensible of that but the fact is there were both public and private reasons are you sure that i am the man for the place not a doubt of it said the premier i have always had my eye upon you as a likely member of the cabinet the screw is not a primary object with you we want independent men lycombe and brown were thought of but they are free lances and we are at odds upon the ab abolition bill it might have been a wise precaution to nail one of them just at this turn of affairs but there would have been a split later the other ministers think with me you are bound to stand and fall by our party and you are fitted in every way for the office of lands i hope that you have made up your mind to accept yes i have done so i have put aside all private feeling in the matter i came down by kooralbyn to-day and saw your daughter you know what my hopes were and you were good enough to encourage them it is only fair to tell you that they are now at an end what exclaimed mr longleat looking up with an expression of concern honoria has refused you you don't mean to say so 
i could have sworn that she was fond of you she is a flirt is honey and likes to be admired but i had my reasons for believing that you were the man she had set her heart on this is a blow to me dyson i don't understand women i own that i can't make out my daughter perhaps i ought to say that some men might not have considered her refusal hopeless she told me that she could not love me that she required excitement passion neither of which she could find in me that she wished to see more of the world and half suggested that i should give her six months in which to make up her mind i think she has some regard for me but that is not the fashion in which i must be loved if she has dreams of this kind it is better that she should seek their fulfilment my wife must not come to me half-hearted pooh pooh said the premier visibly relieved you cannot expect such a prize as honoria to drop like a ripe cherry into your mouth women won't answer at once to the bit they must be coaxed and humoured you mustn't give up so quickly i thought you had more pluck it is at an end said dyson grimly i shall never try again unless your daughter's mode of thought changes entirely she is restless and dissatisfied she wishes to see life take her to england mr longleat let her have her fill throw her into intercourse with men of the upper classes and give her an opportunity of choosing a husband to her taste if she returns unmarried it will be time enough for me to resume my suit by interrupted mr longleat fiercely i have seen enough of englishmen and of their doings my daughter shall never marry a cursed aristocrat she is the fruit of a free country and in it her lot shall be cast if she will have it so but she has a will of her own said dyson you have cultivated her intellect and perceptions you have made her what she is it is out of your power to control her likes and antipathies well the subject is not a pleasant one for me as far as i am concerned let it drop now i want to show her that i am brave enough to live in her world without flinching from the pain of association with her interest and pursuits i gratefully accept the appointment it gives me an opportunity for which i have wished i'll make the necessary arrangements with cathcart and take up my abode in leichardt's town for the winter then followed a political discussion which lasted long into the night and through which it is not necessary to carry the reader end of chapter ten chapter eleven of policy and passion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org policy and passion by rosa campbell prayed chapter eleven angela as mr ferris had predicted barrington found existence at diaraba very monotonous a week after his arrival he had almost decided with lord dolph that he was not of the stuff to make a satisfactory settler and was casting about in his mind the possibility of obtaining a government appointment by means of the interest which his family name and connections would certainly procure for him but opposed to this course was the unadvisability of disclosing more of his immediate antecedents than was necessary the story of his retirement from the guards could hardly be revealed in its nakedness and would deepen in disgrace from the mystery in which it was shrouded the episode which hinged upon a beautiful woman well known in the london half-world and on a money transaction in which to do him justice barrington had been merely a victim to the knavish rapacity of others was discreditable more from the social than the moral standard of culpability society must needs have a scapegoat and in this instance barrington had suffered a more severe punishment than he perhaps deserved going to australia had seemed an easy and efficacious mode of self-effacement but his english experiences had hardly been of a nature to fit him for the rough actualities of a colonial career 
with good looks a pleasing address and the prestige of high birth he had possessed an entree to the best european society he had idealized epicurism and had lived for the indulgence of refined sensation life to him was something more than a happy practical joke a combination of the labouring and bohemian phases of existence into which by means of swiss bridges sport pigs the piano and stretches of the imagination a faint flavour of the pursuits of an english country gentleman might be introduced it was humiliating to have forced upon him the conviction that his supersensuous dreams of feminine excellence must henceforth remain unfulfilled or take shape in a maggie and that his aesthetic philosophy which had reduced life to the level of artistic sensation must in future be fed upon the excitement of cattle hunting the beauties of primeval nature and the unrefined companionship that had as yet presented itself to him and which was only endurable because it lacked the pretension of vulgarity one morning lord dolph with a faint perception that his friend was bored and an amiable desire to further his matrimonial projects proposed a ride to coolrobin it was arranged that maggie should accompany them and that they should remain a few days however an hour before the time fixed for starting as barrington was packing his valise and mournfully regarding the crushed condition of his white shirts lord dolph entered excited and apologetic my dear fellow i am awfully sorry but i am really afraid that i must give up the expedition to coolrobin ward the butcher has just turned up from barramunda he wants to make up a mob of bullocks and i've got twenty fattens ready for the market couldn't lose such a chance of selling mag and i must help to drive him in perhaps you wouldn't mind going without us maggie will pilot you over the ranges on her way to the blue gum camp then you have only to follow the river you can't lose your way lady dolph who was in the sitting-room giggled oh no fear cried she come and saddle your horse mr barrington and we'll be off lady dolph looked very colonial in her short grey riding habit and straw hat under which her rosy freckled face glowed with health and good humour i'll meet you round by the boomerang water-holes she said in farewell to her husband we must fly sharp she added as she whipped her horse into a canter for dolph is so green about the stock that he'll be selling the wrong bullocks if i don't look smart after him as he followed lady dolph bassett's lead across the interminable ridges barrington reflected upon the advantages which a squatter would derive from marrying a wife who would look smart after both her lord and his cattle i suppose all australian ladies ride well and that sort of thing he remarked pursuing a mental train of thought is miss longleat for instance clever about stock-keeping honoria cried lady dolph gracious no she is much too fine to go out on the run i dare say that she would not know a strawberry beast from a roan if you asked her but then you see she was educated in sydney and her father has always had lots of hands she was not brought up to the saddle as i have been but when a squatter lives ever so far up the uby and his men go on the burst what can he do but make his daughters help barrington had still further food for reflection and maggie continued she'll be more your style mr barrington she is english in her ways she makes up to be european you don't care about australia i can see that in a twinkling now dolph likes the fun of it then he's different it's rough in the bush but it is not a bad sort of life i dare say you think that i am rough too but i'm pretty smart if i like and if dolph were to take me home i bet i'd soon pick up english manners i've heard people say that is the beauty of australian girls they can turn their minds or their hands to anything she escorted him to the river bank advising him to follow the course of the stream till he should arrive at a paddock fence which was near the crossing at cool robin then she uttered a frank good-bye don't get bushed and trotted off to superintend the stock collecting 
not trusting himself out of sight of the green line which marked where the river ran barrington rode slowly along its windings he passed beneath glossy chestnuts and spreading cedars now beside murmuring shallows and now by deep mysterious pools bordered by beds of fern and arum and crossed by fallen logs against which lay heaped the refuse left by many a flood the trees closed him in meeting high above his head and upon all sides seemed to diverge in interminable vistas sometimes a dip in the hills or a break of foliage would reveal a glimpse of distant mountains occasionally a deep gully intersecting the creek would oblige him to make a circuit till he found a passable spot or a sidling that afforded no foothold for his horse would necessitate a descent into the bed of the creek where every now and then he would become bogged in a treacherous quicksand but the sure-footed animal he rode although unshod was well accustomed to rolling stones and slippery places and would have found its own way to cool robin without much guidance on the part of its rider at last barrington reached a two-railed fence which sank on both sides into the water and finding no outlet followed it up to a set of slip-rails which admitted him into a paddock whence in the distance he could perceive signs of habitation a herd of unbroken horses lifted up their heads as he passed and with their long manes and tails flowing scampered towards a belt of scrub that lay between the creek and the wooded ranges beyond it barrington rode along a bridle track that presently brought him to a well-worn crossing below him there was a sweet murmuring of running water over a pebbly bottom and the river divided itself into several narrow streams merging lower down into one deep pool large crystals lay in the rocky bed and a tie tree rising from the centre of an earth-girt stump at the junction of two rivulets resisted the current which swirled and eddied round its bare roots and pendant foliage upon the opposite side stretched the wide plain of cool robin it was a pretty secluded spot the creek sides rose high and shelving and were overgrown with mulgam plants now past fruiting ferns and a stiff green grass of which the yellow bloom emitted a powerful aromatic perfume as barrington let his horse drink his eye wandered aimlessly along the banks and a little distance down the stream were attracted by the flutter of a white dress through the trees a girl poised lightly upon a slippery log which spanned a pool deep enough to render the prospect of immersion sufficiently alarming she appeared to hesitate whether or not to advance nervously drawing back her foot and clutching at the swaying branches of a wattle tree that overhung the narrow bridge he saw that she was very young hardly more than a child and that she was also very pretty the sweet helplessness of her face and its dreamy poetic expression immediately interested him he slipped off his horse and hanging its bridle to a stump walked along the bank to the girl's assistance are you afraid to cross he asked with gentle courtesy the log is rather slippery let me help you angela turned her large blue eyes upon him and a flush overspread the waxen paleness of her skin thank you she said simply i want to go home i have often crossed here before and it is the first time i have ever turned giddy but just now i saw a snake in the water and it startled me so that i feared i might fall it was a water snake perhaps replied barrington can you see it still no answered angela and looked at him with her blank appealing eyes it might have been fancy i sometimes do imagine that i see things which are not real i had been reading she paused a moment with her gaze fixed upon the water and murmured almost under her breath the serpent's mailed and many-coated skin shone through the plumes its coils were twined within barrington glanced in surprise at a little green volume she held in her hand you have been reading he repeated my child do they feed your poetic cravings upon such strong food as leon and cintha angela looked bewildered it is beautiful is it not she said i am glad that you like it too i did not think that any one in australia cared for poetry except father and myself ah said barrington so then life in australia is not all prosaic 
surely the voice of poetry echoes among these mountains shelley might have sung of the wild beauty of your forests you love them cried angela her face brightening to enthusiasm oh so do i i am never unhappy when i can wander among the trees and by the river they tell me so much so much that other people do not know but mrs ferris would like best to pen me within doors and teach me to do needlework mrs ferris is your mother asked barrington she is not my mother replied angela with a pettish accent my own mother is dead mrs ferris does not understand me she thinks me foolish but my father says that an artist is never comprehended by the outside world and so i shut my lips and dream and live my inner life that is all one need wish for i am gratified at your speaking to me so unreservedly said barrington with the wish to test her angela directed a swift glance at his face and coloured again you are not like the others she said simply when i saw you walking towards me i felt that i might trust you i have heard that you are an artist continued barrington i should very much like to see your drawings they are only studies said angela thoughts that rise in my mind and that i must express by and by my father will take me to rome and then i shall paint great pictures poor child he murmured involuntarily why you think i shall fail said angela sharply no he replied you may have genius yes i have genius she answered with a confident simplicity i am certain of it genius is a rare heritage said barrington i hope it may be yours when i see your paintings i will tell you whether or not i believe that you possess it come give me your hand i will lead you across the log and you shall guide me to kooralbyn i have not told you my name yet it is barrington and i am a friend of lord dolph bassett's i have met your father at kooya oh said angela you are the englishman of whom he spoke probably you can tell me whether mr longleat is at the station there is no one there replied angela except my father and mrs ferris miss longleat is in leichardt's town the pang of disappointment which barrington certainly experienced was mitigated by the prospect of this innocent being's society he took her hand and piloted her across the log then returned got on his horse and rode through the shallow water to the opposite bank here he dismounted and walked on by angela's side are you always alone in your rambles asked barrington have you no companions i have my father and the birds and the flowers i want no others does not miss longleat ever walk with you angela shook her head and smiled inscrutably tell me said barrington becoming interested of what do you think when you are roaming by yourself through the forest i make pictures in my mind said angela and sometimes when i am sitting by the river the running water talks to me i should like to know what it says if you will tell me there are spirits everywhere said angela solemnly i have read it in an old book of fathers and my soul tells me that it must be true none but poets and young girls ever hear their voices it is they who send inspiring thoughts and beautiful dreams they are invisible except to the imagination and their gentle murmurings can only be heard by the soul they lift one up on wings that is the real life and the world below is only a picture i chatter too much she added pausing abruptly if you think me foolish you must remember that no one ever encourages me to talk and you ask me to tell you my fancies i like to hear them replied barrington do not hesitate to tell me your thoughts freely you remind me of a sister whom i love dearly and whose temperament was of the same quaint poetic type as your own and she died said angela looking at him earnestly with her hand upon the garden gate she died at fifteen a little younger than i am murmured angela thoughtfully only a little younger she opened the gate and without speaking further led barrington into mrs ferris's parlour it was a homely pretty room shaded by a screen of grape leaves from the western sun with windows opening towards the east and the walls hung profusely with drawings in chalk and water-colours the spotless boards were covered with rugs of opossum skins the chintz covers and muslin curtains were without speck upon the sideboard were placed several pieces of plate upon the brilliancy of which mrs 
mrs ferris prided herself the old lady in her ample gown and white cap sat at one side of the fireplace with a basket of undarned hose before her little janey perched upon a stool by her side nursed a lapful of kittens and gave utterance to remarks savouring somewhat of heterodoxy upon a biblical lesson which mrs ferris had been giving her aunt pen if god said that somebody was to kill jesus judas wasn't so wicked after all for letting the jews do it for if he hadn't we'd all have gone to hell polly polly mind your manners screeched a parrot in a cage by the window as angela and barrington entered where is father asked the former in the office settling with the fencers replied mrs ferris and barrington seeing that angela was departing introduced himself dear heart said mrs ferris i'm afraid that you have come over at an unlucky time there's no one at cool robin but ourselves miss longleat went to leichardt's town a few days ago and the premier is always away at this season however mr barrington she added warmly i am more than pleased to see you you'll cheer up the heart of my old man for he was just full of you when he came back from meeting you at kooya i don't pretend to understand geniuses but he'll talk to you by the hour about art and books and if you're fond of the subject you couldn't go to any one better up in it than anthony ferris shortly afterwards mr ferris entered with his daughter and welcomed his guest with an old-world pomposity in which was a savour of deprecation the menage was curious and struck barrington as utterly unlike any other he had seen in australia there was in it an odd blending of aestheticism and eccentricity and mrs ferris seemed the only commonplace element in the party angela's innocent garrulity appeared to have suffered a sudden check in the presence of her stepmother she hardly spoke but retired to a corner with her book above which she furtively regarded barrington at dusk after a little preliminary flutter on the part of the hostess they dined the day had been very hot but now a breeze stirred the vine leaves which cast moving shadows upon the white board it was like a scene out of a pastoral idyll upon the table was a freshly gathered dessert and the cheer though modest attested the excellence of mrs ferris's housekeeping the old man produced a bottle of his master's wine his little dark eyes twinkled and he stroked his grizzled beard with an air of self-complacency barrington had an appreciation for the picturesque and this mixture of flourish and simplicity attracted him his palate was gratified and he had never felt more interested to-morrow you must see angela's studio said mr ferris as after dinner they sat smoking in the veranda i am convinced that you will be astonished at the talent which her drawings exhibit she is a strange child he continued sadly poetic to a remarkable degree reserved with her own family and apparently unimpressionable but clinging to the few whom she loves with an extraordinary tenacity of affection here is the true artistic temperament stirred only by the breath of sympathy in many respects her disposition resembles mine i pray heaven that her life may not like mine be embittered by disappointment and inappreciation but i have few fears if she lives she will become great the moon was shining brightly and angela in a white dress with a fantastic wreath of flowers adorning her yellow hair seemed like a spirit of the night as she glided rather than walked in and out among the shrubs in the garden mrs ferris had withdrawn to put janey to bed and when a gentle snore announced that the old man had fallen asleep barrington quietly rose and joined the girl who was now swinging herself to and fro in a hammock slung beneath an orange tree is that the lagoon yonder asked barrington pointing to a shining expanse below them can we reach it from here it is at the foot of the garden replied the girl there's a boat upon it would you like to come out for a row i should be delighted he rejoined she sprang to the ground and holding out her hand with a childlike gesture led him to the bank of the lake where a rudely fashioned canoe was moored she unloosed the rope and stepped in motioning him to the seat at the stern 
then she pushed off into the middle of the lagoon and let the boat drift while she gathered a handful of the lotus lilies that floated on the surface of the water listen said angela presently there's music in the air to-night do you hear it she watched him anxiously as wishing to humour her he replied in the affirmative his sympathy was the open sesame to the world of her fanciful imagination and indeed there was above and around that faint sweet murmuring which is the melody of a summer evening the spirits are all dancing to-night continued angela looking at him with her dreamy eyes and speaking with grave simplicity they always do when the moon is at its full there's a clear place beneath a big cedar tree by the creek and that is their ballroom this afternoon i brushed the twigs and fallen leaves away from the grass so that it might be smooth and clean all the fairies meet together and they have a famous revel no one knows these secrets but i and where do you learn them angela now that is what puzzles me said the child with a perplexed look is it when i am sleeping or waking i do not know it often seems to me that this is not my real home that my true self belongs to that spirit world which is hidden in all the common things that surround our daily lives that world has a language of its own which is audible in the strains of nature's music some are deaf and do not hear it others hear it but do not understand i know i feel and when my stepmother says poor angel she is only a foolish child i tell myself that i am wiser than she is and that mysteries are revealed to me which are hidden from her but i do not speak to mrs ferris or honoria of what is in my mind i am silent upon these matters which have only to do with myself angela took up the oars and began to row again singing dreamily to herself in fantastic harmonies which barrington guessed to be of her own composition she had a sweet voice pure and sympathetic and when raised of considerable compass barrington leaned back in the boat experiencing that nerve vibration which is peculiar to temperaments of febrile excitability the boundless expanse of shadowy solitude the stillness of the night the gliding motion of the boat and the unearthly beauty of his companion acted upon his imagination like the fumes of opium and he felt that he was for the hour at least in an eastern paradise suddenly angela ceased singing and rested on her oars i am so tired she said in her pathetic childlike voice i get so easily tired let us drift and do you talk now i want to listen it is very pleasant gliding through the water like this we will come here every night you won't go away soon say that you will not go away my pretty child said barrington i will not talk of departure to-night when the time comes it will be difficult to resist the charm of your sweet voice if you bid me stay End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of policy and passion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org policy and passion by rosa campbell prayed chapter twelve on the lagoon upon the following morning at barrington's request angela led the way to her studio it was a room in one of the outbuildings originally used for garnering corn and adjoined the store and accountant's office which constituted mr ferris's peculiar domain the door was padlocked and only angela and her father possessed the keys the window overlooked a secluded part of the garden where roses grew in rank luxuriance and scented verbena filled the air with perfume 
by an ingenious contrivance mr ferris had arranged that the light should fall from above and had caused the glass skylight to be protected from the violent hailstorms which raged among the mountains by slanting sheets of zinc that softened the glare without obscuring the light a little bookshelf surmounted a pine cupboard in one corner but the rest of the room was lined with pictures of all kinds in various stages of development sketches of grass and reeds of sunrise and sunset upon the mountains of moonlight shimmering on the lagoon dull anatomical studies and graceful portrayals of shadowy forms rising from the mist or blending with the clouds in every conception there were touches of mystery and sadness of high effort and divine desire which though often imperfectly executed were full of poetic originality the true artistic soul revealed itself in every stroke of her pencil her landscapes were characterized by a delicate sentiment that lifted nature to the pitch of idealism her studies of the human face and form were types of spiritual beauty with indeed the exception of a roughly sketched portrait of a woman which at once attracted barrington's attention who is this he asked eagerly while angela stood anxiously awaiting his comments upon her more ambitious works it is honoria longleat said angela coldly this this miss longleat repeated barrington unprepared for beauty of so high an order he stood for a few moments in rapt contemplation of the drawing cool robin is a favoured place he murmured angela turned away her face wearing an expression of childlike pain what is the matter little one asked barrington seeing that she did not speak you think only of her muttered angela barrington took her hand in his and ranging the walls with his eyes gave her pictures the calm inspection of a connoisseur accept my apologies for doubting you he said you have genius angela's eyes sparkled with delight and she suddenly raised a cloth which covered the painting upon her easel a sunset study of plain and mountain what do you think of the picture asked mr ferris entering there is scope for the imagination in this conception a little softening of that distance angela a, a touch of mystery in the shadows of yonder valley you have work here yet my child barrington criticised and admired freely but presently his eyes wandered to the portrait of honoria the old man observed his preoccupation and frowned pa he cried in his excitable manner it is ever so while men have human instincts the glory of art must shrink into nothingness before the potency of flesh and blood popular taste would prefer the portrait of a wanton to the fairest incarnation of poesy but it is to enrich the future not the present that the artist toils my angela thy frail frame enfolds a divine mission you are right said barrington here is no ordinary talent surely you will not delay in taking her to italy it would be a sin to posterity were she debarred from studying art in its highest phases my friend said anthony ferris solemnly i have carefully planned angela's future in forbidding that she should be coerced in permitting her to roam about the bush as she would and in giving free play to her fantastic imagination i have merely followed out my theory of artistic education the true artist is he whose aspiration springs direct from the heavenly fount to produce great work he must from infancy have become familiarized with nature in all her moods untrammelled by conventional rules and at liberty to send forth shoots of fancy according to the natural bent of his mind there is time later on to study the old masters who after all were but interpreters the world of cities the drama of society 
i have had a motive in confining angela's sympathies within the circle of these mountains she must have become an artist before the petty interests of womanhood dragged down her soul as her father spoke angela's gaze turned involuntarily towards barrington and the two pairs of eyes met a deep blush overspread the girl's face and seemed to reveal the dawn of an agitating consciousness mr ferris left the studio called away by a group of station hands who waited without approaching angela barrington laid one hand upon her trembling fingers and with the other pointed to the unfinished picture you will never be a great artist angela he whispered till you have learned to feel like a woman it will have been remarked that to hardress barrington's temperament feminine sympathy formed an essential component of happiness that the woman by whom it was bestowed should be beautiful and interesting followed as a matter of course that like angela she should also be original and poetic was more than his short experience of australian society had permitted him to hope the young girl was to him a never-ending source of speculation her dreamy fancies and visionary talk which seemed to verge so closely upon frenzy her undoubted genius the frank abandon of her manner to him compared with her reserve to others her beauty and the quaint simplicity of her life and surroundings puzzled and attracted him he watched her with admiration in which was no deeper feeling and listened to her with pleasure her graceful companionship appeared to him like the perfume of a wild flower pervading a picturesque solitude she seemed a true incarnation of the spirit of these australian wilds which had they been invested with european romance would have left his sensuous aestheticism nothing to desire till now these free pastures and grand mountains had to his fancy resembled a perfectly moulded form destitute of the soul which brings animal beauty into harmony with human yearnings with angela's society the softening and poetic element which he had so sorely missed during the last few months was imported into his life barrington's nature was one readily impressed but slowly moved his passions had been so often stimulated to feverish activity that the calm vigour of healthy affection was a state of moral being that it would have been difficult to induce yet there were in his heart certain pure fraternal aspirations to which angela's frank sensibility and innocent partiality appealed strongly for the first time since his arrival in australia he ceased to experience a nauseating discontent and was in no haste to exchange the harmonious influences of kooralbyn for the uncongenial atmosphere of diraba he was angela's constant companion in her walks and rides he hung over her while she worked in her studio he talked to her of rome and paris of music art and literature making her the confidant of his vague dissatisfaction with his lot till she began to look upon him as a hero who had suffered cruel treatment at the world's hands he encouraged her fantastic prattle he read aloud to her as they sat together by the banks of the river or drifted in the canoe upon the lagoon in all this tender camaraderie there was to her a bewildering charm she lay down to sleep with a smile upon her lips and awoke with a nameless sense of joy unconsciously both to her and to himself for unworthy motives must not be imputed to him he was unveiling the budding beauty of her womanhood and transporting her to an imaginary arcadia where each step taken in uncertainty is fraught with peril where the eyes are deceived by a false glamour the pulses quicken and reason becomes mute the ground yields unreal flowers of sentiment and the air distils an essence subtle and intoxicating while 
alas the lovely landscape appearing in the distance fades upon approach to the falsity of mirage one night when barrington had been about ten days at cool robin he and angela were as usual out of doors and had strolled to the edge of the lagoon mr ferris had the day before been unexpectedly summoned to a neighbouring station upon business and mrs ferris within was calmly dozing over her book it was a balmy voluptuous evening the moon was rising behind the couronged crag and a faint breeze stirred the petals of the lilies and lifted angela's hair the girl was in a state of fitful excitability alternately voluble and silent while her vacant rippling laugh echoed over plain and water and startled barrington by its shrill joyousness she had taken the oars and had rowed into the middle of the lagoon where they had idly drifted among the lilies suddenly she half rose and made the canoe whirl round and round in fantastic circles till alarmed for their safety he begged her to desist take care he said you will upset the boat and what then she cried we should both fall into the water and i should have to swim with you to the shore or perhaps our feet might get entangled in the weeds and we should sink that would not matter replied angela quite gravely the water spirits would not let me drown are you not afraid of the bunyip then cobra ball says that he inhabits this pool he is a bogey said angela and nothing wicked belongs to the spirit world she recommenced her antics and playfully threw a few drops of water in his face mischievous elf exclaimed barrington seizing her hands there ensued a mock struggle in which he tried to wrest the oars from her grasp her pretty face perilously near his own offered a temptation too great to be resisted he wound his arm round her lithe form and kissed her lips angela let the oars drop and one of them floated away among the lilies he felt that she trembled and frightened at what he had done released her she leaned back in the boat and covered her face with her wet hands naughty child he said why did you provoke me to conquer you he drew away the fingers which hid her eyes all her mirth and mischief had vanished and she looked at him with an expression of wonder and beseeching that stirred his heart with a painful emotion angela he said more gravely i will not kiss you again but let us make a compact with one another i will be your elder brother and you shall be my sweet little sister whom i will love dearly and who must promise when i bid her do that which is for her good now you must take my seat and i will row you to the shore you are pale and trembling you have overtired yourself in your excitement see you have splashed yourself too your thin gown is quite wet and if you remain longer on the water you will take cold he placed his hand caressingly on her shoulder covered only by her muslin bodice which was damp with spray and dew angela mutely answered his appeal by bending suddenly forward and with innocent fervour pressing her lips to his hand he relieved their mutual embarrassment by seeking the oar which had slipped away from her hold and then rowed her to the bank End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of policy and passion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org policy and passion by rosa campbell prayed chapter thirteen father and daughter it was announced that the parliament of leichardt's land would reopen upon the third of march and miss longleat's departure from cool robin had been originally fixed for the first but as has been seen she had abruptly changed her plans and had commanded mr ferris's escort to town a few days prior to barrington's arrival on the station 
had she been aware of his intended visit it is probable that she would have lingered in order to make his acquaintance the prospect of a new excitement would have held forth considerable attraction for her at that moment since her interview with dyson maddox honoria had felt restless and unhappy it was certain that she had rejected him yet it seemed by no means equally certain that she did not love him for no sooner had she apparently convinced herself of indifference than his image would persistently obtrude itself as the secondary figure in sundry melodramatic situations of which fancy painted her the heroine poor honoria imagination presented an uncircumscribed field of action involving every condition of being save that of passive enjoyment love fear hate drawing-room comedy and harrowing tragedy were all comprised in her repertoire but the puzzling consideration which interfered with her clear foreshadowing lay in the fact that not one of the unconscious performers who played with her upon the stage of real life and to the pitch of emotional energy demanded by her own high-strung temperament a rachel surrounded by tenth-rate provincial tragedians could hardly have felt more at a loss than did honoria whose lovers with the solitary exception of dyson maddox inspired a temporary excitement followed by a sickening reaction the day before she left cool robin honoria received the following letter from maddox the club leichardt's town february twenty first my dear miss longleat forgive me for leaving you so abruptly the other day you will understand better that i can explain what my feelings at the time must have been i have thought much of what you said to me and thank you for your frankness it has convinced me alike of your goodwill and your coldness let me say one word upon that subject which may henceforth be considered closed it is my earnest wish that you may love deeply some more fortunate man than myself and that thus the rich colouring which your life lacks now may be brought into it and make you content for myself i am strong enough to stand on one side and watch the course of events it is possible that there may be hope for me in the future but i will not suffer myself to dwell upon so sweet a dream and it is my wish to cultivate indifference you will hear from your father that i have accepted the appointment of minister for lands i hope that i may have acted wisely for the support of our party my new duties will prevent me from calling frequently at the bunyas nor under the present circumstances should i wish to see you often but i beg that you will consider araby at your disposal if you have no riding horses in town at present pardon the suggestion but i think that for your father's sake it would be well if you were in leichardt's town he is lonely without a companion ever faithfully yours dyson maddox honoria read the letter several times and turned it over to see if there were a line or a postscript that she had overlooked but there was nothing to remove the impression of abandonment which the cold guarded sentences left on her mind she was one of those women to whom a possession becomes sweet in proportion as its attractions are enhanced by the doubtful charm of uncertainty now that maddox had apparently reconciled himself to her dismissal she felt a strong desire to recall him she even composed the opening words of a reply to his letter why should the subject be closed you have not understood me as i wished then her cheeks flamed and she tossed her head of course such words could not be written and did not she not know that if she were mad enough to send them she would regret them an hour afterwards no let him go this pale sisterly attachment was not the love of which she had dreamed the last words of his note appeared to carry a veiled meaning to which she had no clue she was in entire ignorance of the incipient flirtation with mrs valancy to which in fact dyson had alluded and was at a loss to understand mr ferris's malign chuckle when she announced that upon her father's account she wished to go to town 
i assure you that there is no occasion to disturb yourself he said in a sneering tone your father has found society which will i am sure amply replace your own what does he mean asked honoria of mrs ferris when the old man had left the room oh my love replied aunt pen it's that gossip dungy who has been talking he picks up and circulates all the scandal and cooya the premier is but a man and there are brazen hussies all the world over but you need not be afraid of a stepmother mrs valancy has got a husband though they say that he's not any better than he should be either honoria elevated her eyebrows contemptuously too proud to pursue the subject nevertheless she held to her determination of joining her father immediately the mailman had passed by so that there was no mode of informing mr longleat of the change in her plans embracing the idea of a surprise she made a two days journey from cool robin travelling by steamer from kooya and arriving in leichardt's town about five o'clock in the afternoon mr ferris hailed a cab at the wharf and escorted her to the bunyas honoria's spirits revived at the sight of the bustle around her and she was pleased with the appearance of the house the oleanders in front were still in bloom and the veranda was adorned with stands of choice ferns and caladiums the maid who opened the door looked surprised to see her mistress and upon being questioned said that she believed mr longleat was in the garden probably you have business in town said honoria haughtily dismissing her escort we shall see you at dinner i suppose mr ferris refused the curt invitation and departed to an hotel where he might at least alleviate his sense of mortification by brandy and soda water honoria entered the drawing-room threw off her hat and gloves and ordered tea with a lurking hope that chance might lead dyson maddox thither that afternoon the room had a look of late occupation it was large and tastefully furnished extending the width of the house and facing at the back a trim lawn and shrubbery shaded by a row of bamboos which separated the premier's grounds from the botanical gardens honoria turned over the books upon the table and with a view to her winter's campaign began planning a new arrangement of the furniture but this was dull work unaided and she walked out into the garden to search for her father the recollection of mr ferris's insinuations gave vent to her suspicions nevertheless it occasioned a disagreeable shock to her nerves to discover mr longleat seated on a bench in one of the shadiest alleys of the shrubbery side by side with a lady whom she instantly recognized as mrs valancy no suggestion is more repellent to a young girl's maidenly instinct than that of an equivocal love affair on the part of her father mrs valancy and mr longleat were sitting very close together and one slender black-gloved hand rested confidingly upon the premier's white linen coat-sleeve the expression of his face as it was bent in profile over his companion sent a qualm of disgust and repugnance through honoria's mind a fierce jealousy seized her frame and stiffened it to the coldness of ice she erected her crest and straightened her gait as she walked majestically across the lawn papa she said in silvery neutral tones when she had reached within a few paces of where they sat papa mrs valancy was a woman whose emotions were under strict control and beyond a slight suffusion of colour she showed no embarrassment mr longleat grew very red and looked annoyed i am afraid that i have startled you said honoria with an enunciation which contempt and anger rendered very distinct i have just arrived i have made up my mind to leave kooralbyn a few days sooner than i had at first intended and i knew that the house would be ready i hope that you are glad to see me papa 
i am always glad to see you my dear replied longleat recovering his composure and ashamed of himself for having felt guilty mrs valiancy i think you know my daughter the two ladies who were slightly acquainted shook hands always independent like and taking your own way eh oney he added with an awkward attempt at familiarity it isn't every young woman as ud have the liberty to come to town when she chose are you quite well my girl he said scrutinising her face with anxious pride somehow you seem to me as though you weren't quite up to the mark i am very well papa replied honoria in a chilling tone only a little tired with my journey i have ordered tea perhaps you will come into the drawing-room and have some she added turning to mrs valiancy i ought to be going home said the latter in her appealing way your father is so kind i was walking in the botanical gardens and he met me and persuaded me to come in and see his roses i have been asking him to explain the great political question and he is so good as to be interested in my partisanship though my husband is a renegade you must not judge either of us too harshly miss longleat it is a delightful surprise seeing you you are down for the winter i suppose that depends upon the progress of affairs replied honoria if the ministry is ousted we shall probably retire to the obscurity of cool robin i left janie with mrs ferris she added turning to her father i thought it wiser to do so in case of our beating a sudden retreat her effort at hilarity was caused by the appearance of maddox in the verandah he had called to see the premier and did not become aware of honoria's presence till he had crossed the lawn he bowed gravely to mrs valiancy shook hands with miss longleat and nodded to his colleague for the first time in his society an uncomfortable shyness took possession of honoria she hurriedly proposed that they should go within doors and when they were in the drawing-room poured out the tea handed cream and sugar and fruit and talked volubly with a little caustic flavouring to her speech which puzzled mrs valiancy and afforded honoria herself the zest of dramatising presently mrs valiancy rose and mr longleat offered to accompany her to the ferry thus dyson and honoria were left alone what is that woman doing here she asked turning fiercely upon him as though he were responsible for mrs valiancy's presence i am sorry to see that she and your father have become friends he answered quietly you know some evil of her continued honoria she is in an unfortunate position her husband is a brute and treats her unkindly she has the reputation of being a coquette men speak lightly of her and she is avoided by nice-minded women that is sufficient reason why you should not be allowed to drift into an intimacy with her you need not fear that i shall ever be friendly with her i detest those eyes at once shallow and deep and that air of injured innocence which is only a mask to attract pity and admiration a woman can always read a woman she is false to the core i had rather be a murderess than a hypocrite to my real self it was on her account then on my father's that you advised me to come down i am not afraid but thank you that was like you i did not know you in your letter it was so cold so it would grieve me deeply if you ceased to to be interested in me i can never cease to be interested in you said maddox but it is wiser for me that i should shun you i think that i understand you better than you do yourself he added with bitterness you would like me to become your lap-dog again you want me to be your slave but you reject me as your lover i cannot submit to the one position i will not strive for the other a man who tries to force the affection of a woman is contemptible perhaps after all fidelity is an overrated virtue i want to cure myself if you have the nobility which i fancy you possess you will help me or you will own that you love me and put me out of my suspense honoria sat still with her eyes upon the ground then suddenly she looked up and caught his gaze its very ardour quenched her dawning affection and his appearance was rough his coat ill-made and by reason of his useless arm put on awry involuntarily she shook her head her thoughts were reflected in her face and he read them plainly enough 
i am not polished enough for you he said no that is true i am not of the kind from which you will choose your husband good-bye honoria he said in a husky voice look to me if you need a friend but do not expect that i shall be an acquaintance i came thinking that your father would be alone to talk over a political matter but it is of no great consequence and i will not wait perhaps you will kindly tell him that i will call at the treasury before the meeting of the executive to-morrow honoria uttered a faint assent and he left her when she was alone she threw herself upon the sofa and burst into an hysterical fit of weeping mr longleat entering a short time later found her sitting in a dejected attitude by the window she had not heard him return and he was able to perceive the traces of tears upon her cheeks his heart yearned towards her and yet he scarcely knew how to accost her this delicate piece of human mechanism which was his own but not of him of which he was so proud yet hardly dared to touch he went up behind her and laid his large rough hand awkwardly upon her shoulder she shrank and turned her face away honey my girl said longleat i thought you looked out of sorts as though you had been crying like honorio twitched her body petulantly and his hand fell i am quite well she answered a little tired that's all you did not used to be tired with a journey from kooralbyn continued longleat wounded yet persistent there's something troubling you my dear it's not your way i know to speak of what is in your mind you are one of the proud reserved sort as i've liked you to be a girl like you should keep her dignity and not let those that are beneath her into her confidence but i'd be sore indeed if you kept a grief from me what's nearer than father and daughter and were that to each other nothing can alter it i think it might be better for us both if we talked more openly to one another it'd be better for me a man needs sympathy sometimes i've got a queer feeling on me i'm a bit of a fatalist something that's written up above is going to happen and i want to keep hold on you it seems as if for all you've been to me we had never been companions like there hasn't been that confidence between us that i'd have wished let us stick together honey let us try to cotton with each other at any other time the appeal would have touched a responsive chord but the distasteful thought of his friendship for mrs valancy produced a feeling of revulsion and honoria's dissatisfaction made her ungracious i have always told you everything of importance to us both she said perversely and there is nothing on my mind now and you have got friends there is mrs valancy i did not expect to find her here to-day i am told that you are very intimate with her yes i have got to know her replied mr longleat deliberately i have got to like her ladies are not much in my line but she understands me she is soft and clever and winning and she is not too fine to talk to a rough old man like me and i am sorry for her she is unhappily married she has got a hard life poor thing i i'd be glad honoria if you would make friends with her and ask her to come and see you sometimes honoria's eyes flashed in wrath mrs valancy will appreciate your consolation more than she will mine answered the girl with a jarring laugh no i cannot be her friend she is not a woman whom i could ever like or respect papa you will not force her companionship upon me i see women are as hard as the devil to each other said longleat bitterly i'll not force any one upon you whom you dislike but i shall make friends with whom i please he moved away from his daughter with the feeling that they had taken opposite sides and that it behooved him to defend his own the request which he had made had been prompted by a hardly defined instinct of right by placing mrs valancy beneath the aegis of his daughter's friendship he hoped to secure himself against the possibility of dishonourable intent honoria's unexpected arrival in leichardt's town had caused a reaction from his late unwholesome excitement 
as he had walked home from the ferry he had almost succeeded in convincing himself that his attraction towards mrs valiancy had arisen from a natural longing for feminine sympathy and that having found this in the society of his daughter he must of necessity attach less significance to the emotion which those half-stolen interviews in mrs valiancy's dim drawing-room had produced in his frame yet in his moments of deepest infatuation he had not admitted the existence of guilty feeling a man drifting towards passionate admiration of a married woman does not readily own to an unlawful attraction it takes the name of friendship pity congeniality of taste anything but love i'll do as i please he repeated i've a right to choose my own friends and if they don't suit you honey we must keep apart you have been educated different to me and we don't think alike i am not complaining of that it is what i meant all along my heart has been so set on your being a lady that i would not have had you like myself that has been my pride i hated the aristocrats i hated their caste prejudices their laws made for the rich and not for the poor their cant and hypocrisy their snivelling contempt for honest independent men i wanted to show them that my daughter the daughter of a bullock driver could be as delicate and as fine as their own it might have been happier for me if i had let you grow up rough like maggie lamb but whether or no i would not change you there's plenty of money spend it and make yourself happy buy as many gowns and trinkets as you like and hold up your head so that every one shall envy you as i said before there hasn't been much companionship between us and perhaps it was not to be expected it has come upon me lately this feeling of loneliness there is not much satisfaction after all in riches and power papa said honoria in a choked voice i would have been more to you if i could you have not brought me up to take a deep interest in your occupations or to understand your thoughts that's where it is i wanted to make a lady of you i wanted the whole of leichardt's land to say there's thomas longleat's daughter fit to be a duchess i have kept you apart from me on purpose i have done it for your good and for my pleasure and i am not grumbling at my own work there has always been love between us honoria i am certain of that but where there is no confidence love is apt to die out it would cut me to the heart if you were to grow ashamed of my rough ways or to go again me papa cried honoria you speak very strangely i don't want to go against you i am very grateful for all that you have done for me you know that i am most anxious for your political success i have wished to make you happy ay ay i am not complaining of you said longleat i only said that i felt lonely like you shook my hand off your shoulder just now if things came out again me you would not take my rough old head and lay it there where you could not bear my hand to rest you are a fair-weather child and i have reared you so it's all success that tells with you i have got a queer longing on me a man needs more in life than only to be proud of his own perhaps if janey's mother had lived i should not have felt so she would a made it up to me you never mention your first wife said honoria in a stifled way her filial sentiment was not great she did not remember her mother and had a vague notion that it was better not to talk of her yet in some inexplicable way she resented the slight to her memory implied by longleat's frequent allusions to her successor longleat reddened consciously poor sarah he muttered i married her at the diggings she wasn't my sort she had fine ways she had some education she was a london girl she there do not talk of her you never knew her you had best let her alone at any rate i am her daughter said honoria you do me an 
injustice she added hysterically and left the room her eyes swimming in tears honey honey longleat called after her despairingly but she did not return she had her cry out in her own chamber then stiffened herself with an air of reserve so that when she sat down to dinner with her father she met his tentative advances with cold incomprehension and discussed the political prospects with as much calm interest as though no tender spot had been touched in her heart the premier was in an excited mood contrary to his usual custom he drank several glasses of wine rapidly one after the other scarcely eating but talking volubly the townspeople are shouting that the government is in a bad way he said middleton and his party are chuckling in their sleeves but he who laughs longest laughs most the floods out west have kept five of our men from getting down if they don't arrive in time the opposition will have a good chance of ousting us but i mean fighting and if stonewalling tactics will tide me over by george i'll use them honoria asked pointed questions which showed her appreciation of the situation yet with all her interest was mingled a half contempt for what she considered the pettiness of the object what did it matter after all whether longleat or middleton were in power you don't seem to get the steam up said her father you will be as excited as any of them when the house meets mind you i am not saying that we shall not be beaten this time but i'll let you into a secret there's another shot in my locker i have set my heart on coming out winner the premier of leichardt's lands is a big man in the colonies now but he will be a bigger man yet before he has done he rose from the table and shook his great shoulders i feel hot and out of sorts he said i think that i will take a stroll down towards the gardens you will be going early to bed perhaps i shall turn into the club and see if dyson maddox is there i fancy that he wanted to talk to me this afternoon honoria delivered the message that dyson had left were you surprised to hear that he was minister for lands no she replied he is the most likely man you could have chosen i think you have done wisely he has a good head upon his shoulders the time may come when he will step into my shoes honoria i had counted upon your being the premier's wife it has been a bitter disappointment to me that you have made up your mind again him perhaps you will think different by and by no she exclaimed defiantly i shall never think differently the premier looked at her wistfully and took up his hat good-night my dear he went out and walked down the street his white linen clothes making him a conspicuous object in the half-light it was one of honoria's grievances that he did not as a rule change his apparel for dinner she watched him from the dining-room windows as in her jealous misgiving she had thought probable he passed the turning that led to the club and went on towards the ferry then was lost to sight beneath the shadow of the bamboos the girl smiled grimly and uneasily she was ashamed of the suspicion yet was half ready to believe that he was on his way to visit mrs valancy and had the miserable conviction that her power was failing her on all sides in truth when he had left the bunyas longleat had no fixed bent for his footsteps they had turned unconsciously towards the river and as the boat was lying at the ferry steps he got into it he was the only passenger and the boatman pettit was loquacious as usual it were a bad thing for folks as could not walk steady to live at emu point valancy had had a close shave of falling in not an hour since not but what a ducking had been like to sober him and lord how he swore at the premier he warn't ga goin to let him carry his railway he'd be damned if the government stopped in a week after parliament opened longleat boiled with indignation he reflected upon a promise he had made the day before and of a proposition which he meant to bring forward in the cabinet on the morrow 
was this the creature for whom he was about to imperil his political reputation then he pictured the drunken husband's return his probable ill-treatment of the beautiful injured wife longleat bethought him of her words if only there were some place even so far north to which he could be sent gundaroo presented obvious advantages the premier loitered about the point for half an hour or more not daring to approach the valancy's cottage too closely but keeping a keen watch upon the light which flickered in the windows of the drawing-room a friend met him and cried hello longleat what brings you over here longleat stammered an incoherent remark upon the heat of the night and the pleasant breeze that always blew upon this side of the water then with a guilty feeling weighing upon him retraced his steps End of chapter 13chapter fourteen of policy and passion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org policy and passion by rosa campbell prayed chapter fourteen the coup d'etat upon the third of march the parliament of leichardt's land was formally reopened the day was cloudless and the city wore its most gala aspect flags waved everywhere they floated from the gates leading to government house from the steamers at anchor in the river from the shops in king street and the roof of the assembly chambers by eleven o'clock a great crowd had collected before the entrance to the legislative buildings and groaned or cheered as the various ministers the oppositionists and officials walked in upon each side of the steps the volunteers were drawn up in line the band played, and one by one carriages drove up and deposited their occupants, mostly ladies in bright apparel, carrying gay parasols. There was a press forward as Lady Georgina Augmering, the governor's wife, descended from her barouche, and was ushered with becoming formality to a seat upon the dais. She was a handsome, dark-haired old lady, with an artificial smile and a gracious address, who always wore fine black lace and heavy silks and brilliant diamond rings, and who had a firm belief in her sacred mission as the feminine regenerator of colonial manners. Shortly after her arrival, the band struck up God Save the Queen, the cannons by the riverside boomed a salute, the cheering redoubled, and Governor Augmering, a short, rubicund individual, who liked his joke, was a bon vivant, and inspired no particular awe, and who upon this occasion was dressed in a tight-buttoned blue uniform and a plumed hat, was met by the President, the officials, and the members, and duly conducted to his throne. There ensued a little buzz, during which the ladies arranged their dresses, and the Governor surveyed the scene below him. The chamber was long and lofty, with a gallery extending along its sides, and was furnished with carved, morocco-covered benches and a massive table. Upon a raised, crimson-carpeted dais, at one end, sat his excellency in state flanked by the representatives of the naval and military elements in leichardt's land a few steps below him was lady georgina smiling blandly around and on a level with her the chief justice and the president of the council in their robes dyson maddox in his capacity of minister of the upper house occupied a seat at the head of the peeresses benches filled with well-dressed ladies among whom miss longleat and miss valancy were notably conspicuous the premier's daughter was all in white, and wore a bouquet of rare lilies at her bosom. Mrs. Valancy in black, with artistic touches of yellow here and there, and a maréchal Neil rose pinned into the lace at her neck, cast rapid glances in the direction of the bar, where the members of the lower house would presently appear. The message was sent, the speech read, the railway and loan bill commented upon, the policy of the government expounded. Then the flutter recommenced, the governor left the house, the ladies smiled and nodded, and the opening scene of the political drama was over. It was a farcical performance, but it involved important issues for the premier and his party. The four missing members, who represented the government majority, had not arrived. Miss Longleat was pale and appeared agitated. A golden serpent, which she wore coiled round her neck, rose and fell with the undulations of her breath. She resolutely looked away from Dyson, who sat almost opposite her. Lady Georgina Augmering addressed her kindly, and held her hand in token of affectionate welcome. 
the premier's daughter was a favorite with the viceregal party but mrs valancy's timid bow met with a chill reception mr middleton the leader of the opposition a lean wiry man with a bleared eye and saturnine countenance came up and shook hands with her he looked disagreeably triumphant longleat appeared dogged and flushed mrs valancy met his eye and gave him a smile of understanding he will accept she whispered breathlessly when chance threw them for a moment together oh how can i thank you there is no need to thank me he returned in a low tone i have done it for you an interesting debate was expected that afternoon honoria took her place in the ladies gallery of the assembly chamber mrs valancy was there also but the women did not speak to each other honoria was haughty and white from repressed excitement mrs valancy looked nervous and elated certain formal routine business was gone through and an address of congratulation upon a recent felicitous royal event was moved by a member of the government and after some sparring which sufficiently betrayed the belligerent tendencies of the opposition finally carried the answering address to the governor's speech was brought forward by a bearded squatter whose powers of oratory had been hitherto exercised in haranguing his shearers and who wandering in a circle round the central point of his discourse videcellet that the late tin discoveries had been highly conducive to the prosperity of the colony and that the time for railway extension had now arrived and taking a generally optimist view of the position announced that the proposals of the government were in all respects satisfactory to the legislative assembly cries of no no from the opposition benches adding that he had not the least doubt of the benefit which would accrue to the colony from the formation of a railway between leichardt's town and kuya and the opening up of easy communication with the premier's station sarcastically interrupted a member of the opposition whereupon there was a call to order upon which another member got upon his legs and there ensued a wordy and irregular combat in the course of which the member for east warrawarra denounced the member for North Caramburra as an obstructive monomaniac, who had so bullied and browbeaten the chairman of the commission, which had been called to inquire into the expediency of a railway, that the result of the commission had been most unsatisfactory. In fact, the honourable member for North Caramburra had shown a dishonourable desire to burke the whole proceedings of the commission. The honourable member for North Caramburra, hotly, Mr. Speaker, is the term burke parliamentary? It is the name of a man, a murderer, rejoined an occupant of the cross benches. The member for North Caramburra. Mr. Speaker, I must state emphatically that what the honorable member for East Warrawarra alleges against me is a base fabrication. Further cries of order. The speaker expressed his opinion that it would be wise if honorable members would avoid personal allusions, and that it might also be well to allow the honourable member to proceed and to answer him afterwards. Here was raised the question of privilege, and there ensued a somewhat disorderly expression of opinion on the part of the browbeaten member, which was sufficiently uninteresting to the gallery, but which was followed by a vigorous onslaught on the part of the leader of the opposition, who moved as an amendment that the proposals of the government in connection with public works are eminently unsatisfactory to this House, a motion tantamount to withdrawal of confidence. The government tactics consisted in talking against time, the young recruits skirmishing lightly, the great guns reserving themselves for heavier work, in the hope that the laggard reinforcements might shortly appear, while the opposition was eager to hurry matters to a crisis and provoke a division that must result in ministerial defeat. In the gallery the wives of the anti-railwayist faction were decorously triumphant. The ladies on the government side looked crestfallen and mutually sympathetic yet each hugged the comforting reflection that her lord might assist in a coalition ministry. To Miss Longleat alone the defeat would be absolutely crushing. She was sitting apart at the lower end of the gallery, while two government clerks upon the other side of the partition were discussing the situation, unaware that their remarks reached her ears. Said one, "'It is likely that there will be an appeal to the country.' "'Very improbable,' returned the other." Longleat must put on considerable pressure to induce the governor to sanction it. Old Augmering's time is nearly up, and he is in mortal terror of doing anything unconstitutional. Longleat has the pluck of the devil, was the reply. Whatever comes of the debate, I'll back him to win in the long run. I can tell by the very expression of his face that he has a charge in reserve. Depend upon it, Parliament will be dissolved. Have you seen the evening's gazette? 
This Gundaroo appointment will go against him. It looks like a bribe, yet the fellow's not worth buying. What can have induced him to give it to Valancy? The other shrugged his shoulders. There's a woman at the bottom of it. It is convenient sometimes to get a husband out of the way. Presently, Dyson Maddox, whose operations in the council had been short, came in to hear the debate and gained admittance to the ladies' gallery. He had watched Honoria's face with its expression of pained perplexity till he could not resist coming to her. It seemed to him that she had cast upon him a look of dumb appeal, and he obeyed the summons and took his seat beside her. "'I hear,' she said hoarsely, "'that the police magistracy of Gundaroo has been given to Mr. Valancy. Is it true?' "'It is in the evening's gazette,' replied Dyson. "'Why have you allowed this?' cried Honoria, passionately. "'You are in the ministry. Surely you had a voice in the matter.' "'I am truly sorry,' replied Dyson. "'You must know that it was done in opposition to my wishes. Your father made it a personal question. But I ought not to discuss cabinet matters, even with you.' "'The appointment will tell fearfully against you,' exclaimed Honoria. "'Undoubtedly. Middleton will handle it presently. We are prepared for unpleasant language.' "'Oh, I am sick of this!' cried Honoria. "'They say that he has done it for her sake. "'It is hateful, degrading. "'I will go back to Coralbin,' she added suddenly. "'We shall be beaten. Why should I stay? "'Papa said the other day that I was a fair-weather child. "'I will justify his opinion. "'He has forsaken me. Let him stay with Mrs. Valancy. "'I will return to Janey. "'And now I am going home.' "'Dyson was touched with deep pity for her evident despondency.' His very compassion forced him to place a restraint upon his speech, and made him appear cold. He escorted her to the bunyas, but refused her timidly given invitation to enter. She ate her dinner alone, then returned to the house, and sat listening to the speeches till midnight. The galleries were now fuller than ever. Opposite her the mob jostled each other, and the speaker's anteroom was crowded with gentlemen who watched her eagerly as she took her place behind the railings, not so high but that her face could be plainly seen. Beneath her, at the head of the ministerial bench, her father sat, his arms folded, his eyes downcast, his face sullen. Dyson was now sitting below the bar. The interest had become intense. There were no loungers strolling in from the smoking and refreshment rooms. The sergeant-at-arms looked more alert than usual. The speaker leaned forward over his desk and listened excitedly, yet the subject matter of the debate was of no state importance. The leader of the opposition was still speaking. The Gundaroo appointment was commented upon in terms far from complimentary to the Premier. An undercurrent of disgraceful insinuation ran through the discussion. Honoria's cheeks burned, and Mrs. Valancy was rigid, braving shame to avoid suspense. Longleat sat still with a look of dogged obstinacy upon his face, and did not raise his head till a direct charge was levelled against his honour, when he got up and fiercely denied the allegation against him. There followed a copious interchange of personalities, and Honoria blushed deeper. Why did her father descend to such scurrility? This petty warfare was degrading him. There was about the premier tonight none of that rugged eloquence and manly determination which had compelled her approval, even when she had winced at the misapplication of an aspirate. Mr. Middleton stood with outstretched finger pointed towards the object of his attack, pouring forth a torrent of invective, which was enhanced in disagreeable reference by the gestures with which it was accompanied. He could descend to any vituperation which did not exceed the limits of parliamentary language. There were cries of, Order! Order! But still the rush of eloquence suffered no check. He knew his adversary's weak point, and would not let his advantage slip. What had been the honourable member's meaning when he had declared upon the boards of that house that he had never given away a billet from personal or interested motives? How could he justify it to his colleagues and his antagonists, this perversion of his oft-vaunted political morality, etc., etc.? At last, Honoria felt that she could bear no more. She went home and dreamed miserably of defeat, but the debate continued all night, and grey morning crept in upon the combatants as they nodded upon their benches, or took it by turns to retire for rest and refreshment, always careful to preserve a quorum. Except from her point of observation in the ladies' gallery, Honoria saw nothing of her father for the next three days. He fought bravely when his turn came, shaking himself like a lion and speaking till exhaustion compelled him to cease, even drawing one convert to the government side by the rough oratory that seldom entirely failed its mark. 
but the ministry was doomed. Upon the third night the debate was brought to a conclusion. The House divided sixteen to thirteen, and the opposition carried the amendment by a majority of three. It was confidently expected that the Gazette Extraordinary would announce the resignation of the ministry. There were public meetings of both factions. A violent demonstration took place in the Premier's favour, and a counter-procession of anti-railwayists solemnly burned his effigy before his own windows. There were conferences of the Cabinet, and rushings to and fro between the public offices and Government House. A few days later, the Gazette announced that His Excellency the Governor, with the advice of his Executive Council, would be pleased to prorogue the Parliament of Leichardt's Land, now assembled prior to its dissolution. A sudden blankness fell upon the capital. The late members rushed back to their constituencies to canvass for the new election, and Honoria, oppressed by a strange weariness and indifference, returned to Coralbin. End of chapter 14「Chapter fifteen of Policy and Passion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Policy and Passion by Rosa Campbell Preed. Chapter fifteen. The Dryad of the Tie Tree. Down by the creek, deep in the umbrageous shadow of fern and cedar, Barrington first saw Honoria. He was driving over from Daraba alone and was skirting the river bank in the half admitted hope of meeting Angela. He was not aware that Miss Longleat had returned from Lakehart's town, and it was with joyful surprise that he recognized in a secluded bend of the creek, a little below the crossing, the original of Angela's sketch. Honoria was sitting upon the horizontal branch of a tie tree, her back resting against the trunk, her feet almost touching the water, as it glided over a bed of stones its melodious murmuring deafening the sound of voice or footfall, into a deep pool hemmed in by ferny banks. A book lay upon her lap, a cluster of the crimson bottle-brush flowers of the tie-tree swayed above her head, a sunbeam striking upon the coils of her hair made them look like ropes of reddish gold. The quivering leaves cast delicate shadows upon her white-clad shoulders and round white throat and the water gurgled against one smooth arm which, with its muslin sleeve rolled carelessly above the elbow, drooped lightly into the stream, and made a resistance to the shallow current. A kangaroo hound, lying on the ground beside her, barked loudly at the sight of a stranger. "'Quiet, Dura!' exclaimed Honoria, as she lifted her full eyes from her book, a yellow-backed tome from the select library of fiction, and turned them aimlessly upon the opposite bank but an intervening log with fresh sprouts forming a natural hedge above its naked trunk hid Barrington from her view. She resumed her reading for a few moments, then threw down the volume and said aloud, "'Starch, sentiment, and twaddle. It is like a sidlitz powder flavoured with sugar. Oh, how tired I am of these novels! Come, Dura, we had better go home. What is the matter with you now?' Honoria rose, and looking straight across the creek, met Barrington's gaze of critical admiration. She coloured slightly and bowed, not at all puzzled as to his identity. She had heard him described by the Pharisees. Aunt Penelope in especial had been eloquent in her raptures, and, making allowance for slight hyperbole, Honoria was obliged to confess that she had painted with tolerable accuracy. Here was a promising opening for a drama, in which the hero would undoubtedly possess the outward essential attributes of his position, and might readily be classed above that social and intellectual standard implied by the term interesting. Barrington crossed the little strip of water which separated them, and hat in hand, dismounted and approached Miss Longleat. Honoria looked at him with her wide open eyes, their expression combining the innocence of a child with the fearlessness of an animal. The dog still barked loudly. Be quiet, Dura, said she again, laying her shapely fingers upon its neck. Barrington was keenly sensible to harmony of circumstance and surroundings. This divine creature appeared to advantage against a background of foliage and plain. Her beauty, viewed under present conditions, excited a far more warm emotion than it could have aroused had he made her acquaintance in a European or Australian ballroom. He was a worshipper of female loveliness, but clearly this dryad of the tie-tree represented no type with which he had as yet come into contact. 
The region might be classical, and he a new Arcus. "'I beg your pardon for disturbing you,' he said. "'I believe that the regular crossing place is higher up the river. "'But I am not yet bushman enough to be able to make landmarks of ridges and gullies. "'Lady Dolph Bassett advised me to follow the watercourse. "'I think that I have the honour of speaking to Miss Longleat.' "'Honoria signified assent. "'I had the pleasure of staying for a fortnight at Kurabin some little time ago,' continued Barrington. "'I regretted much that both you and your father were in Leichhardt's town. "'I felt a wish to make myself known to Mr. Longleat and my friend Lord Dolph Bassett, "'who is better acquainted with Australian customs than I, who am a stranger, "'assured me that I should be welcome a second time. "'May I introduce myself? My name is Barrington.' Honoria bowed and smiled. Barrington's impression of her manner was that it blended in a curious degree dignity and seductiveness. "'Lord Dolph's friends are always welcome,' she said, "'and we are glad to see you for your own sake. Mrs. Ferris has told me of you. I have not been long at Coralbin. My father is unfortunately still in town, but Aunt Penelope will be charmed. I am just going to walk home. The house is no distance from here, and if you like I will show you the way.' "'Come, Dura.' "'You have dropped your book,' said Barrington, picking up the yellow-backed volume she had been reading. "'I am not surprised that you choose the riverbed for your study. I am in love with the beauty of Australian creeks.' "'When I last came over from Dairaba, I met Miss Ferris at the crossing, and she too was carrying a book. "'Oh, Angelus, it's dreaming over poetry for hours. I only read because it is less tedious than contemplating the gum-trees.' "'As for that stupid story, pray do not trouble yourself about it. "'It is of very little consequence what becomes of it. "'A stockman might have found it, "'and it would certainly have amused him more than it has amused me. "'Novels are all alike. "'They are false and unnatural. "'I like plays better. "'They, at any rate, are real as far as they go. "'I am surprised that you, a colonial, "'should complain of the artificiality of existence,' "'said Barrington, after a short pause.' during which they had clambered up the bank and gained the plain. Australian life strikes me as being so very realistic. I should not have imagined that you would be blasé. Do not call me a colonial, said Honoria, with pretty petulance. When you have lived longer in Australia, you will know that you could not pay a young lady a worse compliment. I accept the rebuke, said Barrington, laughing, though I don't in the least know how I have deserved it. To be colonial is to talk Australian slang, to be badly dressed, vulgar, everything that is abominable, replied Honoria with grave simplicity. At least, that is the general opinion. I have seen the English women who talk slang, only in a different way. Nevertheless, we all try to imitate them, just as we copy Paris models for our gowns. You will see that it is the fashion out here to be as British as possible. Our loyalty ought to flatter your national vanity. "'You have lately come from England, have you not?' "'Yes,' replied Barrington. "'In technical language, I am a new chum. "'And do you relish what you call the realism of Australia?' "'It is hardly fair to catechize me "'when as yet I have seen no part of the colony "'but the Koorong district.' "'Do you like it so far? "'Do you find the people better or worse than you expected?' "'You have been staying at Dairaba. "'How do you like Lady Dolph Bassett?' She is a fair specimen, I suppose, of an Australian, as she has never been out of Leichhardt's land in her life. I imagine that one likes or dislikes a woman in proportion to the amount of interest she excites in one's mind, answered Barrington. Lady Dolph does not affect me in the least. Honoria uttered a little laugh. It seems to me, she said, that everybody and everything might be classed under two headings, that which interests and that which bores. The fault which I have to find with persons in general is that they don't stimulate my curiosity. I am perpetually trying to make believe that I am amused and cannot succeed. You are easily bored, then? Honoria approved of his air of repressed inquiry, which conveyed a veiled complimentary reference to her own particular disposition. I am afraid that I don't know enough of the world to define boredom. I am always fancying that we Australians are like children playing at being grown up. It is in Europe that people live. She paused abruptly. Barrington smiled. I thought so when I first left it. I do not now. Australia is less odious, then, than you imagined? 
australia is delightful there is a thoroughness about it which pleases me immensely a few refining touches and there would be nothing to desire all that is lacking are traditional influences and they will come in time but do you not see everything with us is borrowed we cannot be original we cannot even set up an independent government we must copy old world forms and we have nothing of what makes the charm of the old world our range of view is so limited we are so ignorant of life and ignorant people cannot put out feelers either deeply or widely i think that you do yourself an injustice as a representative of young australia said barrington the very longing for experience implies a large capacity for sensation i feel sure that is your case honoria looked at him eagerly she was longing to hear further analysis of herself but was too proud to put a leading question or remark to one so nearly a stranger barrington saw that he had made an impression and wisely left it to deepen they had reached the slip rails he let them down and they walked towards the house almost without speaking upon the fence the purple passion fruit were still hanging mrs ferris poked her becapped head over the window of her cottage and bestowed a warm welcome upon her guest she could not speak too highly of mr barrington janey ran out and clung to honoria's skirts and angela who had been sitting in one of the squatter's chairs in the veranda gazing dreamily towards the mountain approached and with a joyful smile gave him her hand who can tell in what subtle harmonies the inner chords of maidenly consciousness first vibrate at the touch of love since barrington's departure from kurilbin waking or sleeping the thought of him had been ever present in angela's mind a dreamy sense of happiness seemed like an odour to pervade life nature and art spoke to her in new tones poetry was no longer mere passionless elevation of the soul music appealed to a deep-seated longing the clouds kissing the mountains the breeze stirring the leaves the flowers bending towards each other on the plain awakened thrills of sweet comprehension the world contained a new element that of love yet though she felt the influence of this dreamy languor half pleasurable half painful she did not attribute it to its rightful source and greeted the englishman with all the frankness of innocent maidenhood mr ferris was seated in the parlour in absorbed contemplation of a rural scene in water-colours which he had propped upon a table before him this is my little hour of recreation after a day devoted to unlovely detail he said shaking hands with mr barrington i am glad that you have arrived at this moment to see my little gem in so perfect a light there is atmosphere for you you breathe it it encompasses you a hayfield but what a hayfield you sniff the dry grass the breeze bears the scent to your nostrils it is english it is rural it is idyllic it has such a nice feeling barrington looking over the old man's shoulder was more interested in observing the effect of a sunbeam that shone through the grape leaves with which the veranda was tapestried and cast a reddish glow upon miss longleat's head and face deepening the shadows of brow and eyelash and blending her colouring into a richness of tint that reminded him of one of raphael's madonnas even mr ferris glancing up suddenly regarded her with a purely artistic admiration which changed into snarling depreciation as she passed disdainfully into the garden you see how she despises me he whispered angrily she does not even fling at me as many words as she bestows upon her dog what am i in her estimation nothing but the fawning dependent of a rich father well the time may come we shall see we shall see mr ferris continued for a few moments to mutter wrathful but inaudible words as he stooped over his picture then relapsed into a fit of morose silence and barrington walked out into the garden attracted by the flutter of muslin drapery beneath the orange trees where the two girls with janey were sitting End of chapter fifteen read by celine major chapter sixteen of policy and passion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Policy and Passion by Rosa Campbell Preed Chapter 16 Barrington and Honoria Honoria was mutely wondering when an opportunity would occur for approaching the subject of her idiosyncrasies upon which Barrington had so lightly touched. The Englishman had impressed her fancy. After all, had Dyson Maddox but known the fact, it needed nothing so very heroic in quality to enchain her interest. Only a refined address, the prestige of aristocratic connections, a dexterous knack of handling commonplace, and a persistent gaze which should be far removed from impertinent admiration. As Barrington stepped from the veranda towards her, she was ready to acknowledge that he was the most distinguished-looking person she had ever met. Janey was entreating Angela to tell her a story. The child despised her sister's nursery tales, which invariably dealt with Kakamaru, Mother Bunch, and such like commonplace bogies. But Angela had a delicious repertoire of fairy lore. There was a dim region beyond the Kurong Crag, mysterious now in the gathering twilight, which was the paradise of water witches and flower elves, where dwelt the praying mantis, the high priest of the plain, the souls of the black piccaninnies, which had attained the dignity of storm spirits, and such like mythic creatures which furnished food for Angela's vivid imagination. While the child listened wonder-eyed, Honoria moved a few paces apart, and Barrington joining her, asked her the names of two peaks which rose on the horizon. They conversed smoothly upon generalities for a little while, discussed the scenery, the climate, the social characteristics of the Kurong, the habits of the aborigines, the signification of native words. Whilst he talked, Honoria abstractedly twisted round her fingers a serpent bracelet that she wore upon her wrist. It suddenly snapped and fell to the ground. Barrington gathered up the links and placed them in her hand. "'Talking of the blacks' language,' he said, looking at the ruby-scaled head with its diamond eyes, "'are your ornaments emblematic? I am told that Kuralbin means the abode of serpents.' "'Kuralbang is literally, I believe, dead serpents,' answered Honoria carelessly. "'I rather like the connection of ideas. There is something weird and uncanny in it.' Barrington looked at her fixedly and repeated. "'Upon her crest she wore a wannish fire.' sprinkled with stars, like Ariadne's tire. She colored slightly. Oh, everyone who reads or pretends to read Keats quotes Lamia to me. But I had rather you did not add to the number. I am sure that you cannot wish to be commonplace. There is a certain hackneyed phase of admiration which when applied to a particular object ceases to be commonplace, replied Barrington gallantly. Honoria laughed consciously, but she hesitated to meet his eyes. They affected her strangely. Suddenly she looked boldly up and began. You said something about me this afternoon, about my character, which made me think that perhaps you understood me. You see, said Barrington, that to be interesting involves the penalty of being sometimes the subject of speculation. I should not dislike being studied if, Honoria left her sentence unfinished. If you could be shown the cause of your vague dissatisfaction. Your life is faintly inharmonious, and you are conscious of a want which you can hardly express. Do you know why I am discontented? said Honoria dreamily. It is strange. I... She lifted her head and said with an effort at gaiety. When I know you better, I shall ask you to tell me the reason. It would be hardly fair to put you to the test so soon. I am ready to answer it, replied Barrington. Honoria turned and rejoined Angela. But what for did the storm spirits drown the poor butterfly? cried little Janie, the tears running down her cheeks. I'll never be sorry no more for the black piccaninnies that die. Little mother, I think your stories are best after all. Tell me, Janie, said Barrington, why do you call your sister little mother? "'My mamma is in heaven,' announced Janie gravely. "'She is big now that she has got wings, "'ever so much bigger than she used to be. "'You shouldn't talk, you should attend. "'Angela tells nice stories when they end well, "'and some things is true, ain't they?' "'added Janie reflectively. "'At that moment, a bell ringing within "'summoned them to dress for dinner. 
Barrington stood watching Honoria as she led Janie to the house, then turned to Angela, who had lingered to gather a flower. "'My little friend,' he said affectionately, "'you look paler than when I was here before. Are you quite well? Will you row me on the lagoon this evening?' Angela shook her head. "'I must go on the water no more at night. It has made me ill. Mrs. Ferris says that I must stay within. I should not have minded her, but my father has forbidden me also.' ill he repeated indeed i am sorry for that what is the matter oh it is nothing i am tired that is all i have a cough and my appetite is gone and i sleep badly but she added what difference does it make whether one is waking or sleeping if one has pleasant dreams and those the fairies always send me tell me she said taking his hand and looking earnestly into his face shall you love me less now that honoria has come jealous little puss he replied pressing her hand i shall always love you have we not made a compact that you are to be my little sister she did not answer but regarded him wistfully for a moment then gave him a little bouquet that she had arranged and went into the house during the evening barrington observed that angela was certainly paler and much more silent and dreamy than during his last visit the presence of miss longleat seemed to exercise a withering effect upon her bursts of innocent gaiety she resembled a flower which expands only in certain favoured spots sympathy of a subtle kind was necessary to her happiness and from her father alone did she appear to receive it mrs ferris's affections were principally engrossed by honoria and she had no deeper feeling than generally diffusive benevolence to bestow upon her stepdaughter the old man watched his darning anxiously. "'She caught a chill upon the lagoon and has been ailing ever since you left,' he remarked to Barrington. "'She is a delicate flower and needs the tenderest care.' It was not thought prudent that Angela should expose herself to the night breeze, and after dinner, instead of joining his guest with a cigar, Mr. Ferris remained within doors and devoted himself to his daughter's amusement honoria as was her wont passed out to the garden where upon the pretext of smoking barrington presently joined her do you object to my cigar he asked no she returned it has a nicer scent than those to which i am accustomed i am fortunate in not being required to tolerate the store tobacco is it true that english ladies smoke cigarettes certainly would you like to try one now no thank you we have not yet learned to imitate them in that respect and i do not know how far i may safely take you as my guide i don't think that mr trollope's heroines smoke and i am always told that they are patterns of english young ladies you see we australians are under a great disadvantage and it is rather difficult for us to decide between the morals of mr trollope and Ouida. barrington laughed he began to think that miss longleat had not much to learn they strolled down beneath the vine trellises honoria pausing every now and then to brush a rose with her lips or to pluck a blossom from above her head he was bewitched by the beauty of her figure as she lifted her arms she plucked some strawberry guavas and handed him a few of the red berries upon a leaf come she said let us eat our dessert by the lagoon with all my heart said barrington it would be a sin to spend such an evening as this within doors they walked to the lake and sat down beneath a mulberry tree that grew upon the bank if there were only a moon one could see the distant mountains distinctly said honoria how still and solemn it is she waved her hand towards the wide plain with its bosky border and dim background you can have nothing like this in europe barrington relit his cigar and puffed for a few moments in silence the night sounds deepened his sense of novelty every now and then there was a whinnying call from one horse to another the melancholy cries of the curlew and moorpork alternated with the gurgling note of the swamp peasant save their own voices there was no human utterance the shadowy solitude seemed infinite the surface of the lagoon brokenly reflected the stars overhead sirius shone resplendent and the southern cross dipped majestically behind the courant crag you must be very fond of this place said barrington i have not lived here much i was educated in sydney since i left school i have only passed a few months of each year at kooralbin 
I should not be here now had not the session ended so suddenly. You take a great interest in politics? I play at taking an interest in politics because there is nothing else to make my life exciting. And then, as you know, my father is the premier. Naturally, I am a part of his success or failure. But sometimes I am ashamed of my eagerness. I thought the whole thing farcical the other day when Parliament was opened. It never struck me in quite the same light before. I was horrified to think that I knew no better. You must feel as I do. You must look upon our statesmen as marionette figures dancing to a set tune. Isn't it so? Barrington laughed softly. You despise what is familiar. To me, life here has all the charm of novelty. Yes, that is true but it does not give me any comfort. Most people with cramped experience have no wish to enlarge their sphere of thought and action. I try to believe that I am unlike the rest of the world, our world. I dream that I shall be this or that in the future. I plan even for the morrow. I picture an existence in which I shall feel exquisite bliss or keen pain. I do not much care which, anything but vegetation." She threw her head back and, clasping her hands behind it, looked at him with bright, excited eyes. "'The poetic temperament has always an infusion of dissatisfaction,' said Barrington. "'You are tormented by an inward craving, which will give you no rest till it is appeased.' "'What must I do? I do not care much about the things I know, or the people with whom I am thrown. I want something altogether new.' I cannot endure to go continually over the same ground. Tell me how I can make myself contented. You must love, said Barrington deliberately. Honoria's eyes sank before his steady gaze, leveled from underneath his straight brows, and charged with communicable fire. She was half repelled, half fascinated, and shrank back against the tree. Don't, she cried, don't look at me so. It... It makes me afraid. Then she shook herself together and laughed, as though ashamed of her involuntary confession of weakness. You must not think that I mean everything that I say. I am a person of impulses. Sometimes I have an impulse to like, sometimes to detest. You recommend me to fall in love, to marry. Do you not think that you may be condemning me to a lifelong imprisonment within a narrow circle of domestic interests? Why must married life be necessarily vapid and domesticity commonplace? Why not rather an effective background for drama, in which the performers need not be limited to two? I am convinced that to make the most of life one must cultivate many-sidedness, feel with the emotive, see with the spiritual, analyze with the critical, glide rapidly from one sensation to the other, dipping, as it were, into every nature with which one is brought into contact and extracting a grain of enjoyment from each. To gain this end, one must have no strong individual aspirations, no special idiosyncrasy except a keen susceptibility. One's own destiny must be decided, and yours is still doubtful. Every woman is restless till she has probed the mysteries of womanhood. Perhaps you are right, said Honoria. I will think over your advice. You must have seen a great deal of the world and of the pleasant things in it. I am surprised that you should have wished to come out to Australia. Perhaps you don't intend to remain here. On the contrary, I have every intention of going through my course of colonial experience. There is one crime that is never pardoned in England, Miss Longleat. What is that? Poverty. But I have heard. Your brother is, is rich, is he not? asked Honoria naively. He would tell you that for his position he is a pauper. That has nothing to do with me. I suppose I ought to confess that I have run through a younger son's fortune. But a man must float with the tide in England. To catch far-off glimpses of my old life would have been to suffer the tortures of dives. So I have brought my modest competency to Australia, in the flattering hope that I may double it. Wealth is not of much account out here. Everyone works. A great many people are poor. I see there are advantages in a free country. So my mother thought, said Barrington. There was a tinge of bitterness in his voice which Honoria perceived. Your mother is in England, she said softly. I like hearing of other women, 
of English women especially. Do you mind talking of her? Will you tell me what she is like? She is très grande dame of a type you do not know, for it does not exist in Australia. Her fetish is the family glory, her hero, the eldest son. She is a rigid conventionalist, but you would never find it out, for she is soft as velvet. She dresses beautifully. Her face is like that of a Greek statue. She is passive in manner, yet her influence has the most extraordinary power upon everyone with whom she comes into contact. And is there anyone else? Have you any more ladies belonging to you? There is my sister-in-law, Lady Barrington. She is a London beauty, but piques herself upon being a devoted wife and mother. She talks the shibboleth of the great world, hunts after royalty, and might be sympathetic if she were not so brainless. Then there are half a score of cousins, none of whom would be the least interesting to you. He glided on to commonplace topics, talked of Paris and London, of Scotch scenery and trips to Norway, described Castle Barrington as it lay among the Yorkshire moors, and in a well-bred, unostentatious manner, made apparent his claims to social distinction. Honoria's egoistic temperament rarely permitted her to feel deeply interested in any conversation of which she was not directly or indirectly the subject, but to-night she forgot to speculate upon the impression she was making, so powerfully was her own fancy aroused. Yet there was something faintly uncomfortable in the effect which his long looks produced upon her nerves. She felt tremulously excited and uncertain of herself. At last she rose discomposedly and proposed that they should return within doors and persuade Angela to sing to them. Barrington slept in a little white curtained chamber in the Ferris's cottage. A white lily in a vase upon the dressing-table conjured up visions of the lagoon. He guessed that Angela had placed it there. The night seemed long. His slumber was broken, and he had vivid dreams. In the morning he awoke with an excited sense of pleasure at the thought of prosecuting a new experience. Although he was well aware of his extreme susceptibility to feminine attractions, he was yet surprised to find what a strong impression Honoria had made upon his imagination. She belongs to a new type, he said to himself as he dressed. I must study her. He had ample opportunity for so doing during the next few days, spent in lounging about the garden in picturesque walks by the river banks in tete a tete rides and long desultory conversations under such conditions attraction might be expected to ripen rapidly into intimacy honoria appeared to him to be a mass of contradictions one half of her nature was poetic the other material she was frank to boldness and ignorant without giving the impression of innocence so that he could not satisfy himself where her knowledge of the world began and where it ended. Often he thought her ardent, occasionally cold. All that he felt certain of was that she had an intense curiosity in all matters of sensation, and he was determined to see how far it would lead her. Underlying his speculations there was the distinct understanding that she was a prize, which, could he but win it, would enable him to remodel his career to his complete satisfaction. As Honoria Longleat's husband, life would be no longer barren. But she was just the sort of woman upon whom it was impossible to calculate with any degree of certainty. The spontaneity of her nature gave her continually new starting points. The very interest which she was confident of having inspired might, by a momentary caprice, turn to aversion. He had dabbled a little in science, as he had dipped into the philosophy of art and love and had bestowed considerable thought upon the reproduction of hereditary traits. "'It is inconceivable to me,' he said one day to Mr. Ferris, "'that a woman of rough parentage should show so many outward traces of refinement.' The old man chuckled malignly. "'Ah, I see of what you are thinking. It would ruffle your family prejudices if you were to impale the arms of a bullock driver upon the Barrington shield. Make your mind easy.' Where there is wealth, no one asks questions. Money gilds deeper stains than that of labor. But the blood runs thick. We shall see. You misunderstand me, replied Barrington. I looked at the subject merely from an abstract point of view. I think, he added thoughtfully, 
that there must be a strain of genius in miss longleat's nature which partly explains its manifold inconsistencies genius said mr ferris derisively you degrade the sacred title i said the strain of genius my dear sir there may be a strain of insanity which need not imply the necessity for confinement in a lunatic asylum i should more properly have termed it passionate intelligence dear heart said mrs ferris innocently mystified by the above dialogue which had taken place in her hearing i never noticed anything particularly clever about honoria i have always been thankful for my part that she was not born a genius they are poor creatures at the best of times and she is a fine strapping girl that it is a pleasure to see i am sure the way she has devoted herself to janie is just wonderful there is something noble about her that folks in general don't heed in spite of his eager attendance upon honoria barrington contrived to devote some time and thought to angela she was at this period much occupied with her painting and it was in her studio that her sweetest hours were passed thither he often followed her her love had given a fresh impetus to the prosecution of her art and her feverish excitement arising from a cause which she knew not how to define found relief in work she appeared more silent and self-engrossed than ever at the present time preferring solitude and musing to the buzz of companionship her fluctuations of innocent gaiety were less frequent than of old and the shadow which had always encompassed her seemed to have deepened into a mournful tenderness which even barrington's light caresses bestowed lavishly as upon a lovely child hardly dissipated he accepted her guileless affection as though it were a breath of that tender perfume of womanhood which was so necessary to his existence and if her wistful eyes mutely demanding something which he had not to give aroused a faint feeling of self-reproach in his mind it was speedily allayed by her unconscious acceptance of his fraternal attitude and her own childishness which seemed to place her beyond the pale of ceremonious restrictions it became a custom with barrington and honoria to spend every evening an hour or more by the banks of the lagoon the nights warm and still starlit and laden with the dewy scent of flowers were provocative of suggestive conversation in which thoughts and words flowed in unconventional channels and dangerous allusions were tentatively uttered and softened by that mingling of daring and tenderness which in the case of such men as barrington was calculated to exercise a powerful influence upon a woman of honoria's temperament yet she had sometimes a helpless sense of being dominated by an influence of which she had not rightly estimated the strength and felt a terrified longing for guidance in which her thoughts turned instinctively towards dyson maddox in her efforts at self-analysis she vainly asked herself why she who had hitherto accepted the adoration of her lovers with regal self-complacency should suddenly have become a prey to vague tremors and alternate fits of excitability and silent depression when either her spirits were at boiling pitch or a heavy load seemed laid upon her heart and her tears flowed readily whence had arisen these strange thrills which could not be exactly defined as either painful or pleasurable that sensuous intoxication succeeded by moments of horrible revulsion during which she hated both herself and him one evening when their talk had drifted from generalities to personal subjects barrington stooped suddenly and gathered one of the half-closed buds that floated upon the lagoon these lotus lilies he said remind me of a type of womanhood which i know passionate yet pure combining the frankness of innocence with the strongest susceptibility to the influence of love honoria took the lily from his hand and held it against her flushed face barrington went on you know whom i mean such a creature could only have had birth in a wild free atmosphere she belongs to woods and streams she is the classic nymph the essence of womanliness you are the ideal australia could i pay you a higher compliment i dislike flattery in some moods it irritates me and you always speak so strangely i never know how far i may place confidence in you to women who have trusted me i have always been loyal said barrington deliberately but i might turn the tables on you how far are you sincere with me what do i know for certain of your position it is said upon the courant that you are to marry your father's colleague mr maddox that is not true replied honoria gravely 
i am also told that you are a dangerous coquette that you lead men on to love you and then coldly reject them it is no crime in a man to be attractive why should a woman be denied the use of her only weapon you plead guilty then you are a coquette i confess to being fond of power said honoria you seem to tire easily of most things said barrington there must be a sameness in receiving perpetual adoration would it not be a change if you were to stoop a little and to love it would be a change certainly said honoria trying to speak without consciousness i do not think that it would be an agreeable one after this they were both silent she knew that his eyes were fixed upon her and though she would have given much for the power to lift her head and resolutely return his gaze she dared not do so she had a longing to rise and shake herself free from the fascination which was creeping over her and numbing her powers of resistance she trembled and was ashamed that he should see how she was moved her only safety seemed to lie in flight and she made confession of her weakness by leaving him End of chapter 16 Recorded by Céline Major Chapter 17 of Policy and Passion This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Policy and Passion by Rosa Campbell Preed Chapter 17 you'll get the crooked stick at last one morning while they were all lingering over the breakfast table there was a barking of dogs without a vigorous cracking of stock whips and presently lord and lady dolph bassett accompanied by cornelius cathcart dismounted at the gate how do you do honoria cried lady dolph in her good-humoured drawl how do you do mrs ferris oh no fear that we are not hungry why we started at six o'clock this morning i said to dolph that we should have to hit off pretty sharp if we wanted to be in time for breakfast we have come to see after our new chum oh there you are mr barrington and dolph has got some green notion in his head about a gully that is down by diaraba creek and that he wants to turn into a kind of rockery like the springs over here i say miss longleat it is no end of a stunner said lord dolph excitedly i always said that i should never be contented with diaraba till i had found as jolly a spot as the springs within half a mile of the head station but there's a gully behind jaff's peak that only wants some of that hoya and creeping stuff that grows over the rocks to make it perfect and i have brought over a pack-horse on purpose to take back roots you will let us ride out to the springs this afternoon i am very glad that you have come said honoria we have been planning an expedition to the koorong waterfalls to-morrow you will be able to get some plants there i was thinking of writing to ask you to come over i did send a note to mr maddox is he at barramunda she added turning to cathcart he was electioneering for sandy stewart at canuna yesterday replied the manager i dare say that he will get your note this evening and will ride over before breakfast to-morrow you have had a narrow escape from a parson continued mr cathcart as they all sat down to a relay of hot scones and boiling coffee which mrs ferris had promptly provided one of the army of the faithful turned up at barramunda a few days ago and held a service in the dining-room lord how he pitched into us for our ungodliness but when i explained to him that we had not had a black coat on the place for ten years he was forced to own that it was by god's mercy we were not greater sinners as our black boy remarked that fellow caban woola woola asterisk talks a great deal it was quite the case he told us that there was a mighty field for his labours on the koorong district anyhow he was well paid for each of the men had to fork up ten bob for his ghostly counsel how i detest that unctuous self-sufficient tribe which is so plentiful out here he started off to come to this station but bully dick who owed him a grudge led him into a bog and left him to his fate he was last seen splicing up his buggy wheels and vowing that the accident was a divine indication that there were no souls to be saved over there 
rather rough upon Kurlbin, eh mrs ferris indeed said aunt penelope i'd be glad to see a decent clergyman if the bishop would only send us one i'm not too clever to mind my religion as is the way with some people glancing maliciously at mr ferris who stroked his beard but what is the use of a little black shrimp that has not got an h in his head and can only tell us what we are all nigh to hell it's an insult to a body's understanding at luncheon the whole party with the exception of angela appeared prepared for the ride to the springs a picturesque ravine in the mountains later barrington sought the girl in her studio and found her with her palette untouched seated at the window wistful and unoccupied are you not coming with us angela he asked no she replied i'm not going either to-day or to-morrow i do not care for these foolish chattering people i will stay and occupy myself with my art and try to be happy do i not know what they call me i have heard lady dolph say that i have a shingle loose her laughter gives me a pain here touching her head and besides i want to be alone you shut yourself up too closely said barrington pressing her hand are you well dear child your flesh is hot and feverish and your voice weak oh yes i am well replied angela i only want to be alone i shall go down to the river and listen to the water murmuring and perhaps the spirits will come and talk to me and still my pain you must go they are calling you he lifted her hand to his lips and left her the rest of the party were mounted angela is working said mr ferris as he passed she is out of her element here it is better that she should be left to herself for the first few miles barrington rode beside lady dolph her husband with honoria mrs ferris who was always aggrieved if debarred from these expeditions wearing a voluminous grey habit and a mushroom hat tied beneath her chin was escorted by corny cathcart and the old man wrapped in poetic musings brought up the rear i am glad that you like barrington said lord dolph diplomatically to honoria i think myself that it is a pity he left england he has not been used to roughing it i am certain that australia will not suit him now i rather like the fun of blacking my own boots upon occasions what made mr barrington leave england asked honoria directly somewhat doubtful of hardress's plea of poverty lord dolph looked confused and evaded the question oh he has had his reasons i suppose some fellows like change he was in the lifeguards no end of a swell in london but a man needs a lot of money to keep up in these crack regiments and barrington is a younger son and has not got a brother like headington to fall back upon sir lionel is a beastly screw i say miss longleat barrington is better suited for office work than for the bush your father does not want a private secretary or a treasury clerk does he my father would not give a government post to any one who had not good claims upon the country he hates the suspicion of favouritism at least and honoria stammered and coloured you are thinking of valency's appointment what a deuce of a row the papers kicked up i never could see the reason of it myself i dare say that he is a very good fellow but it is a pity that he has the reputation of being such a brute do we stop here miss longleat had reined in her horse before a log hut situated in the bend of the creek only for a moment i want to say good-bye to granny deans before i go to leichardt's town i shall not have another opportunity sam deans will be out of prison next week i hear that he swears vengeance against the premier for getting him put into the lock-up shall i help you down mrs ferris no thank you replied the old lady i am not so fond of encouraging sammy deans as some folks are with a side glance at her husband and if i once got off my horse i should never get up again good day to you mrs deans she added kindly addressing a hard-featured woman who with her gown tucked up and a calico sunbonnet on her head was feeding a small family of chickens at the door and how are your poultry getting on whereupon there ensued a discussion anent the laying capabilities of spanish and dorking hens in which lord and lady dolph joined with deep interest miss longleat passed into the hut where in an inner chamber an old woman lay bedridden 
she was stretched upon a poorly furnished wooden settle her attenuated frame covered with a patchwork quilt myriads of flies buzzed among the limp mosquito curtains and a tin billy containing some cold tea stood on a small table by the bedside in an old kerosene tin by the open window bloomed a fine geranium and the wall was papered with leaves from the illustrated news i have come to bid you good-bye mother said honoria the old woman raised a yellow wrinkled face and extended a lean hand you are going to leichardt's town then well i am sorry for it is dull here since sam was sent to quad and her indicating by a glance the woman without has to look arter the stock no fear of her a-stealin any of your cattle but i don't bear no malice happen sam all do that when he comes out so you are goin among the fine folk now's your time to enjoy life you'll never be no younger you'll be dancing i suppose i dare say mrs deans i weren't brought up to dance said the old woman i were one of ten and a religious family and i were a good age when i come out to this country there's folks outside ain't there isn't mr maddox no replied honoria and she enumerated the party by name corny cathcart is sweet on you they say i don't think much of him but his snarl is war than his bite t'other's a new one happen a whippersnapper from england you'd be too good for he mind what i say and she laid her hand impressively upon honoria's arm don't you try to pick and choose if you do you'll get the crooked stick at last do you mind now yes mother but how is a girl to know ay how is a girl to know repeated granny deans reflectively there's some as takes you unawares like and some as grows upon you choose him as he has knowed you the longest and has loved you the truest i've heard that you are one to give men a heartache maybe your own all ache some day good-bye mother said honoria hurriedly i mustn't keep them waiting outside if sam will be civil to me i'll come and see you again when i am back from leichardt's town he meant no harm said the old woman sullenly if longleat had a left him alone he'd done no worse than brand a calf or two and was that to you that have got thousands but i can't answer for him now he has been in quad and the boy has died since they took him it'll drive him nigh wild to see little joey's grave happen it were old ferris and his grog and his shakespeare that's done the mischief take my advice and look sharp arter that old man he has led my sam astray and he has no love for you or for your father either the rest of the party had ridden slowly on but young mrs deans still feeding her poultry was conversing with barrington in a north english accent curiously blended with the australian drawl her aren't half a bad un after all said and done she was saying as honoria emerged from the hut her have got some feeling since longleat put sam into jail and the little un died her have come to see us and have brought mother flowers and wine and such like i used to think her one of the stuck-up sort as hadn't thought a thought but for bows but i ain't got not to say again her the riders resumed their way following the fringe of swamp oaks which marked the bed of the creek hanging branches of scented jasmine brushed their shoulders sometimes the river banks closed in steep and rocky sometimes broadened into a level pocket overgrown with bracken fir and blady grass sometimes the stream flowed in murmuring accompaniment to their talk sometimes the watercourse was shallow dry and stony now they were in a valley where sleek kine stood knee-deep in the rich pasturage and the she-oaks dropped their cones and the hills on each side crowned by a dark green belt of scrub rose higher and steeper so that though it was early in the afternoon of a march day they were in deep shade the country looked as lonely as though no human foot had ever trodden it every now and then the dogs would startle a covey of wild duck or a herd of unbroken horses would dart away into the fastnesses of the mountains prrr exclaimed lord dolph taking imaginary aim with the butt of his stock whip an implement which he always carried whether it was likely to be necessary or superfluous 
don't this put you in mind of the capital day's sport we had last year by jaff's peak he added turning to cathcart i say barrington you should have seen me shoot two wild horses at one go i saw em start and i pulled up my gun one barrel after another it seemed like nothing at all and down they fell two of em i hate the idea of shooting horses said honoria i'd as soon kill dura a steed came prickin o'er the plain softly quoted mr ferris lost in an undertoned rhapsody and indeed anthony said mrs ferris that's just nonsense i don't understand what you mean by pricking if ye said trotting cantering or even ambling there would be some sense in your remark now the mountains rose high in front and they entered a trough evidently of volcanic origin cleft between two hills in the centre of which ran a clear winding rivulet here they dismounted and gave their horses into the charge of a black boy and of mrs ferris who calculating upon being able to reascend by means of one of the huge boulders scattered about alighted and professing herself unequal to the exertion of climbing seated herself contentedly upon a rock and produced her knitting mr ferris wandered off with his sketch-book to hold silent commune with nature oh exclaimed cornelius cathcart in a jerky aside to honoria i like this it's what philosophers call altruism it's so wholesome to ride behind the person with whom you are dying to talk and watch her flirting with someone else it is still more salutary and elevating to one's morals to sit on a stump holding the bridles of three horses and being bored by an old lady's twaddle i wonder why i came to Coralbin. i wonder why indeed laughed miss longleat aren't you coming up to the springs no thanks i'll stay here i prefer being bored by the old lady to boring the young one and after all he added meditatively if i am bored it is all in the day's work he subsided into a heap upon a fallen tree. Honoria gathered up her skirt, and, poising her feet firmly upon the slippery stones, crossed the limpid stream which flowed down the cleft. On each side, beneath the overhanging rocks, ferns and moss grew in dank luxuriance. Mountain lilies bloomed in feathery white tufts in the crannies, and the wild hoya, sweet as honey, spread its dark green leaves and waxen blossoms over the grey, lichen-covered stones the natural passage terminated in a high wall of rock surmounted by a fringe of scrub foliage at its base was a deep mysterious pool surrounded by jagged boulders into which descended with a monotonous splash a small volume of water flowing down a narrow ravine that cut laterally into the side of the hill lord dolph in an ecstasy of delight armed with a dilly bag and a trowel clambered up the precipice to search for roots lady dolph who was not greatly affected by the beauties of nature seated herself upon a jutting rock and pulled out of her pocket a cookery book that mrs ferris had lent her honoria moved apart and stood gazing contemplatively into the water barrington joined her i like to look into this pool cobra ball declares that it has no bottom this is a lonely eerie place but for me it has an extraordinary fascination mr barrington she added turning impulsively towards him i have a half mind to tell you of a strange dream that i had last night don't hesitate but let me hear it this place reminds me of it i thought that you and i were struggling together in just such a tarn as this only that there was no outlet on any side the rocks which closed in round were black and slimy and when i tried to clutch them my hand slipped away helplessly and i was becoming exhausted i grasped your coat but you pushed me off it seemed to me that you were in no danger and that you looked on at my gasping efforts with a horrible smile the inky water was just closing over my head i screamed and awoke with a ghastly sensation of drowning an unpleasant nightmare said barrington but easily accounted for every evening lately before going to bed we have sat at the edge of the lagoon it was natural that the idea of water should suggest itself in your dreams we will stay indoors for the future then there are not many nights remaining i am going to leichardt's town immediately but i have more to tell you i lay awake for a long time alert and trembling do you know the nervous terror that creeps over one in the dead of night 
a sense of infinite loneliness and helplessness and of contact with the spirits of darkness i fell asleep again and this time i dreamed that we you and i still were standing side by side in our drawing-room at the bunyas you had your eyes fixed upon my face and i felt instinctively that you were magnetizing me i know nothing about the subject except what i have read in novels it has always seemed to me a terrible notion that one human being might gain a moral ascendancy over another i remember you told me the other day that you were interested in the subject of mesmerism there again said barrington is the clue to your nightmare i beseech you if you possess the power do not ever attempt to exercise it upon me the feeling in my dream of vital collapse was insupportable i seemed to struggle against a nameless horror with the certainty of being conquered it was worse than drowning i am afraid that you blame me for having caused you a restless night said barrington but we are fellow sufferers there must be some sort of an affinity between us i slept badly also and had vivid dreams in which you played a prominent part at that moment lord dolph's head appeared above the rocks he was laden with ferns creepers and parasites vegetable spoils of all kinds i have got what i wanted he cried and now miss longleat if you don't mind i think that we'll push home i must put my roots into moist earth and keep em as fresh as possible End of chapter 17 Read by Céline Major Chapter 18 of Policy and Passion This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Policy and Passion by Rosa Campbell Prade Chapter 18 Music in the Veranda Barrington gave Miss Longleat his hand and guided her over the stepping-stones. Lord Dolph and his wife divided their botanical treasures, and they walked down the ravine to where Cathcart and the black boy were holding the horses. "'Have you heard much about the elections?' asked Honoria of the superintendent as they stood waiting for Mr. Ferris to reappear. "'No. I believe the ministry will have a majority, but I don't take much interest in politics.' "'Why?' when you know that i dislike a lukewarm supporter almost as much as i detest a radical i thought your father called himself a radical only in his hatred of the hereditary privileges of rank an english radical is an australian conservative i don't dislike the extreme brood they generally have ideas now sammy deans is a fair specimen at any rate he is amusing and if he does steal a calf now and then i know several squatters who are given to nuggeting he is mischievous because he has just enough of education to convince him that all men should be equal and that australia ought to be a regenerated great britain the paradise of fools and working men but he is a less objectionable member of society than the illiterate shearer who occasionally touches his cap to his overseer and knocks down his check in a spree come there is the old man perhaps you will reward my silent heroism by allowing me to ride part of the way home with you mrs ferris has been improving the occasion by impressing upon me how happy she is i don't object to people feeling happy but i do complain loudly of having the fact dinned into my ears it irritates me when i am feeling particularly out of sorts myself near the crossing they met tom dungie who with his mail-bag strapped before him was riding leisurely along the bridle track he regarded barrington with an air of amusement well i thought i'd find you air he squeaked gents ain't much different to native dogs they always run on a trail i have brought your bag my lady the house at diraaba was as empty as a sucked egg and that there female at the huts didn't so much as offer me a cup of tea i have got a note from barramunda station miss longleat twere mr maddox himself as govet me honoria coloured as she took it from his hand since you have been done out of your tea at diaraba dungy you may have a glass of rum at the house well i don't know that i shouldn't relish a nobbler squeaked dungy winking slyly at barrington not but what is a poor soil that is always needing to be watered and too much grog ain't good for the palate let alone for the stonjack you do not read your note said barrington as they passed through the slip-rails 
i will wait till i reach home said honoria not unpleased to make the use of the opportunity of teasing at the same time dreading to show any sign of the mortification which a refusal upon dyson's part would certainly entail upon her she had dispatched her invitation during one of those moments of repulsion from barrington when her longings had turned in a rushing tide towards the suitor she had rejected ever since the sending of the letter she had been anxious as to its reception when she had gained her room she eagerly tore open maddock's note it was a brief acceptance and intimated that the writer would arrive at kooralbyn early upon the following morning in truth a chance remark uttered by lord dolph bassett and certain rumours of a flirtation between honoria and the englishman which were current upon the koorong had affected dyson deeply and had actuated his reply from what he had heard he imagined that barrington might be a man calculated to captivate the girl's fancy the tones of her note appealed to him half dreading half hoping for the confirmation of his suspicions he resolved to ride over the kooralbyn and judge for himself through a gap in her window curtain honoria caught sight of barrington as he leaned against the fence talking lightly to janey was it the glimpse of his soldier-like figure and high-bred features or the perusal of maddock's curt letter which shed a glow over her face and caused her heart to throb with excitement she leaned back in her chair with her arms twined above her head while her bosom heaved gently her lips became moist and trembling and her eyes melted into womanly tenderness as though at some passionate thought then she darted from her seat plunged her face into a basin of cold water and hastily proceeded to dress for dinner towards the end of the meal the conversation turned upon the fate of an overseer in the neighbourhood who had died in a fit of delirium tremens due to disappointment in a love affair with his master's daughter lady dolph animadverted severely upon the conduct of the girl in question is a woman heartless asked barrington with his eyes fixed upon honoria's face because she refuses to gratify the passion of one man at the expense of the happiness of another i object to the theory that women are to blame for the folly of men exclaimed cornelius cathcart why should the weaker sex be raised to such an important position in the scale of creation one would really imagine to hear sentimentalists talk that the male mission in life is to gratify the vanity and caprice of women society would be a little less boring if there were no question of love i think that we women always get the worst of it said honoria rising abruptly from the table come let us eat our dessert on the veranda her suggestion was adopted only barrington and angela lingered in the dining-room honoria wandered to some little distance from the party and cathcart following her seated himself at her feet why do you speak so bitterly of women she asked i detest shams it is degrading to hear a man quoted as the superior animal and yet to know that he is at the mercy of inconsistent selection do you think said honoria looking at him with troubled eyes that a woman is wrong to experimentalize till she finds the best that life can give her why cry out so against vivisection the cruelty which serves science is surely less blamable than that which morally mutilates for the benefit of the individual tell me he added abruptly what has come over you since i was lost at kooralbyn you have altered you seem to have lost self-confidence did you see maddox on his way down to leichardt's town yes for a short time i knew his mission will you tell me its result there is nothing to tell nor ever will be in that quarter no so he is the victim of an experiment if i had not studied you closely i should have expected to find you to-day wearing the simper appropriate to congratulations i see further experiments are in progress some chemicals are dangerous to handle and there are passions that don't bear tampering with take my advice and be careful well he added in an altered tone i am glad at any rate that you have spared me the painful necessity of leaving barramunda there would not be room on the station for the superintendent and the master's wife i say miss longleat cried lord dolph won't you play us something yes do said cathcart it is one of the signs of the advance of civilization that men are no longer compelled to turn over leaves i have got no more conversation sing and let me be quiet may i move this chair into the garden thanks now i can enjoy two of the most delightful things in the world music and tobacco 
he subsided in a heap into one of the canvas chairs, lit his pipe and spoke no more. Honoria entered the drawing-room and sat down to the piano. Barrington, to whom music was exquisite bliss or keen pain, trembled as she approached the instrument. He feared a disenchantment. Strangely enough, during his stay at Kuralbin, it had never occurred to him to ask her to play, and she had never done so voluntarily. About her music, as about other things, she was capricious. When the opening prelude told him that, in this respect at least, their natures were in unison, his joy found vent in a long sigh. He was accustomed to say that melody is one of the strongest determinants of the passions. From his childhood its influence over him had been remarkable. The first time that he had heard an opera, he had retreated to the back of the box and wept silently. There was something almost womanish in his intense susceptibility. Honoria played airs from Lohengrin. The lamp had not yet been brought in, and the room was in half-darkness. Outside, a red moon was slowly rising behind the Kurong crag, and was reflected in the dim expanse of the lagoon. The somber disk of forest and plain seemed infinite. The gentlemen were smoking on the veranda, and Angela, pale and shadowy, was pacing the gravel walk with Mr. Ferris, who was pointing out an effect of moonlight upon the rocks. Barrington sat in a vine-screened corner whence he could watch the player. Honoria appeared lost in her music. Now she passed on to some quaint devotional airs by Bach. Passion succeeded reverie. A great yearning predominated over both. There the true artistic life found expression. The subtle perfume of emotion was breathed, and, as it were, enchained. The two minds, dissonant and mutually incomprehensive, were brought for the moment into complete harmony. Yes, yes, the music seemed to say. I understand your needs, your inconsistencies, your fleeting impressionability, the mingling of the sensuous with the spiritual in the natures of both of you. I comprehend, and I satisfy. Ah, said Mrs. Ferris, in a plaintive tone to Lord Dolph, I wish you would play something of Verdi's. I like music that sends a cold current down my spine, that makes my legs tingle and my nerves quiver. Italian melodies are like the flowers of an English summer. They have the breath of roses and the perfume of mignonette. But your grand classical harmonies are no better than these gorgeous tropical blossoms that only make me long the more for something homely and sweet, like lavender and cherry pie. Lady Dolph giggled, as she always did when anything was said that she did not quite understand. The spell was broken. Honoria ceased playing. Lady Dolph's voice had been the jarring note which mars all earthly harmony. She sank into a chair a little distance from Barrington. I think that the lives of some of us are a long quest after aesthetic perfection, which is most nearly realized in music, he said in an undertone drawing closer to her. I do not thank you. I only say that you have not disappointed me. Barrington, said Lord Dolph, you are first-rate without an accompaniment. Sing us something. It is so jolly sitting here. I never sit in a veranda in summer, said Lady Dolph, without thinking of snakes, especially when anyone is playing. They are so fond of music. They creep along the boards and get under one's gown, and perhaps wind themselves round one's ankles. Do you remember, Dolph? Etc., etc. Dear heart, cried Mrs. Ferris, feeling her stout legs in alarm. I never thought of that. "'Angela, my child, it is too late for you to be sitting out in the dew. "'Let us both go indoors.' "'I will sing to you,' whispered Barrington to Honoria. "'Silence fell upon the group as soon as his voice was raised "'in that exquisitely passionate serenade to which Shelley's words are set. "'I arise from dreams of thee, in the first sweet sleep of night, "'when the winds are breathing low and the stars are shining bright.' I arise from dreams of thee, and a spirit in my feet has led me, who knows how, to thy chamber window, sweet. Honoria leaned back in her chair, half shading her face with her hands. The light was too dim for either to see quite plainly the features of the other, but she knew that each thrilling note was addressed to her, and her frame quivered in response to the passionate appeal. End of chapter 18 Read by Céline Major
Chapter Nineteen of Policy and Passion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Policy and Passion by Rosa Campbell Prade. Chapter Nineteen A Picnic in the Mountains. Upon the following morning, when after a disturbed night Honoria entered the breakfast room, she found that Dyson Maddox had already arrived. His manly aspect, the mingled sweetness and firmness of his expression, struck her with a sudden force, which revealed too clearly how far her thoughts had wandered in another direction. "'You must have started very early,' she said. "'I left Barramunda at daybreak. The early morning is the most pleasant time for riding. I met Cathcart at the crossing. "'He has gone, then?' "'Yes. He thought that one of us ought to be on the station. There were butchers expected.' "'I I am glad that you have come,' said Honoria hurriedly. He looked at her gravely without replying, and she resumed in an embarrassed manner. "'I heard that you were canvassing yesterday. What news of the election?' "'It is going well for us,' replied Dyson. "'Your father is more popular than ever. The squatters will have a walk over.' At that moment Barrington entered, and Honoria introduced the two men who had not met before. Maddox was stiff and ungenial. Barrington courteous and indifferent. Honoria was ill at ease. Her self-possession had vanished, and her complexion alternated between paleness and flushing. Dyson could not help observing that there seemed a covert understanding between her and the Englishman. The latter frequently addressed her in a low tone, as though there were some veiled meaning in his remark. When their hands touched, her eyes drooped. When she spoke to him, her voice had a faltering intonation. When she looked at him, there was a timid consciousness on her face. All these signs Maddox noted and interpreted, and the more he watched, the colder and sterner his manner became. Soon after breakfast the horses were brought round and the party mounted. Only Angela and Mrs. Ferris, both unequal to the long excursion, remained at home. Cobra Ball, leading a pack-horse, rode in front, and a tribe of kangaroo dogs brought up the rear. The air felt clear and fresh with the foretaste of winter, though the sun was powerful enough to scorch Lady Dolph's freckled complexion. The atmosphere was perfumed by wild flowers and scented gum, and the lush grass upon the plain was studded with orchids and violets. As they left the slip-rails behind, a flock of white cockatoos rose chattering and screeching from the cultivation paddock where the yellow squashes and green preserving melons were lying bare of leaves and a black gin with her head bound in a crimson kerchief stood a picturesque object among the late corn they crossed the river and skirted the scrub dim with the dense luxuriance of its dark green foliage enlivened here and there by patches of brilliant bloom of yellow begonia and feathery muntine while clusters of wild plums and black crimson berries announced the close of summer all round them was the hum of forest life. Bright-hued butterflies and whirring locusts flitted among the tangled brushwood. Every now and then a rustle in the grass betrayed the whereabouts of an iguana or a snake. Sometimes they were startled by the strange cry of the tree-frog, or the hissing sound which the frilled lizard accompanies the erection of its ruff. Now they started a herd of kangaroo, the graceful brown creatures with their fawn-like eyes and drooping paws still for a moment, then bounding in long fleet strides over the brow of the ridge, the dogs following in full cry. And even Cobra Ball, in spite of the encumbrance of his pack, unable to resist the infection of sport, spurred his horse and uttered vigorous halloos. "'I must have a gallop,' cried Honoria, casting a rapid glance at Barrington and lightly touching her spirited chestnut. Accustomed to its mistress's vagaries, the animal, which was indeed the pride of Thomas Longleat's stables, shook the reins upon its neck, cleared a fallen tree, and darted at breathneck pace through the thick timber with which the hill was clothed. Dyson, with the zest of a keen sportsman, and a seat that defied accidents, pushed past Honoria in a race to the fore. It was dangerous riding. The slope was stony, encumbered with logs and brushwood, and heavily timbered. At its foot was a gully, and then a wide plain covered with the waving purple grass peculiar to that district, which conceals many a treacherous pitfall. 
Beyond again were ridges and never-ending vistas of trees. The Englishman, with a vivid recollection of Leicestershire runs, felt his blood rising to the sport. The kangaroos had divided, and were being pursued in different directions by the excited dogs. But one old man, bounding in a straight line across the plain, showed easiest chase, and looked as though he meant staying. The hounds, every vein in their sleek brown hides, swelling with eagerness and effort, were in hot course. Honoria was poised like an Amazon upon her saddle, her skirts brushing the grass as she rode neck and neck with Dyson. Her cheeks glowed with a brilliant carmine. A long trail of her hair, loosened by the wind, floated behind. Every now and then she darted a glance at her companion in the rear. At the foot of the opposite ridge, the kangaroo turned and faced his assailants, holding himself erect and striking with his paws at the dogs which closed round him. His tongue protruded, and the blood flowed from a wound in his side. Dyson advanced to put an end to the struggle. Honoria turned, and joining Barrington, whose horse had slackened speed, rode more slowly across the plain towards the others on her right. "'Now you have seen a kangaroo hunt,' said she. "'It is short enough, but I could gallop like that for hours. That brisk stirring of one's blood is perfect enjoyment.' No danger is too great to face when one is on horseback. I sometimes go out on purpose when there is a thunderstorm rising, in order to have the pleasure of racing at home. But there is one drawback to excitement. Someone or something is sure to suffer. I cannot bear kangaroos to be killed. I should detest fox hunting if it were really done in cold blood. In this sort of thing one has no time to think, and as often as not the kangaroo escapes. Presently Cobra Ball rode on ahead with the kangaroo's tail swinging at his saddle, and the poor old man was food for carrion crows. They rode on through tall gum trees and yellow wattles, with here and there a clump of grass trees, their bare stems, tufted tops, and spear-like spikes contrasting with the lank eucalypti, and breaking the monotony of foliage. As they advanced, level pastures and undulating ridges ceased. Before them towered the rock-bound sides of the Kuron Crag. The track grew more and more indistinct, and the country became stony and arid, intersected by deep gullies and ferny ravines that afforded scant foothold for the horses, and were sufficiently alarming to make the most practised bushmen careful. "'Now then,' cried Lady Dolph to Barrington as they dipped into a gully and were confronted by a stony pinch almost as steep as the crag above them, "'spur up that crawler!' or he'll jib before he gets to the top. Sit forward, and lay on like old gooseberry to his mane. At last they had reached the highest spur below the Koorong precipice. It was flat as a bowling green and quite untimbered. Below it for miles stretched a sea of blue-green foliage with waves of wooded ridges. To the left lay a range of distant mountains, their rocky outlines bathed in the golden glow of Australian sunlight, and flecked with the shadows that chased each other across the blue. Directly upon the right rose a forest of pines hoary with moss, their interlacing branches describing vistas of impenetrable gloom. A rocky rampart, five hundred feet in height, reared itself in front of the riders. Ferns and mountain parasites clung to its rugged sides. At its base, a little stream of clear water trickled over a bed of stones and lost itself in the scrub. The buzz of woodland life had ceased, and the stillness and solitude were almost oppressive. "'That fellow Debble Debble like it there,' said Cobra Ball confidentially. Asterisk. "'Caban big waterhole, lie along a scrub. My word, plenty fellow bunya bunya. Other fellow black men come eat, but Baal sit down here. That old woman mother along a Cobra Ball go bong like it this place.' Black fellow say, Baal, me want em that old woman. Suppose me dig em a hole, and bury clothes along camp, she get up again. Me carry that old woman budgery away, and put in ground close up scrub. Mine think it Cobra Ball stop here and look after Yaraman. Baal, that fellow go along a scrub. Get the billy, Cobra Ball, and set the fire alight, cried Dyson energetically. The explorer was at his ease in such scenes as this. He chose a shady spot for the encampment, 
and cut some grass treetops to make a couch for the ladies. "'We had better eat our luncheon,' he said, "'before we attempt the waterfall.' Cobra Ball filled the black quart at the spring, made a fire with twigs, and set the water to boil. Asterisk. The devil is there. There is a big water hole in the scrub, and many bunyas, a species of fur bearing an edible cone. Other blacks come and eat, but do not remain. Cobra Ball's mother died near here. The blacks said, We do not want that old woman. If we bury her near the camp, she will haunt us. We will carry her a long way and bury her in the scrub. Cobra Ball will stop here and look after the horses. He will not go to the scrub. The blacks have a superstition that the spirits of their dead haunt the spot where they die for a year. Back to text. Lady Dolph superintended the pint-pot tea, and Barrington and Miss Longleat unpacked the luncheon bags. When the meal was over, the ladies girded themselves for mountaineering and leaving their horses under the black boy's charge, the little party made their way for a half-mile through the scrub. Progress was here a matter of difficulty. Dense brushwood and closely packed saplings presented an almost impenetrable hedge, and luxuriant, large-leaved creepers hung in long wise from the branches of the tall trees. In the centre, as it were, of this wilderness, they came upon a small clear plain which skirted the edge of a deep ravine. Honoria approached lightly to the side, and holding with one hand to a tree that grew near, peered over into a chasm cleft in the mountain of rock some hundreds of feet in depth. Flowing down a subterranean watercourse, of which at a considerable height the progress was abruptly checked, a large volume of water dashed over the precipice into the pool below. "'My word,' said Lady Dolph, after having contemplated the scene for several minutes, "'it's awful grand, isn't it? But I am close up done with the walking.' I think that I'll take it easy for a bit, and she sat down calmly and began to munch some wild plums which they had gathered in the scrub. I am in the mood to explore, said Honoria. Who will come with me? Two of the gentlemen answered to her call. Mr. Ferris produced a pocket Shakespeare and deliberately seated himself upon a log. Well, I am glad that someone is going to stop, said Lady Dolph. Mr. Ferris can read poetry if he likes. I think I'll go to sleep. You'll find me here when you come back, and give a cooey to let us know where you are. You'll come, said Honoria to Dyson, her tone implying command. Barrington and Lord Dolph had already moved on. Soon the four figures had disappeared in the mazes of the scrub. Lady Dolph, after several attempts to draw Mr. Ferris into conversation, quietly composed herself into slumber. When she awoke, the air felt chill and damp and it seemed as though she had been asleep for a long while. A strange sense of unreality overpowered her. She had forgotten where she was. The booming of the waterfall mingled with the tones of Mr. Ferris's voice as he fervidly ranted Othello's address to his dead mistress. Lady Dolph rubbed her eyes and looked round. Her companions had not yet returned. She began to feel a little frightened, for she had heard Mr. Ferris described in colonial parlance as cracked. She knew nothing of Shakespeare, and distrusted the sound of Othello's eloquent self-upbraidings. "'I—I I wish that you would stop,' she said nervously. "'I don't understand all that bosh. I'd like to know the time. It seems getting late. Don't you think they ought to be coming back?' "'It is nearly five o'clock,' said Mr. Ferris, looking at his watch. "'My word!' exclaimed Lady Dolph in consternation. If this doesn't bang everything, they must have got pushed. Dolph is such a greenhorn. If I had a stock whip, I'd crack it smart. Let us give a shout. The old voice and the young were raised in prolonged cooies. It's all right, cried Maggie. That is Dolph's voice. They are coming. But only Lord Dolph's round face and stripling figure emerged from the scrub. "'Where are the others?' cried Maggie and Mr. Ferris. "'Hello! Aren't they here? I stopped to cut down this staghorn fern. Ain't he a beauty, Mags? We'll put him on to our veranda post. By Jove, it is odd they haven't turned up. I have been loitering for ever so long in the scrub. I thought that I should have found them here. Miss Longleat was wild after Quantongs. Asterisk. And they said that they would come back by the gully.' let us coo away again. And once more long musical notes hovered in the air, 
but produced no reply asterisk a berry growing in the scrub the kernels of which are strung into necklaces end of chapter 19 read by celine major chapter 20 of policy and passion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org policy and passion by rosa campbell preed chapter 20 in the scrub the stillness of the scrub was almost oppressive as honoria and her companions wandered on trees of giant stature and of almost primeval growth closed thickly over their heads and shut out all the glare of sunlight as the brushwood became less dense the bottle trees reared themselves aloft like great white pillars and on every side there stretched dim vistas of trunk and foliage resembling cathedral aisles roofed with pendant moss the glossy bunyas laden with their ripening cones promised an aboriginal feast strange creepers and brilliant-hued flowers tapestried the grey irregularly shaped stones which seemed scattered promiscuously upon the ground and at every moment fallen logs moss-grown and worm-eaten impeded their steps avoiding honoria dyson walked on in front with lord dolph only turning to say sharply do not forget that we are skirting the ravine and may chance unawares upon a precipice the ground was rough and once or twice miss longleat stumbled won't you take my hand said barrington the words were commonplace enough nevertheless her cheeks flushed and her eyes brightened with inward excitement as they met his she was torn between two impulses the one to overtake maddox and beseech his protection from a peril she dared not name the other to yield blindly to the fascination which barrington's voice and touch were weaving round her no she replied brusquely i don't want help we are coming to a stony place continued barrington steadily it is rough walking you had better accept my arm why do you force me to do what i dislike cried honoria at the same time stretching forth her hand which was immediately enclosed in his i am accustomed to being independent i hate to be helped over rough ways but all day long i seem to be fighting against your influence it is stronger than i it makes me feel do what is abhorrent to me in every way little and great i don't know how it is she added with an uncertain kind of laugh i have changed lately that is what i wish said barrington and his grasp upon her fingers involuntarily tightened fie exclaimed honoria recovering herself and trying to appear saucy you pay me a poor compliment most people like me best as i am i do not wish to be classed among the many by you said barrington it is my longing that you should think of me as apart from others otherwise i should have no influence over you and i am ambitious new possibilities are dawning upon me and upon you he continued in eager tremulous tones if you would listen to the faint stirring of your emotions if you would obey the impulse of your heart we might both know the keenest joy possible what is better than to love oh stoop and be sweet to me there is nothing commonplace about you you cannot do things by halves it is not in your nature to be contented with stale sensation you will take out of life what is best worth having that is what i wish to give you the best that i know of and if i do not think it worth accepting she said in a low tone you must do so if you allow yourself to feel do not steel yourself against the promptings of your womanhood i implore you do not hold yourself aloof from me at least he cried insistently let me meet your eyes you are not afraid to look at me honoria he drew closer to her and she felt herself compelled to turn her face towards his reluctance and fascination were blended in her glance his lips and eyes were eloquent with passion which communicated itself to her frame it was unwholesome intoxication but potent while it lasted her lips trembled and moved inarticulately with a violent effort she wrenched herself from his grasp it was at this moment that lord dolph paused to cut down his staghorn fern and announced his intention of rejoining maggie 
a fellow cannot lug this about you know he said and i dare say maddox and barrington will manage to gather your quantongs for you miss longleat dyson turned to honoria and caught the swift glance of appeal which she directed towards him should you like to return he asked oh not yet this is delightful there is nothing so fascinating as exploring you know that mr maddox i have set my heart upon getting some quantongs for a necklace the blacks say that there are plenty in this scrub lord dolph may carry back his fern we will go on she spoke with feverish gaiety inwardly she was reflecting that there was greater safety in a trio than in a quartet after walking a little way and conversing constrainedly about the scenery and the vegetation they came upon a quantong tree and pausing beneath it began to pick up the fallen fruit mutual embarrassment made the occupation engrossing and before long they had filled pockets and pouches against a narrow line of brushwood a few paces off there lay a fallen tree which offered an inviting resting-place they sat down and began to sort their spoils there were so many berries each containing a shapely nut that honoria might string a dozen necklaces we are a long way from the camp said dyson and it is nearly four o'clock we ought to be turning our steps he spoke wearily as though the excursion had no zest for him honoria leaned forward and looked questioningly into his face but he avoided meeting her eyes it needed all his self-control to enable him to stifle any active expression of his hatred and jealousy of the englishman it is very pleasant here said barrington and there is a bright moon surely we have no need to hasten home as he spoke an unlucky movement of his arm broke off a rotten limb of the log upon which they were seated and sent it crashing to the ground like lightning a flat brown head protruded itself from beneath a piece of the loosened bark and a whip-snake whose shelter had been rudely disturbed reared itself upon its lithe body and made a dart at barrington's arm that hung carelessly over the broken branch then glided swiftly past honoria's feet into the underwood the girl started forward and barrington uttering an exclamation of horror made a step backward into the thicket and disappeared there was a rustling among the leaves and grass a rumbling as of falling stones and then silence good god exclaimed dyson we have been sitting upon the very edge of the chasm honoria pushed her way through the thick brushwood and parting the branches that screened the ravine stood on its border and looked down they had been walking downhill through the scrub and the precipice at its foot was of no very alarming depth immediately below her barrington perfectly sensible was trying to lift himself from the stones upon which he had fallen do not be frightened he said with complete sang-froid the thing has bitten me and i am afraid that my other arm is hurt a little that is all he made another more vigorous effort to rise which drew from his lips a sharp cry of pain and his eyes closed as though he were fainting forgetting dyson who was already halfway down the descent honoria flung herself from tree to tree and dropped at barrington's side dyson pushed her away and lifting the englishman's left wrist already visibly swollen he drew his bowie knife from his belt and made several cross incisions on the two purple spots which marked where the snake's fangs had entered then he bound his handkerchief tightly as a ligature above the elbow i have got some brandy in my flask it is under the quantong tree try to rouse yourself and suck the poison from your arm while i go and fetch it yes said barrington faintly it is this other arm that is so confoundedly helpless suddenly honoria bent forward and before either of the men could say her nay she had placed her young fresh lips to the bleeding wrist and was drawing the poison from the wound there was small danger in the act yet it was one at which most young ladies would have hesitated neither then or afterwards could she account for the impulse which had prompted it she went on sucking steadily till dyson had returned with his flask the contents of which he made the englishman swallow that will do he said gravely to honoria and fetched her pannikin of clean water from the rivulet beside them rinse your mouth well out with this and leave him to me it was not for you to do such a thing you are certain that there is no scratch upon your lips into which the poison could enter she shook her head and did as he bade her glad of the opportunity to turn away her head 
she had caught a long passionate look from barrington which with her mind still full of the agitating remembrance of his words dyed her face with blushes these signs of embarrassment dyson noted though he appeared engrossed with the sufferer he had continued to draw the poison from the snake's bite and was now examining the other arm which was clearly injured i am afraid that it is broken he said but that is of comparative unimportance compared with the bite you must have more brandy i will run on towards the camp as quickly as possible and you must follow with miss longleat on no account give way to any feeling of stupor i will coe every now and then but try to keep me in sight come moments are valuable the pain in both arms was acute barrington turned a ghastly pale as he rose to his feet and with dyson's assistance climbed the hill only iron resolution kept him from fainting outright dyson ran on ahead and honoria and her companion followed as speedily as they were able the way was uneven and honoria's habit that had become disarranged in her exertions caught upon the rocks and twigs and impeded her steps several times she stumbled i cannot offer you a hand now said barrington i reproach myself horribly upon your account you will be worn out before we reach the camp how can i thank you for being so brave so devoted it was nothing she exclaimed harshly i would have done the same for any one no you would not he cried fiercely you know that you would not why do you say that now he turned livid and the drops of sweat gathered upon his forehead you are in pain said honoria what does it matter about that you could make my pain heaven if you chose say that you did it for me she was silent say it he repeated insistently tell the truth if you are certain that it is the truth she replied with a short laugh where's the use of my repeating it you did it because you love me he cried passionately you love me i know it now i am so full of joy that i do not care what happens to me you make a great mistake she said coldly yet faltering i-i almost hate you sometimes don't say that it is not true why did eleanor suck her husband's wound because she loved him better than her life and you-you love me you are delirious i ran no danger go on she added cruelly you must not lag or it will be too late for the brandy to do you any good and they spoke no more till they had joined the bassets when they reached the camp she left barrington to the tender offices of the rest of the party and stole away behind a rock where she sat with beating heart and heaving bosom till she heard dyson's voice calling for her by this time it was growing dusk we have pulled the bone together as well as we were able said dyson cheerfully mr ferris is something of a surgeon as regards the snake bite we have dosed him well with brandy all danger is past he will take no hurt the virus is not so deadly at this time of year you need not be anxious you fancy that i care specially because i suck the poison cried honoria hysterically ah well think what you please what does it matter i would have done the same for any one i am tired i feel unnerved i wish that you would put me on my horse and don't let any one talk to me i will never come out on an expedition like this again he mounted her and they joined the others who were clustering around barrington the englishman was pale and had his arm in a sling but he bravely professed perfect ability to guide himself where the narrow track permitted lord dolph rode beside him and led his horse the evening was closing in and they were obliged to make as brisk progress as barrington's helpless condition would allow in order that they might get out of the broken country before nightfall there was a glory of sunset upon the mountains every peak stood out distinctly against the yellow sky at first the sharp crags were of the colour of gold then they became magenta and crimson and finally purple gradually the light faded out of the west the moon rose and one by one the stars came forth aldebaran and orion shining high in the blue vault overhead and the southern cross rising clear above the horizon cobra ball rode before them his light crimean shirt looking ghostly through the trees the night birds sent forth their cries and the native dogs howled in the scrub which they were skirting 
the hum of busy life that had surrounded them during the day had ceased and all that remained was inarticulate murmurings in the bushes and the grass they were all very silent even lady dolph was weary and disinclined for conversation dyson only spoke to utter the merest commonplaces and there was a choking sound in honoria's throat when she answered which warned him that she was on the verge of hysterical weeping angela stood like a pale wraith in the veranda watching for the return of the riders she flew to barrington's side when more dead than alive he was lifted from his horse and conveyed to his bedroom she was left alone with him for a moment while mrs ferris went out to search for linen to bandage his arm now for the first time in their intercourse a sense of shame and concealment overpowered her never before had she hesitated to meet his eyes frankly or to clasp his hand now she glanced at first guiltily towards the door and then longingly at his unconscious face she would have sunk to the earth could he have seen or felt the kisses which she rained upon his nerveless fingers oh my love my love she murmured my life i know i know she went out into the night and lifted her flower-like face to the stars it seemed to her that they only so pure and so far might witness her maiden ecstasy oh my life she murmured in passionate tones i longed for something to worship i was lonely and now i have you you are my son i must look towards you or die End of chapter 20 Read by Céline Major.